Introduction and Cast List for Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction Read by Rita Boutros the year 1400 opened with more than usual peacefulness in England. Only a few months before, Richard II, weak, wicked, and treacherous, had been dethroned, and Henry IV declared king in his stead. But it was only a seeming peacefulness, lasting but for a little while, for though King Henry proved himself a just and a merciful man, as justice and mercy went with the men of iron of those days, and though he did not care to shed blood needlessly, there were many noble families who had been benefited by King Richard during his reign, and who had lost somewhat of their power and prestige from the coming in of the new king. Among these were a number of great lords, the Dukes of Albemarle, Surrey, and Exeter, the marquis of dorset the earl of gloucester and others who had been degraded to their former titles and estates from which king richard had lifted them these and others brewed a secret plot to take king henry's life which plot might have succeeded had not one of their own number betrayed them their plan had been to fall upon the king and his adherents and to massacre them during a great tournament to be held at oxford but henry did not appear at the lists whereupon knowing that he had been lodging at windsor with only a few attendants the conspirators marched thither against him in the meantime the king had been warned of the plot so that instead of finding him in the royal castle they discovered through their scouts that he had hurried to london whence he was even then marching against them at the head of a considerable army so nothing was left them but flight some betook themselves one way some another some sought sanctuary here some there but one and another they were all of them caught and killed the earl of kent one time duke of surrey and the Earl of Salisbury were beheaded in the marketplace at Cirencester. Lord Le Dispenser, once the Earl of Gloucester, and Lord Lumley met the same fate at Bristol. The Earl of Huntington was taken in the Essex Fens, carried to the castle of the Duke of Gloucester, whom he had betrayed to his death in King Richard's time, and was there killed by the castle people those few who found friends faithful and bold enough to afford them shelter dragged those friends down in their own ruin just such a case was that of the father of the boy hero of this story the blind lord gilbert reginald falworth baron of falworth and easterbridge who though having no part in the plot suffered through it ruin utter and complete he had been a faithful counsellor and adviser to King Richard, and perhaps it was this, as much and more than his roundabout connection with the plot, that brought upon him the punishment he suffered. The Cast List The Narrator Read by Rita Boutros Lord Falworth Read by Wayne Cook Sir John Dale Read by David Purdy Dickon Bowman, read by Lynette Calkins. Miles Falworth, read by Caveat. Prior Edward, read by Wayne Cook. Francis Gascoigne, read by Mozart Jr. The Earl of Mackworth, read by Mike Manalakis. Sir James Lee, read by Kerry Adams. Your book voice. The Armorer. Read by Robert Bacourus. Walter Blunt. Read by Jake Malizia. Young Squire. Read by David Purdy. Older Bachelor. Read by Adrian Stevens. Edmund Wilkes. Read by Ali Dollar. Other Squire No One. 
Read by the Countess. Other Squire Number Two, read by David Purdy. Other Squire Three, read by Paul Lawley Jones. Robin Inglesby, read by Cindy Gorman. Goss, read by David Purdy. The Armorer Smith, read by Lynette Calkins. Different Bachelor, read by Kevin S. Other Person, read by Paul Lawley Jones. Lady Alice, read by Michelle Eaton. Lady Anne, read by Lindsay Clark. Groom, read by David Purdy. Lord George Beaumont, read by Andrew Gantz. King Henry the Fourth, read by Alan Mapstone. Gentlewoman, read by Carol Pelster. The Herald, read by Wayne Cook. Marshall, read by Greg Giordano. Sir de la Montagne, read by Robert McCurs. The Prince of Wales. Read by Andrea Atwood. The Bishop of Winchester. Read by David Purdy. Earl Marshall. Read by Victoria Alice Bell. The Earl of Alban. Read by Carrie Adams. Your book voice. The Constable. Read by Greg Giordano. The Defendant. Read by Archives 207. Friend number one, read by David Purdy. Friend number two, read by Paul Lawley Jones. Friend number three, read by Paul Lawley Jones. Friend number four, read by Paul Lawley Jones. Surgeon, read by Kevin S. End of introduction and cast list. Chapter One of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miles Falworth was but eight years of age at that time, and it was only afterwards, and when he grew old enough to know more of the ins and outs of the matter, that he could remember by bits and pieces the things that afterwards happened. How one evening a knight came clattering into the courtyard upon a horse, red-nostrilled and smeared with the sweat and foam of a desperate ride sir john dale a dear friend of the blind lord even though so young miles knew that something very serious had happened to make sir john so pale and haggard and he dimly remembered leaning against the knight's iron-covered knees looking up into his gloomy face and asking him if he was sick to look so strange thereupon those who had been too troubled before to notice him bethought themselves of him and sent him to bed rebellious at having to go so early he remembered how the next morning looking out of a window high up under the eaves he saw a great troop of horsemen come riding into the courtyard beneath where a powdering of snow had whitened everything and of how the leader a knight clad in black armour dismounted and entered the great hall doorway below followed by several of the band he remembered how some of the castle women were standing in a frightened group upon the landing of the stairs talking together in low voices about a matter he did not understand excepting that the armed men who had ridden into the courtyard had come for sir john dale none of the women paid any attention to him so shunning their notice he ran off down the winding stairs expecting every moment to be called back again by some one of them a crowd of castle people, all very serious and quiet, were gathered in the hall, where a number of strange men-at-arms lounged upon the benches, while two billmen in steel caps and leather jacks stood guarding the great door, 
the butts of their weapons resting upon the ground, and the staves crossed, barring the doorway. In the anteroom was the knight in black armor, whom Miles had seen from the window. He was sitting at the table, his great helmet lying upon the bench beside him, and a quart beaker of spiced wine at his elbow. A clerk sat at the other end of the same table, with inkhorn in one hand and pen in the other, and a parchment spread in front of him. Master Robert, the castle steward, stood before the knight, who every now and then put to him a question which the other would answer, and the clerk write the answer down upon the parchment. His father stood with his back to the fireplace, looking down upon the floor with his blind eyes, his brows drawn moodily together, and the scar of the great wound that he had received at the tournament at York, the wound that had made him blind, showing red across his forehead, as it always did when he was angered or troubled. There was something about it all that frightened Miles, who crept to his father's side, and slid his little hand into the palm that hung limp and inert. In answer to the touch, his father grasped the hand tightly, but did not seem otherwise to notice that he was there. Neither did the black knight pay any attention to him, but continued putting his questions to Master Robert. Then suddenly there was a commotion in the hall without, loud voices and a hurrying here and there. The black knight half arose, grasping a heavy iron mace that lay upon the bench beside him, and the next moment Sir John Dale himself, as pale as death, walked into the antechamber. He stopped in the very middle of the room. I yield me to my lord's grace and mercy, said he to the black knight, and they were the last words he ever uttered in this world. The black knight shouted out some words of command, and swinging up the iron mace in his hand, strode forward clanking towards Sir John, who raised his arm as though to shield himself from the blow. Two or three of those who stood in the hall without came running into the room with drawn swords and bills, and little Miles, crying out with terror, hid his face in his father's long gown. The next instant came the sound of a heavy blow and of a groan, then another blow and the sound of one falling upon the ground, then the clashing of steel, and in the midst Lord Falworth crying in a dreadful voice, Thou traitor, thou coward, thou murderer. Master Robert snatched Miles away from his father, and bore him out of the room in spite of his screams and struggles, and he remembered just one instant's sight of Sir John lying still and silent upon his face, and of the black knight standing above him, with the terrible mace in his hand, stained a dreadful red. It was the next day that Lord and Lady Falworth and Little Miles, together with three of the more faithful of their people, left the castle. His memory of past things held a picture for Miles of old Deacon Bowman standing over him in the silence of midnight, with a lighted lamp in his hand, and with it a recollection of being bidden to hush when he would have spoken and of being dressed by Dickon and one of the women, bewildered with sleep, shuddering and chattering with cold. He remembered being wrapped in the sheepskin that lay at the foot of his bed, and of being carried in Dickon Bowman's arms down the silent darkness of the winding stairway, with the great black giant shadows swaying and flickering upon the stone wall, as the dull flame of the lamp swayed and flickered in the cold breathing of the night air. Below were his father and mother, and two or three others. A stranger stood warming his hands at a newly made fire, and little Miles, as he peeped from out the warm sheepskin, saw that he was in riding-boots and was covered with mud. 
he did not know till long years afterwards that the stranger was a messenger sent by a friend at the king's court bidding his father fly for safety they who stood there by the red blaze of the fire were all very still talking in whispers and walking on tiptoes and miles mother hugged him in her arms sheepskin and all kissing him with the tears streaming down her cheeks and whispering to him as though he could understand their trouble that they were about to leave their home for ever then deacon bowman carried him out into the strangeness of the winter midnight outside beyond the frozen moat where the osiers stood stark and stiff in their winter nakedness was a group of dark figures waiting for them with horses in the pallid moonlight miles recognized the well-known face of father edward the prior of st mary's after that came a long ride through that silent night upon the saddle-bow in front of deacon bowman then a deep heavy sleep that fell upon him in spite of the galloping of the horses when next he woke the sun was shining and his home and his whole life were changed End of chapter 1chapter 2 of men of iron by howard pyle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org from the time the family escaped from falworth castle that midwinter night to the time miles was 16 years old he knew nothing of the great world beyond crosby dale a fair was held twice in a twelvemonth at the market-town of Wisby, and three times in the seven years old Deacon Bowman took the lad to see the sights at that place. Beyond these three glimpses of the outer world he lived almost as secluded a life as one of the neighboring monks of St. Mary's Priory. Crosby Halt, their new home, was different enough from Falworth or Easterbridge Castle, the former baronial seats of Lord Falworth. It was a long, low, straw-thatched farmhouse once, when the church lands were divided into two holdings, one of the bailiff's houses. All around were the fruitful farms of the priory, tilled by well-to-do tenant-holders and rich with fields of waving grain and meadowlands where sheep and cattle grazed in flocks and herds for in those days the church lands were under church rule and were governed by church laws and there when war and famine and waste and sloth blighted the outside world harvests flourished and were gathered and sheep were sheared and cows were milked in peace and quietness the prior of St. Mary's owed much, if not all, of the church's prosperity to the blind Lord Falworth, and now he was paying it back with a haven of refuge from the ruin that his former patron had brought upon himself by giving shelter to Sir John Dale. I fancy that most boys do not love the grinding of school life, the lessons to be conned, the close application during study hours it is not often pleasant to brisk lively lads to be so cooped up i wonder what the boys of to-day would have thought of miles training with him that training was not only of the mind but of the body as well and for seven years it was almost unremitting thou hast thine own way to make in the world sir his father said more than once when the boy complained of the grinding hardness of his life and to make one's way in those days meant a thousand times more than it does now it meant not only a heart to feel and a brain to think but a hand quick and strong to strike in battle and a body tough to endure the wounds and blows in return and so it was that miles body as well as his mind had to be trained to meet the needs of the dark age in which he lived every morning winter or summer rain or shine he tramped away six long miles to the priory school and in the evenings his mother taught him french miles being prejudiced in the school of thought of his day 
rebelled not a little at that last branch of his studies. Why must I learn that vile tongue? said he. Call it not vile, said the blind old lord grimly. Belike, when thou art a grown man, thou'lt have to seek thy fortune in France land, for England is happily no place for such as to be of Falworth blood. And in after years, true to his father's prediction, the vile tongue served him well. As for his physical training, that pretty well filled up the hours between his morning studies at the monastery and his evening studies at home. Then it was that old Deacon Bowman took him in hand, than whom none could be better fitted to shape his young body to strength and his hands to skill in arms. The old bowman had served with Lord Falworth's father under the Black Prince both in France and Spain, and in long years of war had gained a practical knowledge of arms that few could surpass. Besides the use of the broadsword, the short sword, the quarter staff, and the cudgel, he taught Miles to shoot so skilfully with the long bow and the crossbow that not a lad in the countryside was his match at the village butts. Attack and defense with the lance and throwing the knife and dagger were also part of his training. Then, in addition to this more regular part of his physical training, Miles was taught in another branch, not so often included in the military education of the day, the art of wrestling. It happened that a fellow lived in Crosby Village by the name Ralph the Smith, who was the greatest wrestler in the countryside, and had worn the champion belt for three years every sunday afternoon in fair weather he came to teach miles the art and being wonderfully adept in bodily feats he soon grew so quick and active and firm-footed that he could cast any lad under twenty years of age living within a range of five miles it is main and gentle almscraft that he learneth said lord falworth one day to prior edward saving only the broadsword the dagger the lance there's but little that a gentleman of his strain may use ne'er less he gaineth quickness and suppleness and if he hath true blood in his veins he will acquire knightly art shrewdly quick when the time cometh to learn them but hard and grinding as Miles' life was, it was not entirely without pleasures. There were many boys living in Crosbydale and the village, yeomen's and farmers' sons, to be sure, but nevertheless lads of his own age, and that, after all, is the main requirement for friendship in boyhood's world. Then there was the river to bathe in, there were the hills and valleys to roam over, and the wold and woodland, with their wealth of nuts and birds' nests and what not of boyhood's treasures. Once he gained a triumph that for many a day was very sweet under the tongue of his memory. As was said before, he had been three times to the market town at fair time and upon the last of these occasions he had fought a bout of quarter-staff with a young fellow of twenty and had been the conqueror he was then only a little over fourteen years old old dickon who had gone with him to the fair had met some cronies of his own with whom he had sat gossiping in the ale booth leaving miles for the nonce to shift for himself by and by the old man had noticed a crowd gathered at one part of the fairground, and, snuffing a fight, had gone running, ale-pot in hand. Then, peering over the shoulders of the crowd, he had seen his young master, stripped to the waist, fighting like a gladiator with a fellow a head taller than himself. Dickon was about to force his way through the crowd and drag them asunder, but a second look had showed his practised eye that Miles was not only holding his own, but was in the way of winning the victory. 
so he had stood with the others looking on withholding himself from any interference and whatever upbraiding might be necessary until the fight had been brought to a triumphant close lord falworth never heard directly of the redoubtable affair but old deacon was not so silent with the common folk of crosby dale and so no doubt the father had some inkling of what had happened it was shortly after this notable event that miles was formally initiated into squirehood his father and mother as was the custom stood sponsors for him by them each bearing a lighted taper he was escorted to the altar it was at st mary's priory and prior edward blessed the sword and girded it to the lad's side no one was present but the four and when the good prior had given the benediction and had signed the cross upon his forehead miles mother stooped and kissed his brow just where the priest's finger had drawn the holy sign her eyes brimmed bright with tears as she did so poor lady perhaps she only then and for the first time realized how big her fledging was growing for his nest henceforth miles had the right to wear a sword miles had ended his fifteenth year he was a bonny lad with brown face curling hair a square strong chin and a pair of merry laughing blue eyes his shoulders were broad his chest was thick of girth his muscles and thews were as tough as oak the day upon which he was sixteen years old as he came whistling home from the monastery school he was met by deacon bowman master miles said the old man with a snuffle in his voice master miles thy father would see thee in his chamber and bade me send thee to him as soon as thou didst come home oh master miles i fear me that belike thou art going to leave home to-morrow day miles stopped short to leave home he cried ay said old deacon belike thou goest to some grand castle to live there and be a page there and what not and then haply a gentleman at arms in some great lord's pay what coil is this about castles and lords and gentlemen at arms said miles what talkest thou of dickon art thou jesting nay said deacon i am not jesting but go to thy father and then thou wilt presently know all only this i do say that it is like thou leavest us to-morrow day and so it was as deacon had said miles was to leave home the very next morning he found his father and mother and prior edward together waiting for his coming we three have been talking it over this morning said his father and so think each one that the time hath come for thee to quit this poor home of ours and thou stay here ten years longer thou shalt be no more fit to go then than now to-morrow i will give thee a letter to my kinsman the earl of mackworth he has thriven in these days and i have fallen away but time was that he and i were true sworn companions and plied you together in friendship never to be sundered methinks as i remember him he will abide by his plighted troth and will give he his aid to rise in the world so as i said to-morrow morning thou shalt set forth with dick and bowman and shalt go to castle devlin and there deliver this letter which prayeth him to give thee a place in his household thou mayest have this afternoon to thyself to make red such things as thou shalt take with thee and bid me dickon to take the grey horse to the village and have it shod prior edward had been standing looking out of the window as lord falworth ended he turned and miles said he thou wilt need some money so i will give thee as a loan forty shillings which some day thou mayst return to me as thou wilt 
for know this myers man cannot do in the world without money thy father hath it ready for thee in the chest and i will give it thee to-morrow ere thou goest lord falworth had the grim strength of manhood's hard sense to upbear him in sending his son into the world but the poor lady mother had nothing of that to uphold her no doubt it was as hard then as it is now for the mother to see the nestling thrust from the nest to shift for itself what tears were shed what words of love were spoken to the only man-child none but the mother and the son ever knew the next morning miles and the old bowman rode away and no doubt to the boy himself the dark shadows of leave-taking were lost in the golden light of hope as he rode out into the great world to seek his fortune End of chapter two chapter three of men of iron by howard pyle this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What Miles remembered of Falworth loomed great and grand and big, as things do in the memory of childhood. But even memory could not make Falworth the equal of Devlin Castle when as he and deacon bowman rode out of devlin town across the great rude stone bridge that spanned the river he first saw rising above the crowns of the trees those huge hoary walls and the steep roofs and chimneys clustered thickly together like the roofs and chimneys of a town the castle was built upon a plateau-like rise of ground, which was enclosed by the outer wall. It was surrounded on three sides by a loop-like bend of the river, and on the fourth was protected by a deep, broad, artificial moat, almost as wide as the stream from which it was fed. The road from the town wound for a little distance along by the edge of this moat, as Miles and the old bowmen galloped by, with the answering echo of their horses' hoofbeats rattling back from the smooth stone face of the walls, the lad looked up, wondering at the height and strength of the great ancient fortress. In his air castle building, Miles had pictured the earl receiving him as the son of his one time comrade in arms receiving him, perhaps, with somewhat of the rustic warmth that he knew at Crosby Dale. But now, as he stared at those massive walls from below, and realized his own insignificance and the greatness of this great earl, he felt the first keen, helpless ache of homesickness shoot through his breast, and his heart yearned for Crosby Halt again. Then they thundered across the bridge that spanned the moat, and through the dark shadows of the great gaping gateway, and Deacon, bidding him stay for a moment, rode forward to bespeak the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper gave the two in charge of one of the men-at-arms, who were lounging upon a bench in the archway, who in turn gave them into the care of one of the house-servants in the outer courtyard so having been passed from one to another and having answered many questions miles in due time found himself in the outer waiting-room sitting beside deacon bowman upon a wooden bench that stood along the wall under the great arch of a glazed window for a while the poor country lad sat stupidly bewildered he was aware of people coming and going he was aware of talk and laughter sounding around him but he thought of nothing but his aching homesickness and the oppression of his utter littleness in the busy life of this great castle meantime old deacon bowman was staring about him with huge interest every now and then nudging his young master calling his attention now to this and now to that until at last the lad began to awaken somewhat from his despondency to the things around. 
besides those servants and others who came and went, and a knot of six or eight men-at-arms with bills and pole-axes, who stood at the farther doorway talking together in low tones, now and then broken by a stifled laugh, was a group of four young squires who lounged upon a bench beside a doorway hidden by an arras, and upon them Miles' eyes lit with a sudden interest. Three of the four were about his own age. One was a year or two older, and all four were dressed in the black and yellow uniform of the house of Beaumont. Miles plucked the bowman by the sleeve. Be they squires, Dickon? said he, nodding towards the door. Eh? said Deacon. Aye, they be squires. And will my station be with them? asked the boy. Aye, and the earl take thee to service, thou'lt haply be taken as squire. Miles stared at them, and then of a sudden was aware that the young men were talking of him. He knew it by the way they eyed him askance, and spoke now and then in one another's ears. One of the four, a gay young fellow, with long riding boots laced with green laces, said a few words, the others gave a laugh, and poor Miles, knowing how ungainly he must seem to them, felt the blood rush to his cheeks, and shyly turned his head. Suddenly, as though stirred by an impulse, the same lad who had just created the laugh arose from the bench, and came directly across the room to where Miles and the bowman sat. "'Give thee good, then,' said he. "'What beest thy name, and whence comest thou, when I may make so bold as to ask?' "'My name is Miles Falworth,' said Miles. "'And I come from Crosby Dale, bearing a letter to my lord.' Never did I hear of Crosbydale, said the squire. But what seekest here, if so be I may ask that much? I come seeking service, said Miles. I would enter as an esquire such as ye be in my lord's household. Miles' new acquaintance grinned. Thou'lt make a droll squire to wait in a lord's household, said he. Hast ever been in such service? Nay, said Miles. I have only been at school and learned Latin and French and what not. But Dickon Bowman here hath taught me use of arms. The young squire laughed outright. By a lay thou talk doth tickle me, friend Miles, said he. Thinkest thou such matters will gain thee footing here? But stay, thou didst say anon that thou hast a letter to my lord. From whence is it? It is from my father, said Miles. He is of noble blood, but fallen in estate. He is a kinsman of my lord's, and one time his comrade in arms. Sayst so, said the other, then mayhap thy chances are not so ill after all. Then, after a moment, he added, My name is Francis Gascoigne, and I will stand thy friend in this matter. Get thy letter ready, for my lord and his grace of York are within, and come forth anon. The archbishop is on his way to Daworth, and my lord escorts him so far as Uppingham. I and those others are to go along. Dost thou know my lord by sight? Nay, said Miles. I know him not. Then I will tell thee when he cometh. Listen, said he, as a confused clattering sounded in the courtyard without. Yonder are the horses now. They come presently. Busk thee with thy letter, friend Miles. The attendants who passed through the anteroom now came and went more hurriedly, and Miles knew that the earl must be about to come forth. He had hardly time to untie his pouch, take out the letter, and tie the strings again, when the arras at the doorway was thrust suddenly aside, and a tall, thin squire of about twenty came forth, said some words to the young men upon the bench, and then withdrew again. Instantly the squires arose and took their station beside the doorway. A sudden hush fell upon all in the room and the men-at-arms stood in a line against the wall, stiff and erect as though all at once transformed to figures of iron. Once more the arras was drawn back, and in the hush Miles heard voices in the other room. "'My lord cometh,' whispered Gascoigne in his ear, and Miles felt his heart leap in answer. The next moment two noblemen came into the anteroom, followed by a crowd of gentlemen, squires and pages. 
One of the two was a dignitary of the church. The other, Miles, instantly singled out as the Earl of Mackworth. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. He was a tall man, taller even than Miles' father. He had a thin face, deep set, bushy eyebrows, and a hawk nose. His upper lip was clean-shaven, but from his chin a flowing beard of iron grey hung nearly to his waist. He was clad in a riding-gown of black velvet that hung a little lower than the knee, trimmed with otter fur, and embroidered with silver goshawks, the crest of the family of Beaumont. A light shirt of link mail showed beneath the gown as he walked, and a pair of soft, undressed leather riding-boots were laced as high as the knee, protecting his scarlet hose from mud and dirt. Over his shoulders he wore a collar of enameled gold, from which hung a magnificent jeweled pendant, and upon his fist he carried a beautiful Iceland falcon. As Miles stood staring, he suddenly heard Gascoigne's voice whisper in his ear, "'Yon is my lord. Go forward and give him thy letter.' Scarcely knowing what he did, he walked towards the earl like a machine, his heart pounding within him, and a great humming in his ears. As he drew near, the nobleman stopped for a moment and stared at him, and Miles, as in a dream, kneeled and presented the letter." The earl took it in his hand, turned it this way and that, looked first at the bearer, then at the packet, and then at the bearer again. "'Who art thou?' said he. "'And what is the matter thou wouldst have of me?' "'I am Miles Falworth,' said the lad in a low voice. "'And I come seeking service with you.' The earl drew his thick eyebrows quickly together, and shot a keen look at the lad. Falworth said he sharply falworth i know no falworth the letter will tell you said miles it is from one once dear to you the earl took the letter and handing it to a gentleman who stood near bade him break the seal thou mayest stand said he to miles needs not kneel there for ever then taking the opened parchment again he glanced first at the face and then at the back and seeing its length, looked vexed. Then he read for an earnest moment or two, skipping from line to line. Presently he folded the letter, and thrust it into a pouch at his side. "'So it is, Your Grace,' said he to the lordly prelate, "'that we who have luck to rise in the world must ever suffer by being plagued at all times and seasons. Here is one I chanced to know a dozen years ago.' who thinks he hath a claim upon me, and saddles me with his son. I must e'en take the lad, too, for the sake of peace and quietness. He glanced around, and seeing Gascoigne, who had drawn near, beckoned to him. Take me this fellow, said he, to the buttery, and see him fed, and then to Sir James Lee, and have his name entered in the castle books. And stay, sirrah, he added, Bid me, Sir James, if it may be so done, to enter him as a squire at arms. Methinks ye will be better serving so than in the household, for he appeareth a soothly rough cub for a page. Miles did look rustic enough, standing clad in frieze in the midst of that gay company, and a murmur of laughter sounded around, though he was too bewildered to fully understand that he was the cause of the merriment. Then some hand drew him back. It was Gascoigne's. There was a bustle of people passing, and the next minute they were gone, and Miles and old Deacon Bowman and the young squire were left alone in the anteroom. Gascoigne looked very sour and put out. Moraine upon it, said he. He is good sport. 
well it's spoiled for me to see thee fed. I wish no ill to thee, friend, but I would thou hadst come this afternoon or to-morrow. Methinks I bring trouble and dole to every one, said Miles somewhat bitterly. It would have been better had I never come to this place, methinks. His words and tone softened Gascoigne a little. Never mind, said the squire. It was not thy fault and is past mending now. So come and fill thy stomach, in heaven's name. Perhaps not the least hard part of the whole trying day for Miles was his parting with Deacon. Gascoigne and he had accompanied the old retainer to the outer gate, in the archway of which they now stood, for without a permit they could go no farther. The old bowman led by the bridle rein the horse upon which Miles had ridden that morning, his own nag, a vicious brute, was restive to be gone, but Deacon held him in with tight rein. He reached down, and took Miles' sturdy brown hand in his crooked, knotted grasp. Farewell, young master, he croaked tremulously, with a watery glimmer in his pale eyes. Thou wilt not forget me when I am gone? Nay, said Miles. I will not forget thee. I, I said the old man, looking down at him, and shaking his head slowly from side to side. Thou art a great, tall, sturdy fellow now, yet have I held thee on my knee many and many's a time, and dandled thee when thou wert only a little weeny babe. Be still, thou devil's limb! He suddenly broke off, reining back his restive, raw-boned steed, which began again to caper and prance. Miles was not sorry for the interruption. He felt awkward and abashed at the parting, and at the old man's reminiscences, knowing that Gascoigne's eyes were resting amusedly upon the scene, and that the men-at-arms were looking on. Certainly old Deacon did look droll, as he struggled vainly with his vicious high-necked nag. "'Nay, a murrain on thee, and thou wilt go. Go!' cried he at last, with a savage dig of his heels into the animal's ribs, and away they clattered, the led horse kicking up its heels as a final parting, setting Gascoigne fairly a-laughing. At the bend of the road the old man turned and nodded his head. The next moment he had disappeared around the angle of the wall." And it seemed to Miles, as he stood looking after him, as though the last thread that bound him to his old life had snapped and broken. As he turned, he saw that Gascoigne was looking at him. "'Dost feel downhearted?' said the young squire, curiously. "'Nay,' said Miles brusquely. Nevertheless, his throat was tight and dry, and the word came huskily, in spite of himself." End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Earl of Mackworth, as was customary among the great lords in those days, maintained a small army of knights, gentlemen, men-at-arms, and retainers, who were expected to serve him upon all occasions of need, and from whom were supplied his quota of recruits to fill such levies as might be made upon him by the king in time of war. The knights and gentlemen of this little army of horse and foot soldiers were largely recruited from the company of squires and bachelors, as the young novitiate soldiers of the castle were called. This company of esquires consisted of from eighty to ninety lads, ranging in age from eight to twenty years. Those under fourteen years were termed pages, and served chiefly the countess and her waiting gentlewomen, in whose company they acquired the graces and polish of the times, such as they were. After reaching the age of fourteen, the lads were entitled to the name of esquire or squire. In most of the great houses of the time, the esquires were the especial attendants upon the lord and lady of the house, 
holding such positions as body squires, cup-bearers, carvers, and sometimes the office of chamberlain. But Devlin, like some other of the princely castles of the greatest nobles, was more like a military post or a fortress than an ordinary household. Only comparatively few of the esquires could be used in personal attendance upon the earl. The others were trained more strictly in arms, and served rather in the capacity of a sort of bodyguard than as ordinary squires for as the earl rose in power and influence and as it so became well worth while for the lower nobility and gentry to enter their sons in this family the body of squires became almost cumbersomely large accordingly that part which comprised the squires proper as separate from the younger pages was divided into three classes first squires of the body who were those just past pagehood and who waited upon the earl in personal service second squires of the household who having regular hours assigned for exercise in the manual of arms were relieved from personal service excepting upon especial occasions and thirdly and lastly at the head of the whole body of lads a class called bachelors young men ranging from eighteen to twenty years of age this class was supposed to exercise a sort of government over the other and younger squires to keep them in order as much as possible to marshal them upon occasions of importance to see that their arms and equipments were kept in good order to call the roll for chapel in the morning, and to see that those not upon duty in the house were present at the daily exercise at arms. Orders to the squires were generally transmitted through the bachelors, and the head of that body was expected to make weekly reports of affairs in their quarters to the chief captain of the body from this overlordship of the bachelors there had gradually risen a system of fagging such as is or was practised in the great english public schools and forced services exacted from the younger lads which at the time miles came to devlin had in the five or six years it had been in practice grown to be an absolute though unwritten law of the body a law supported by all the prestige of long-continued usage. At that time the bachelors numbered but thirteen, yet they exercised over the rest of the sixty-four squires and pages a rule of iron, and were taskmasters, hard, exacting, and oftentimes cruel. The whole company of squires and pages was under the supreme command of a certain one-eyed knight, by name Sir James Lee, a soldier seasoned by the fire of a dozen battles, bearing a score of wounds won in fight and tourney, and withered by hardship and labour to a leather-like toughness. He had fought upon the king's side in all the late wars, and had at shrewsbury received a wound that unfitted him for active service so that now he was fallen to the post of captain of esquires at devlin castle a man disappointed in life and with a temper embittered by that failure as well as by cankering pain yet perhaps no one could have been better fitted for the place he held than sir james lee the lads under his charge were a rude, rough, unruly set, quick like their elders to quarrel, and to quarrel fiercely, even to the drawing of sword or dagger. But there was a cold iron sternness about the grim old man that quelled them, as the trainer with a lash of steel might quell a den of young wolves. The apartments in which he was lodged with his clerk were next in the dormitory of the lads, and even in the midst of the most excited brawlings, the distant sound of his harsh voice, Silence, messieurs, would bring an instant hush to the loudest uproar. 
It was into his grim presence that Miles was introduced by Gascoigne. Sir James was in his office, a room bare of ornament or adornment, or superfluous comfort of any sort, without even so much as a mat of rushes upon the cold stone pavement to make it less cheerless. The old one-eyed knight sat gnawing his bristling moustaches. To anyone who knew him it would have been apparent that, as the castle phrase went, the devil sat astride of his neck, which meant that some one of his blind wounds was aching more sorely than usual. His clerk sat beside him, with account books and parchment spread upon the table, and the head squire, Walter Blunt, a lad some three or four years older than Miles, and half a head taller, black-browed, powerfully built, and with cheek and chin darkened by the soft budding of his adolescent beard, stood making his report. Sir James listened in grim silence, while Gascoigne told his errand. So then, pardy, I'm bid to take another one of ye, am I? he snarled. As though ye cause me not trouble enow, and this one a cub, looking a very boor in carriage and breeding. Mayhap the earl thinketh I am to train boys to his dilly-dally household service, as well as to use of arms. Sir, said Gascoigne timidly, my lord saith he would have this one enter direct as a squire of the body, so that he need not serve in the household. Sayest so? cried Sir James harshly. Then take thou my message back again to thy lord. Not for Mackworth, no, nor a better man than he, will I make any changes in my government, and I be set to rule a pack of boys. I will rule them as I list, and not according to any man's bidding. Tell him, sirrah, that I will enter no lad as squire of the body without first testing, and he be fit at arms to hold that place. He sat for a while glowering at Miles and gnawing his moustaches, and for the time no one dared to break the grim silence. "'What is thy name?' said he suddenly, and then, almost before Miles could answer, he asked the head squire whether he could find a place to lodge him. "'There is Gillis Whitlock's cot, empty,' said Blunt. "'He is in the infirmary, and belike goeth home again when he cometh thence. The fever hath gotten into his bones, and—' "'That will do,' said the knight, interrupting him impatiently. Let him take that place or any other that thou hast. And thou, Jerome, said he to his clerk, thou mayst enter him upon the roll, though whether it be as page or squire or bachelor shall be as I please, and not as Mackworth biddeth me. Now get ye gone. Old Bruin's wound smarteth him sore, Gascoigne observed as the two lads walked across the armory court. He had good-naturedly offered to show the newcomer the many sights of interest around the castle, and in the hour or so of ramble that followed, the two grew from acquaintances to friends, with a quickness that boyhood alone can bring about. They visited the armory, the chapel, the stables, the great hall, the painted chamber, the guardhouse, the mess-room, and even the scullery and the kitchen, with its great range of boilers and furnaces and ovens. Last of all, Miles' new friend introduced him to the armor smithy. "'My lord hath sent a piece of Milan armor thither to be repaired,' said he. "'But like thou would like to see it.' "'Aye,' said Miles eagerly. "'That I would.' The smith was a gruff, good-natured fellow, and showed the piece of armor to Miles readily and willingly enough. It was a beautiful bassinet of inlaid workmanship, and was edged with a rim of gold. Miles scarcely dared touch it. He gazed at it with an unconcealed delight that warmed the smith's honest heart. "'I have another piece of Milan here,' said he. 
Did I ever show thee my dagger, Master Gascoigne? Nay, said the squire. The smith unlocked a great oaken chest in the corner of the shop, lifted the lid, and brought thence a beautiful dagger with the handle of ebony and silver gilt, and a sheath of Spanish leather, embossed and gilt. The keen, well-tempered blade was beautifully engraved and inlaid with niello work, representing a group of figures in a then popular subject, the Dance of Death. It was a weapon at once unique and beautiful, and even Gascoigne showed an admiration, scarcely less keen than Miles openly expressed delight. To whom doth it belong? said he, trying the point upon his thumbnail. Oh, there, <laughs> said the smith, is the chest of the whole, for it belongeth to me. Sir William Beauclerk bade me order the weapon through Master Gildersworthy of London Town, and by the time it came hither, lo, oh, lo, he had died, and so it fell to my hands. And no one here payeth the price for the trinket, and so I must even keep it myself. Though I be but a poor man. How much dost thou hold for it? Said Gascoigne. Uh, Seventeen shillings buyeth it. Said the armorer carelessly. Aye, aye. Said Gascoigne with a sigh. So it is to be poor and not be able to have such things as one loveth and would fain possess. Seventeen shillings is nigh as much by half again as all my yearly wage. Then a sudden thought came to Miles, and as it came, his cheeks glowed as hot as fire. Master Gascoigne, said he with gruff awkwardness, thou hast been a very good, true friend to me since I have come to this place, and hast befriended me in all ways thou mayest do. And I, as well I know, but a poor rustic clod. Now I have forty shillings by me, which I may spend as I list. And so do I beseech thee that thou take yon dagger of me as a love gift and have and hold it from thy very own. Gascoigne stared open-mouthed at Miles. Dost mean it? said he at last. Aye, said Miles. I do mean it. Master Smith, give him the blade. At first the smith grinned, thinking it all a jest, but he soon saw that Miles was serious enough, and when the seventeen shillings were produced and counted down upon the anvil, he took off his cap and made Miles a low bow as he swept them into his pouch. Now, by my faith and troth, quoth he, that I do call a truly lordly gift. Is it not so, Master Gascoigne? Aye, said Gascoigne with a gulp. It is in soothly earnest. And thereupon, to Miles' great wonderment, he suddenly flung his arms about his neck, and, giving him a great hug, kissed him upon the cheek. "'Dear Miles,' said he, "'I tell thee truly and of a verity I did feel warm towards thee from the very first time I saw thee, sitting like a poor oaf upon the bench up yonder in the anteroom, and now of sooth I give thee assurance that I do love thee as my own brother.' Yea, I will take the dagger, and will stand by thee as a true friend from this time forth. Mayhap thou mayst need a true friend in this place, ere thou livest long with us, for some of us as squires be soothly rough, and knock some more plenty here than broad pennies, so that one new come is like to have a hard time gaining a footing. I thank thee, said Miles, for the offer of love and friendship, and do tell thee upon my part that I also of all the world would like best to have thee for my friend. Such was the manner in which Miles formed the first great friendship of his life, a friendship that was destined to last him through many years to come. As the two walked back across the great quadrangle, upon which fronted the main buildings of the castle, their arms were wound across one another's shoulders, after the manner, as a certain great writer says, of boys and lovers. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A boy's life is of a very flexible sort. It takes but a little while for it to shape itself to any new surroundings in which it may be thrown. 
to make itself new friends, to settle itself to new habits. And so it was that Miles fell directly into the ways of the lads of Devlin. On his first morning, as he washed his face and hands with the other squires and pages in a great tank of water in the armory courtyard, he presently found himself splashing and dashing with the others, laughing and shouting as loud as any, and calling some by their Christian names as though he had known them for years instead of overnight. During chapel he watched with sympathetic delight the covert pranks of the youngsters during the half-hour that Father Emmanuel droned his Latin and with his dagger-point he carved his own name among the many cut deep into the back of the bench before him. When, after breakfast, the squires poured like schoolboys into the great armory to answer to the roll-call for daily exercise, he came storming in with the rest, beating the lad in front of him with his cap. Boys are very keen to feel the influence of a forceful character— a lad with a strong will is quick to reach his proper level as a greater or lesser leader among the others and miles was of just the masterful nature to make his individuality felt among the devlin squires he was quick enough to yield obedience upon all occasions to proper authority but would never bend an inch to the usurpation of tyranny in the school at St. Mary's Priory at Crosby Dale, he would submit without a murmur or offer of resistance to chastisement by old Father Ambrose, the regular teacher. But once, when the fat old monk was sick, and a great long-legged strapping young friar, who had temporarily taken his place, undertook to administer punishment, Miles, with a wrestling trip, flung him sprawling backward over a bench into the midst of a shoal of small boys amid a hubbub of riotous confusion he had been flogged soundly for it under the supervision of prior edward himself but so soon as his punishment was over he assured the prior very seriously that should like occasion again happen he would act in the same manner flogging or no flogging it was this bold outspoken spirit that gained him at once friends and enemies at devlin and though it first showed itself in what was but a little matter nevertheless it set a mark upon him that singled him out from the rest and although he did not suspect it at the time called to him the attention of sir james lee himself who regarded him as a lad of free and frank spirit the first morning after the roll-call in the armory, as Walter Blunt, the head bachelor, rolled up the slip of parchment, and the temporary silence burst forth into redoubled noise and confusion, each lad arming himself from a row of racks that stood along the wall, he beckoned Miles to him. My lord himself hath spoken to Sir James Lee concerning thee, said he sir james maintaineth that he will not enter thee into the body till thou hast first practised for a while at the pearls and shown what thou canst do at broadsword hast ever fought at the pell ay answered miles and that every day of my life sin i became a squire four years ago saving only on sundays and holy days with shield and broadsword sometimes said miles and sometimes with the short sword. Sir James would have thee come to the tilt-yard this morn. He himself will take thee in hand to try what thou canst do. Thou mayst take the arms upon yonder rack, and use them until otherwise bidden. Thou seest that the number painted above it on the wall is seventeen. That will be thy number for the nonce. So Miles armed himself from his rack, as the others were doing from theirs the armour was rude and heavy used to accustom the body to the weight of the iron plates rather than for any defence 
It consisted of a cuirass or breastplate of iron, opening at the side with hinges, and catching with hooks and eyes, epaulier or shoulder plates, arm plates and leg pieces, and a bassinet or open-faced helmet. A great triangular shield covered with leather and studded with bosses of iron, and a heavy broadsword, pointed and dulled at the edges, completed the equipment. The practice at the Pells, which Miles was bidden to attend, comprised the chief exercise of the day with the esquires of young cadet soldiers of that time and in it they learned not only all the strokes cuts and thrusts of sword-play then in vogue but also toughness endurance and elastic quickness the pels themselves consisted of upright posts of ash or oak about five feet six inches in height and in girth somewhat thicker than a man's thigh they were firmly planted in the ground and upon them the strokes of the broadsword were directed. At Devlin the Pells stood just back of the open, and covered tilting courts and the archery ranges, and thither those lads not upon household duty were marched every morning, excepting Fridays and Sundays, and were there exercised under the direction of Sir James Lee and two assistants. The whole company was divided into two, sometimes into three parties, each of which took its turn at the exercise, delivering at the word of command the various strokes, feints, attacks, and retreats as the instructors ordered. After five minutes of this mock battle the perspiration began to pour down the faces, and the breath to come thick and short but it was not until the lads could absolutely endure no more that the order was given to rest, and they were allowed to fling themselves panting upon the ground, while another company took its place at the triple row of posts. As Miles struck and hacked at the pell assigned to him, Sir James Lee stood beside him, watching him in grim silence. The lad did his best to show the knight all that he knew of uppercut, undercut, thrust, and backhand stroke, but it did not seem to him that Sir James was very well satisfied with his skill. Thou fightest like a clodpole, said the old man. Ha! That stroke was but ill recovered. Strike me it again, and get thou in guard more quickly. Miles repeated the stroke. Pest! cried Sir James. Thou art too slow by a week. Here, strike thou the blow at me. Miles hesitated. Sir James held a stout staff in his hand, but otherwise he was unarmed. Strike, I say, said Sir James. What stayest thou for? Art not feared? It was Miles' answer that set the seal of individuality upon him. Nay, said he boldly, I am not afeard. I fear not thee nor any man. So saying, he delivered the stroke at Sir James with might and main. It was met with a jarring blow that made his wrist and arm tingle, and the next instant he received a stroke upon the bassinet that caused his ears to ring and the sparks to dance and fly before his eyes pardi said sir james grimly and i had had a mace in my hand i would have knocked thy cockerel brains out that time thou mayest take that blow for answering me so pertly and now we are quits. Now, strike me the stroke again, and thou art not afeard. Miles' eyes watered in spite of himself, and he shut the lids tight to wink the dimness away. Nevertheless, he spoke up undauntedly as before. Aye, marry, will I strike it again? said he, and this time he was able to recover guard quickly enough to turn Sir James' blow with his shield instead of receiving it upon his head. So, said Sir James, 
Now mind thee of this, that when thou strikest that lower cut at the legs, recover thyself more quickly. Now then, strike me it at the pill. Gascoigne and other of the lads who were just then lying stretched out upon the grass beneath, a tree at the edge of the open court where stood the pals were interested spectators of the whole scene not one of them in their memory had heard sir james so answered face to face as miles had answered him and after all perhaps the lad himself would not have done so had he been longer a resident in the squire's quarters at devlin by a lay thou art a cool blade miles said gascoigne as they marched back to the armory again never heard i one bespeak sir james as thou hast done this day and after all said another of the young squires old bruin was not so ill pleased methinks that was a shrewd blow he fetched thee on thy crown falworth marry i would not have had it on my own skull for a silver penny End of chapter six Chapter Seven of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. So little does it take to make a body's reputation. That night, all the squire's quarters buzzed with the story of how the new boy Falworth had answered Sir James Lee to his face without fear, and had exchanged blows with him hand to hand. Walter Blunt himself was moved to some show of interest. What said he to thee, Falworth? asked he. He said naught, said Miles brusquely. He only sought to show me how to recover from the uppercut. It is passing strange that he should take so much notice of thee as to exchange blows with thee with his own hand. Haply thou art either very quick or parlous slow at arms. It is quick that he is, said Gascoigne, speaking up in his friend's behalf. For the second time that Falworth delivered the stroke, Sir James could not reach him to return, so I saw with mine own eyes. But that very sterling independence that had brought Miles so creditably through the adventure was certain to embroil him with the rude, half-savage lads about him, some of whom, especially among the bachelors, were his superiors as well in age as in skill and training. As said before, the bachelors had enforced from the younger boys a fagging sort of attendance on their various personal needs, and it was upon this point that Miles first came to grief. As it chanced, several days passed before any demand was made upon him for service to the heads of the squirehood, but when that demand was made, the bachelors were very quick to see that the boy who was bold enough to speak up to Sir James Lee was not likely to be a willing fag for them. I tell thee, Francis, he said, as Gascoigne and he talked over the matter one day, I tell thee I will never serve them. Prithee, what shame can be foul of them to do such menial service? Save me for one's rightful lord. Marry, quoth Gascoigne. I reason not of shame at this or that. All I know is that others serve them who are happily as good and maybe better than I be, and that if I do not serve them I get knocked in the head therefore, which sin goeth soothly against my stomach. I judge not for thee, said Miles. Thou art used to these castle ways, but only I know that I will not serve them, though they be thirty against me instead of thirteen. Then thou art a fool, said Gascoigne dryly. Now in this matter of service there was one thing above all others that stirred Miles Falworth's ill liking. The winter before he had come to Devlin, Walter Blunt, who was somewhat of a Sybarite in his way, and who had a repugnance to bathing in the general tank in the open armory court in frosty weather, had had Dick Carpenter build a trough in the corner of the dormitory for the use of the bachelors, 
and every morning it was the duty of two of the younger squires to bring three pails of water to fill this private tank for the use of the head esquires it was seeing two of his fellow esquires fetching and carrying this water that miles disliked so heartily and every morning his bile was stirred anew at the sight sooner would i die than yield to such vile service said he he did not know how soon his protestations would be put to the test one night it was a week or two after miles had come to devlin blunt was called to attend the earl at livery the livery was the last meal of the day and was served with great pomp and ceremony about nine o'clock at night to the head of the house as he lay in bed curfew had not yet rung and the lads in the squire's quarters were still wrestling and sparring and romping boisterously in and out around the long row of rude cots in the great dormitory as they made ready for the night six or eight flaring links in wrought iron brackets that stood out from the wall threw a great ruddy glare through the barrack-like room a light of all others to romp by miles and gascoigne were engaged in defending the passageway between their two cots against the attack of three other lads and miles held his sheepskin coverlet rolled up into a ball and balanced in his hand ready for launching at the head of one of the others so soon as it should rise from behind the shelter of a cot just then walter blunt dressed with more than usual care passed by on his way to the earl's house he stopped for a moment and said mayhaps i will not be in until late to-night thou and falworth gascoigne may fetch water to-morrow then he was gone miles stood staring after his retreating figure with eyes open and mouth agape still holding the ball of sheepskin balanced in his hand gascoigne burst into a helpless laugh at his blank stupefied face but the next moment he laid his hand on his friend's shoulder miles he said thou wilt not make trouble wilt thou miles made no answer he flung down his sheepskin and sat him gloomily down upon the side of the cot i said that i would sooner die than fetch water for them said he ay ay said gascoigne but that was spoken in haste miles said nothing but shook his head but after all circumstances shape themselves the next morning when he rose up through the dark waters of sleep it was to feel some one shaking him violently by the shoulder come cried gascoigne as miles opened his eyes come time passeth and we are late miles bewildered with his sudden awakening and still fuddled with the fumes of sleep huddled into his doublet and hose hardly knowing what he was doing tying a point here and a point there and slipping his feet into his shoes then he hurried after gascoigne frowsy half-dressed and even yet only half awake it was not until he was fairly out into the fresh air and saw gascoigne filling the three leathern buckets at the tank that he fully awakened to the fact that he was actually doing that hateful service for the bachelors which he had protested he would sooner die than render the sun was just rising gilding the crown of the donjon keep with a flame of ruddy light below among the lesser buildings the day was still grey and misty only an occasional noise broke the silence of the early morning a cough from one of the rooms the rattle of a pot or a pan stirred by some sleepy scullion the clapping of a door or a shutter and now and then the crowing of a cock back of the long row of stables all sounding loud and startling in the fresh dewy stillness thou hast betrayed me said miles harshly breaking the silence at last i knew not what i was doing or else i would have never come hither nevertheless even though i be come i will not carry water for them so be it said gascoigne tartly 
and thou canst not stomach it, let be, and I will e'en carry all three myself. It will make me two journeys, but, thank heaven, I'm not so proud as to wish to get me hard knocks for naught. So saying, he picked up two of the buckets, and started away across the court for the dormitory. Then Miles, with a lowering face, snatched up the third, and, hurrying after, gave him his hand with the extra pail. So it was that he came to do service after all. "'Why tarried ye so long?' said one of the older bachelors roughly, as the two lads emptied the water into the wooden trough. He sat on the edge of the cot, bloused and untrussed, with his long hair tumbled and disordered. His dictatorial tone stung Miles to fury. "'We tarried no longer than need be,' answered he savagely. "'Have we wings to fly with all at your bidding?' He spoke so loudly that all in the room heard him. The younger squires who were dressing stared in blank amazement, and Blunt sat up suddenly in his cot. "'Why, how now?' he cried. "'Answerest thou back thy better so pertly, sirrah? By my soul, I have a mind to crack thy head with this clog for thy unruly talk.' He glared at Miles as he spoke, and Miles glared back again with right good will. Matters might have come to a crisis, only that Gascoigne and Wilkes dragged their friend away before he had opportunity to answer. "'An ill-conditioned knave, as ever I did see,' growled Blunt, glaring after him. "'Miles, Miles,' said Gascoigne, almost despairingly, "'why wilt thou breed such mischief for thyself?' Seest thou not thou hast got thee the ill will of every one of the bachelors, from Wat Blunt to Robin de Ramsey? I care not, said Miles fiercely, recurring to his grievance. Heard ye not how the dogs upbraided me before the whole room, that Blunt called me an ill-conditioned knave? Marry, said Gascoigne, laughing. And so thou art. Thus it is that boldness may breed one's enemies as well as gain one friends. My own notion is that one's enemies are more quick to act than one's friends. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Everyone knows the disagreeable, lurking discomfort that follows a quarrel, a discomfort that embitters the very taste of life for the time being. Such was the dull distaste that Miles felt that morning after what had passed in the dormitory. Everyone in the proximity of such an open quarrel feels a reflected constraint and in miles mind was a disagreeable doubt whether that constraint meant disapproval of him or of his late enemies it seemed to him that gascoigne added the last bitter twang to his unpleasant feelings when half an hour later they marched with the others to chapel why dost thou breed such trouble for thyself miles said he recurring to what he had already said is it not foolish for thee to come hither to this place, and then not submit to the ways thereof as the rest of us do? Thou talkest not like a true friend to chide me thus, said Miles sullenly, and he withdrew his arm from his friends. Marry, come up, said Gascoigne. And I were not thy friend, I would let thee jog thine own way. It aches not my bones to have thine drubbed. Just then they entered the chapel, and words that might have led to a quarrel were brought to a close miles was not slow to see that he had the ill-will of the head of their company that morning in the armory he had occasion to ask some question of blunt the head squire stared coldly at him for a moment gave him a short gruff answer and then turning his back abruptly began talking with one of the other bachelors miles flushed hot at the other's insulting manner and looked quickly around to see if any of the others had observed what had passed it was a comfort to him to see that all were too busy arming themselves to think of anything else 
Nevertheless, his face was very lowering as he turned away. Some day I will show him that I am as good a man as he, he muttered to himself. An evil-hearted dog to put shame upon me. The storm was brewing and ready to break. That day was exceptionally hot and close, and permission had been asked by and granted to those squires not on duty to go down to the river for a bath after exercise at the Pells. But as Miles replaced his arms in the rack, a little page came with a bidding to come to Sir James in his office. Look now, said Miles. Here is just my ill fortune. Why might he not have waited an hour longer rather than cause me to miss going with ye? Nay, said Gascoigne. Let not that grieve thee, Miles. Wilkes and I will wait for thee in the dormitory. Will we not, Edmund? Make thou haste and go to Sir James. Sir James was sitting at the table, studying over a scroll of parchment, when Miles entered his office and stood before him at the table. Well, boy, said he, laying aside the parchment and looking up at the lad, I have tried thee fairly for these few days. I may say that I have found thee worthy to be entered upon the rules as esquire of the body. I give thee thanks, sir, said Miles. The knight nodded his head in acknowledgment, but did not at once give the word of dismissal that Miles had expected. Dost mean to write thee a letter home soon? said he suddenly. Aye, said Miles, gaping in great wonderment at the strangeness of the question. Then, when thou dost so write, said Sir James, give thou my deep regards to thy father. Then he continued after a brief pause. Him did I know well in times gone by and we were right true friends in hearty love, and for his sake I would befriend thee. That is, in so much as is fitting. Sir? said Miles, but Sir James held up his hand, and he stopped short in his thanks. But boy, said he, that which I sent for thee for to tell thee was of more import than these. Dost thou know that thy father is an attainted outlaw? Nay, cried Miles, his cheeks blazing up as red as fire. Who sayest that of him lieth in his teeth? Thou dost mistake me, said Sir James quietly. It is sometimes no shame to be outlawed and banned. Had it been so, I would not have told thee thereof nor have bidden thee send my true love to thy father, as I did but now. But, boy, certes he standest continually in great danger, greater than thou wottest of. Were it known where he lieth hid, it might be to his undoing and utter ruin. Methought that belike thou mightest not know that, and so I sent for thee, for to tell thee that it behooves thee to say not one single word concerning him to any of these new friends of thine, nor who he is, nor what he is. But how come my father to be so banned? said Miles in a constrained and husky voice, and after a long time of silence. That I may not tell thee just now said the old knight only this that i have been bidden to make it known to thee that thy father hath an enemy full as powerful as my lord the earl himself and that through that enemy all his ill fortune his blindness and everything hath come moreover did this enemy know where thy father lieth he would slay him right speedily. Sir, cried Miles, violently smiting his open palm upon the table. Tell me who this man is, and I will kill him. Sir James smiled grimly. Thou talkest like a boy, said he. Wait until thou art grown to be a man, 
Mayhap then thou mayst repent thee of these bold words. For one time this enemy of thy father's was reckoned the foremost knight in England, and he is now the king's dear friend and a great lord. But, said Miles, after another long time of heavy silence, will not my lord then befriend me for the sake of my father, who was one time his dear comrade? Sir James shook his head it may not be said he neither thou nor thy father must look for open favour from the earl and he befriended falworth and it came to be known that he had given him aid or succour it might be like be to his own undoing no boy thou must not even look to be taken into the household to serve with gentlemen as the other squires to serve but must even live thine own life here and fight thine own way. Miles' eyes blazed. Then, cried he fiercely, it is a shame and a taint upon my lord the earl and cowardice as well, and never will I ask favour of him who is so untrue a friend as to turn his back upon a comrade in trouble as he turneth his back upon my father. Thou art a foolish boy, said Sir James with a bitter smile and knowest not of the world, and thou wouldst look for man to befriend man to his own danger, thou must look elsewhere than on this earth. Was I not one time Mackworth's dear friend as well as thy father? It could cost him not to honour me, and here am I, fallen to be a teacher of boys. Go to, thou art a fool. Then, after a little pause of brooding silence, he went on to say that the earl was no better or worse than the rest of the world, that men of his position had many jealous enemies, ever seeking their ruin, and that such must look first of all each to himself, or else be certainly ruined, and drag down others in that ruin. Miles was silenced, but the bitterness had entered his heart, and abided with him for many a day afterwards perhaps sir james read his feelings in his frank face for he sat looking curiously at him twirling his grizzled moustache the while thou art like to have hard knocks of it lad ere thou hast gotten thee safe through the world said he with more kindness in his harsh voice than was usual but get thee not into fights before thy time then he charged the boy very seriously to live at peace with his fellow squires and for his father's sake as well as his own to enter into none of the broils that were so frequent in their quarters it was with this special admonition against brawling that miles was dismissed to enter before five minutes had passed into the first really great fight of his life Besides Gascoigne and Wilkes, he found gathered in the dormitory six or eight of the company of squires who were to serve that day upon household duty, among others Walter Blunt and three other bachelors, who were changing their coarse service clothes for others more fit for the household. "'Why didst thou tarry so long, Miles?' said Gascoigne as he entered. "'Methought thou wert never coming.' "'Where goest thou, Falworth?' called Blunt from the other end of the room, where he was lacing his doublet. Just now Miles had no heart in the swimming or sport of any sort, but he answered shortly, I go to the river to swim. Nay, said Blunt, thou goest not forth from the castle to-day. Hast thou forgot how thou didst answer me back about fetching the water this morning? This day thou must do penance. So go thou straight to the armory, and scour thou up my breastplate. From the time he had arisen that morning, everything had gone wrong with Miles. He had felt himself already outrated in rendering service to the bachelors. He had quarrelled with the head of the esquires. He had nearly quarrelled with Gascoigne. And then had come the bitterest and worst of all, the knowledge that his father was an outlaw, and that the earl would not stretch out a hand to aid him, or to give him any countenance. Blunt's words brought the last bitter cut to his heart. 
and they stung him to a fury. For a while he could not answer, but stood glaring with a face fairly convulsed with passion at the young man, who continued his toilette, unconscious of the wrath of the new recruit. Gascoigne and Wilkes, accepting Miles' punishment as a thing of course, were about to leave the dormitory when Miles checked them. "'Stop, Francis!' he cried hoarsely. "'Thinkest thou that I would stay behind to do yon dog's dirty work? No, I go with ye!' A moment or two of dumb, silent amazement followed his bold words. Then Blunt cried, "'Art thou mad?' "'Nay!' answered miles in the same hoarse voice i am not mad i tell thee a better man than thou shouldst not stay me from going and i list to go i will break thy cockerel head for that speech said blunt furiously he stooped as he spoke and picked up a heavy clog that lay at his feet it was no insignificant weapon either the shoes of those days were sometimes made of cloth and had long pointed toes stuffed with tow or wool in muddy weather thick heavy clogs or wooden soles were strapped like a skate to the bottom of the foot that clog which blunt had seized was perhaps eighteen or twenty inches long two or two and a half inches thick at the heel tapering to a point at the toe as the older lad advanced, Gascoigne stepped between him and his victim. Do not harm him, Blunt, he pleaded. Bear thou in mind how new come he is among us. He knoweth not our ways as yet. Stand thou back, Gascoigne, said Blunt harshly as he thrust him aside. I will teach him our ways so that he will not soon forget them. Close to Miles' feet was another clog like that one which Blunt held. He snatched it up and set his back against the wall, with a white face and a heart beating heavily and tumultuously, but with courage steeled to meet the coming encounter. There was a hard, grim look in his blue eyes that, for a moment, perhaps quelled the elder lad. He hesitated. Tom! What? Ned! He called to the other bachelors. Come hither, and lend me a hand with this knave. And ye come nigh me, panted Miles. I will brain the first within reach. Then Gascoigne dodged behind the others, and without being seen, slipped out of the room for help. The battle that followed was quick, sharp, and short. As Blunt strode forward, Miles struck and struck with might and main, but he was too excited to deliver his blow with calculation. Blunt parried it with the clog he held and the next instant dropping his weapon gripped miles tight about the body pinning his arms to his sides miles also dropped the clog he held and wrenching out his right arm with a sudden heave struck blunt full in the face and then with another blow sent him staggering back it all passed in an instant the next the three other bachelors were upon him, catching him by the body, the arms, the legs. For a moment or two they swayed and stumbled hither and thither, and then down they fell in a struggling heap. Miles fought like a wildcat, kicking, struggling, scratching, striking with elbows and fists. He caught one of the three by his collar and tore his jacket open from the neck to the waist. He drove his foot into the pit of the stomach of another, and knocked him breathless. The other lads, not in the fight, stood upon the benches and the beds around. But such was the awe inspired by the prestige of the bachelors, that not one of them dared to lend hand to help him. And so Miles fought his fierce battle alone. But four to one were odds too great and though miles struggled as fiercely as ever by and by it was with less and less resistance blunt had picked up the clog he had dropped when he first attacked the lad and now stood over the struggling heap white with rage the blood running from his lip cut and puffed where miles had struck him and murder looking out from his face if ever it looked out of the face of any mortal being Hold him a little, said he fiercely. 
and I will stun him for you. Even yet, it was no easy matter for the others to do his bidding, but presently he got his chance and struck a heavy, cruel blow at Miles' head. Miles only partly warded it with his arm. Hitherto he had fought in silence. Now he gave a harsh cry. Holy saints! cried Edmund Wilkes. They will kill him. Blunt struck two more blows, both of them upon the body, and then at last they had the poor boy down, with his face upon the ground, and his arms pinned to his sides, and Blunt, bracing himself for the stroke, with a grin of rage, raised a heavy clog for one terrible blow that should finish the fight. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How now, Messieurs? said a harsh voice that fell upon the turmoil like a thunderclap, and there stood Sir James Lee. Instantly the struggle ceased, and the combatants scrambled to their feet. The elder lads stood silent before their chief, but Miles was deaf and blind and mad with passion. He knew not where he stood, or what he said or did. White as death, he stood for a while glaring about him, catching his breath convulsively. Then he screamed hoarsely, "'Who struck me? Who struck me when I was down? I will have his blood that struck me!' He caught sight of Blunt. "'It was he that struck me!' he cried. Thou foul traitor, thou coward! And thereupon leaped at his enemy like a wildcat. Stop! cried Sir James Lee, clutching him by the arm. Miles was too blinded by his fury to see who it was that held him. I will not stop! he cried, struggling and striking at the knight. Let me go! I will have his life that struck me when I was down! The next moment he found himself pinned close against the wall, and then, as though his sight came back, he saw the grim face of the old one-eyed knight looking into his. "'Dost thou know who I am?' said a stern, harsh voice. Instantly Miles ceased struggling, and his arms fell at his side. "'Aye,' he said in a gasping voice, "'I know thee. He swallowed spasmodically for a moment or two, and then, in the sudden revulsion of feeling, burst out sobbing convulsively. Sir James marched the two off to his office, he himself walking between them, holding an arm of each, the other lads following behind, awestruck and silent. Entering the office, Sir James shut the door behind him, leaving the group of squires clustered outside about the stone steps, speculating in whispers as to what would be the outcome of the matter. After Sir James had seated himself, the two standing facing him, he regarded them for a while in silence. "'How now, Walter Blunt?' said he at last. "'What is to do?' "'Why, this?' said Blunt, wiping his bleeding lip. That fellow, Miles Falworth, hath been breeding mutiny and revolt ever since he came hither among us, and because he was thus mutinous, I would punish him therefore. It is thou that liest, burst out Miles. Never have I been mutinous in my life. Be silent, sir, said Sir James sternly. I will hear thee anon. Nay, said Miles, with his lips twitching and writhing. I will not be silent. I am friendless here, and ye are all against me, but I will not be silent, and brook to have lies spoken of me. Even Blunt stood aghast at Miles' boldness. Never had he heard anyone so speak to Sir James before. He did not dare for a moment even to look up. Second after second of dead stillness passed, while Sir James sat looking at Miles, with a stern, terrifying calmness that chilled him in spite of the heat of his passion. Sir, said the old man at last, in a hard, quiet voice, 
Thou dost know not of rules and laws of such a place as this. Nevertheless, it is time for thee to learn them. So I will tell thee now that if thou openest thy lips to say only one single word more, except at my bidding, I will send thee to the black vault of the dungeon to cool thy hot spirits on bread and water for a week. There was something in the measured quietness of the old knight's tone that quelled Miles utterly and entirely. A little space of silence followed. Now then, Blunt, said Sir James, turning to the bachelor. Tell me all the ins and outs of this business, without any more underdealing. This time Blunt's story, though naturally prejudiced in his own favour, was fairly true. Then Miles told his side of the case, the old knight listening attentively. "'Why, how now, Blunt?' said Sir James, when Miles had entered. "'I myself gave the lads leave to go to the river to bathe. Wherefore shouldst thou forbid one of them?' "'I did it but to punish this fellow for his mutiny,' said the bachelor. "'Methought we at their head were to have oversight concerning them.' "'So ye are,' said the knight. "'But only to a degree.' Ere ye take it upon ye to gainsay any of my orders or permits, come ye first to me. Dost thou understand? I answered Blunt sullenly. So be it. And now get thee gone, said the knight. And let me hear no more of beating out brains with wooden clogs. And ye fight your battles. Let there not be murder in them. This is twice that the like hath happened. Gin I hear more of such doings? He did utter his threat, but stopped short and fixed his one eye sternly upon the head squire. Now shake hands and be ye friends, said he abruptly. Blunt made a motion to obey, but Miles put his hand behind him. Nay. I shake not hands with anyone who struck me while I was down. So be it, said the knight grimly. Now thou mayest go, Blunt. Thou, Polworth, stay. I would bespeak thee further. Tell me, said he, when the elder lad had left them. Why wilt thou not serve these bachelors as the other squires do? Such is the custom here. Why wilt thou not obey it? Because, said Miles, I cannot stomach it, and they shall not make me serve them. And thou bid me to do it, sir, I will do it, but not at their command. Nay, said the knight, I do not bid thee do them service. That lieth with thee, to render a knot as thou seest fit. But how canst thou hope to fight single-handed against the commands of a dozen lads all older and mightier than thou? I know not, said Miles. But were they an hundred instead of thirteen, they should not make me serve them. Thou art a fool, said the old knight, smiling faintly. For that beest not courage, but folly. When one setteth about righting a wrong, one driveth not full head against it. For in so doing, one getteth naught but hard knocks. Nay, go deftly about it, and then, when the time is ripe, strike the blow. Our beloved King Henry, when he was the Earl of Derby, what could he have gained had he stood so against the old King Richard? Broken the king face to face? I tell thee, he would have been knocked on the head, as thou wert like to have been this day. Now were I thee, and had to fight a fight against odds, I would first get me friends behind me, and then... He stopped short, but Miles understood him well enough. Sir, said he with a gulp, 
I do thank thee for thy friendship, and ask thy pardon for doing as I did anon. I grant thee pardon, said the knight, but tell thee plainly, and thou dost face me so again. I will truly send thee to the black sail for a week. Now get thee away. All the other lads were gone when Miles came forth, save only the faithful Gascoigne, who sacrificed his bath that day to stay with his friend, and perhaps that little act of self-denial moved Miles more than many a great thing might have done. It was right kind of thee, Francis, said he, laying his hand affectionately on his friend's shoulder. I know not why thou lovest me so. Why, for one thing this matter, answered his friend because methinks thou art the best fighter and the bravest one of all of us squires. Miles laughed. Nevertheless, Gascoigne's words were a soothing balm for much that had happened that day. I will fight me no more just now, said he, and then he told his friend all that Sir James had advised about biding his time. Gascoigne blew a long whistle. Beshrew me, quoth he. But methinks old Bruin is on thy side of the coral miles, and that be so, I am with thee also, and others that I can name as well. So be it, said Miles. Then I am content to abide the time when we become strong enough to stand against them. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Perhaps there is nothing more delightful in the romance of boyhood than the finding of some secret hiding place, whither a body may creep away from the bustle of the world's life to nestle in quietness for an hour or two more especially is such delightful if it happen that by peeping from out it one may look down upon the bustling matters of busy everyday life while one lies snugly hidden away unseen by any as though one were in some strange invisible world of one's own such a hiding place as would have filled the heart of almost any boy with sweet delight miles and gascoigne found one summer afternoon they called it their airy, and the name suited well for the roosting place of the young hawks that rested in its windy stillness, looking down upon the shifting castle life in the courts below. Behind the north stable, a great long rambling building, thick-walled and black with age, lay an older part of the castle than that peopled by the better class of life, a cluster of great thick walls rudely but strongly built now the dwelling-place of stable lads and hinds swine and paltry from one part of these ancient walls and fronting an inner court of the castle arose a tall circular heavy buttressed tower considerably higher than the other buildings and so mantled with a dense growth of aged ivy as to stand a shaft of solid green above its crumbling crown circled hundreds of pigeons white and pied clapping and clattering in noisy flight through the sunny air several windows some closed with shutters peeped here and there from out the leaves and near the top of the pile was a row of arched openings as though of a balcony or an airy gallery Miles had more than once felt an idle curiosity about this tower, and one day, as he and Gascoigne sat together, he pointed his finger and said, What is yon place? That, answered Gascoigne, looking over his shoulder, That they call Brutus Tower, for why they do say that Brutus he built it when he came hither to Britain. I believe not the tale mine own self. Nevertheless, it is marvellous ancient, and old Robin the Fletcher telleth me that there be stairways built in the wall, and passageways in a maze wherein a body may get lost, and he know not the way aright, and never see the blessed light of day again. Marry, said Miles, those same be strange sayings. Who liveth there now? No one liveth there, said Gascoigne saving only some of the stable villains, and that half-witted gooseherd who flung stones at us yesterday when we mocked him down in the paddock. 
He and his wife and those others dwell in the vaults beneath like rabbits in any warren. No one else hath lived there ever since Earl Robert's day, which Blake was an hundred years agone. The story goeth that Earl Robert's brother, or stepbrother, was murdered there, and some men say by the Earl himself. Since that day it hath been tight shut. Miles stared at the tower for a while in silence. It is a strange-seeming place from without, said he at last. And mayhap it may even be stranger inside. Hast thou ever been, Francis? Nay, said Gascoigne. Said I not it hath been fast locked since Earl Robert's day? By Our Lady, said Miles. And I had lived here in this place so long as thou. I wot I would have been within it ere this. Beshrew me, said Gascoigne. But I have never thought of such a matter. He turned and looked at the tall crown rising into the warm sunlight, with a new interest, for the thought of entering it smacked pleasantly of adventure. How wouldst thou set about getting within? said he presently. Why, look, said Miles. Seest thou not yon hole in the ivy branches? Methinks there is a window at that place, and I mistake not, it is within reach of the stable eaves. A body might come up by the faggot pile to the roof of the hen house, and then by the long stable to the north stable and so to that hole. Gascoigne looked thoughtfully at the Brutus Tower, and then suddenly inquired, Wouldst go there? Aye, said Miles briefly. So be it. Lead thou the way in the venture, I will follow after thee, said Gascoigne. As Miles had said, the climbing from roof to roof was a matter easy enough to an active pair of lads like themselves. But when, by and by, they reached the wall of the tower itself, they found the hidden window much higher from the roof than they had judged from below, perhaps ten or twelve feet, and it was, besides, beyond the eaves and out of their reach. Miles looked up and looked down. Above was the bushy thickness of the ivy, the branches as thick as a woman's wrist, knotted and intertwined. Below was the stone pavement of a narrow inner court between two of the stable buildings. Methinks I can climb to yon place, said he. Thou'lt break thy neck as thou triest, said Gascoigne hastily. Nay, quoth Miles. I trust not, but break or make, we get not there without trying. So here goeth for the venture. Thou art a hair-brained knave as ever drew breath of life, quoth Gascoigne and will cause me to come to grief some of these days. Nevertheless, and thou be jack-fool and lead the way, go, and I will be tom-fool and follow anon. If thy neck is worth so little, mine is worth no more. It was indeed a perilous climb, but that special providence which guards reckless lads befriended them, as it has thousands of their kind before and since. So, by climbing from one knotted, clinging stem to another, they were presently seated snugly in the ivied niche in the window. It was barred from within by a crumbling shutter, the rusty fastening of which, after some little effort upon the part of the two, gave way, and entering the narrow opening, they found themselves in a small triangular passageway from which a steep flight of stone steps led down through a hollow in the massive wall to the room below at the bottom of the steps was a heavy oaken door which stood ajar hanging upon a single rusty hinge and from the room within a dull grey light glimmered faintly miles pushed the door farther open it creaked and grated horribly on its rusty hinge and, as an instant answer to the discordant shriek, came a faint piping squeaking, a rustling and a pattering of soft footsteps. The ghosts! cried Gascoigne in a quavering whisper, and for a moment Miles felt the chill of goose-flesh creep up and down his spine. But the next moment he laughed. Nay, said he. They be rats. Look at yon fellow, Francis. The Esther's big as Mother Joan's kitten. Give me that stone. He flung it at the rat, and it flew, clattering across the floor. There was another pattering rustle of hundreds of feet, and then a breathless silence. The boys stood looking around them, and a strange enough sight it was. The room was a perfect circle of about twenty feet across, and was piled high with an indistinguishable mass of lumber, 
rude tables ruder chairs ancient chests bits and remnants of cloth and sacking and leather old helmets and pieces of armour of a bygone time broken spears and pole axes pots and pans and kitchen furniture of all sorts and kinds a straight beam of sunlight fell through a broken shutter like a bar of gold and fell upon the floor in a long streak of dazzling light that illuminated the whole room with a yellow glow Violet, said gascoigne at last in a hushed voice here is father time's garret for sure didst ever see the like miles look at yon obelisk sure brutus himself used such an one nay said miles but look at this saddle marry here best is a rat's nest in it clouds of dust rose as they rummaged among the mouldering mass setting them coughing and sneezing now and then a great grey rat would shoot out beneath their very feet and disappear like a sudden shadow into some hole or cranny in the wall come said miles at last brushing the dust from his jacket and we tarry here longer we have chance to see no other sights the sun is falling low an arched stairway upon the opposite side of the room from which they had entered wound upward through the wall the stone steps being lighted by narrow slits of windows cut through the massive masonry above the room they had just left was another of the same shape and size but with an oak floor sagging and rising into hollows and hills where the joist had rotted away beneath it was bare and empty and not even a rat was to be seen above was another room above that another all the passages and stairways which connected the one story with the other being built in the wall which was where solid perhaps fifteen feet thick from the third floor a straight flight of steps led upward to a closed door from the other side of which shone the dazzling brightness of sunlight and whence came a strange noise a soft rustling a melodious murmur the boys put their shoulders against the door which was fastened and pushed with might and main once twice suddenly the lock gave way and out they pitched headlong into a blaze of sunlight a deafening clapping and uproar sounded in their ears and scores of pigeons suddenly disturbed rose in stormy flight they sat up and looked around them in silent wonder they were in a bower of leafy green it was the top story of the tower the roof of which had crumbled and toppled in leaving it open to the sky with only here and there a slanting beam or two supporting a portion of the tiled roof affording shelter for the nests of the pigeons crowded closely together over everything the ivy had grown in a mantling sheet a network of shimmering green through which the sunlight fell flickering this passeth wonder said gascoigne at last breaking the silence ay said miles i did never see the like in all my life then look yonder is a room beyond let us see what it is francis entering an arched doorway the two found themselves in a beautiful little vaulted chapel about eighteen feet long and twelve or fifteen wide it comprised the crown of one of the large massive buttresses and from it opened the row of arched windows which could be seen from below through the green shimmering of the ivy leaves the boys pushed aside the trailing tendrils and looked out and down the whole castle lay spread below them with the busy people unconsciously intent upon the matters of their daily work they could see the gardener with bowed back patiently working among the flowers in the garden the stable boys below grooming the horses a bevy of ladies in the privy garden playing at shuttlecock with battledoors of wood a group of gentlemen walking up and down in front of the earl's house they could see the household servants hurrying hither and thither two little scullions at fisticuffs and a kitchen girl standing in the doorway scratching her frowsy head it was all like a puppet-show of real life 
each acting unconsciously a part in the play. The cool wind came in through the rustling leaves and fanned their cheeks, hot with the climb up the winding stairway. We will call it our airy, said Gascoigne. And we will be the hawks that live here. And that was how it got its name. The next day Miles had the armorer make him a score of large spikes, which he and Gascoigne drove between the ivy branches and into the cement of the wall, and so made a safe passageway by which to reach the window niche in the wall. End of chapter 10「now and then visiting the old tower to rummage among the lumber stored in the lower room or to loiter away the afternoon in the windy solitudes of the upper heights and in that little time when the ancient keep was to them a small world unknown to any but themselves a world far away above all the dull matters of everyday life they talked of many things that might else never have been known to one another mostly they spoke the crude romantic thoughts and desires of boyhood's time chaff thrown to the wind in which however lay a few stray seeds fated to fall to good earth and to ripen to fruition in manhood's day in the intimate talks of that time miles imparted something of his honest solidity to gascoigne's somewhat weathercock nature and to miles ruder and more uncouth character gascoigne lent a tone of his gentler manners learned in his pagehood's service as attendant upon the countess and her ladies. In other things also, the character and experience of the one lad helped to supply what was lacking in the other. Miles was replete with old Latin jests, fables, and sermons picked up during his school life in those intervals of his more serious studies when prior edward had permitted him to browse in the greener pastures of the gesta romanorum and the disciplina clericalis of the monastery library and gascoigne was never weary of hearing him tell those marvellous stories called from the crabbed latin of the old manuscript volumes upon his part gascoigne was full of the lore of the waiting-room and the antechamber and miles who in all his life had never known a lady young or old excepting his mother was never tired of lying silently listening to gascoigne's chatter of the gay doings of the castle gentle life in which he had taken part so often in the merry days of his pagehood i do wonder said miles quaintly but thou canst ever find the courage to bespeak a young maid francis never did i do so nor ever could rather would i face three strong men than one young damsel whereupon gascoigne burst out laughing marry quoth he they be no such terrible things but gentle and pleasant spoken and soft and smooth as any cat no matter for that said miles i would not face one such for worlds it was during the short time when so to speak the two owned the solitude of the brutus tower that miles told his friend of his father's outlawry and of the peril in which the family stood and thus it was i do marvel said gascoigne one day as the two lay stretched in the airy looking down into the castle courtyard below I do marvel, now that thou art established here this month, and more, that my lord doth never have thee called to do service upon household duty. Canst thou riddle me why it is so, Miles? The subject was a very sore one with Miles, until Sir James had told him of the matter in his office that day. He had never known that his father was attainted and outlawed, 
he had accepted the change from their earlier state and the bald poverty of their life at crosby halt with the easy carelessness of boyhood and sir james words were the first to awaken him to a realization of the misfortunes of the house of falworth his was a brooding nature and in the three or four weeks that passed he had meditated so much over what had been told him that by and by it almost seemed as if a shadow of shame rested upon his father's fair fame even though the attaint set upon him was unrighteous and unjust as miles knew it must be he had felt angry and resentful at the earl's neglect and as days passed and he was not noticed in any way his heart was at times very bitter so now gascoigne's innocent question touched a sore spot and miles spoke with a sharp angry pain in his voice that made the other look quickly up sooner would my lord have yonder swineherd serve him in the household than me said he why may that be miles said gascoigne because answered miles with the same angry bitterness in his voice either the earl is a coward that feareth to befriend me or else he is a caitiff ashamed of his own flesh and blood and of me the son of his one-time comrade gascoigne raised himself upon his elbow and opened his eyes wide in wonder a fear of thee miles quoth he why should he be afeard to befriend thee who art thou that the earl should fear thee miles hesitated for a moment or two wisdom bade him remain silent upon the dangerous topic but his heart yearned for sympathy and companionship in his trouble i will tell thee said he suddenly and therewith poured out all of the story so far as he knew it to his listening wondering friend and his heart felt lighter to be thus eased of its burden and now said he as he concluded is it not this earl a mean-hearted caitiff to leave me the son of his one-time friend and kinsman and thus to stand or fall alone among strangers and in a strange place without once stretching out me a helping hand he waited and gascoigne knew that he expected an answer i know not that he is a mean-hearted caitiff miles said he at last hesitatingly the earl hath many enemies and i have heard that he hath stood more than once in peril having been accused of dealings with the king's foes he was cousin to the earl of kent and i do remember hearing that he had a narrow escape at that time from ruin there be more reasons than thou wottest of why he should not have dealings with thy father i had not thought said miles bitterly after a little pause that thou wouldst stand for him and against me in this quarrel gascoigne him will i never forgive so long as i may live and i had thought that thou wouldst have stood by me so i do said gascoigne hastily and do love thee more than any one in all the world miles but i had thought that it would make thee feel more easy to think that the earl was not against thee and indeed from all thou hast told me i do soothly think that he and sir james mean to befriend thee and hold thee privily in kind regard then why doth he not stand forth like a man and befriend me and my father openly even if it be to his own peril said miles reverting stubbornly to what he had first spoken gascoigne did not answer but lay for a long while in silence knowest thou he suddenly asked after a while who is this great enemy of whom sir james speaketh and who seeketh so to drive thy father to ruin nay said miles i know not for my father hath never spoken of these things and sir james would not tell me but this i know said he suddenly grinding his teeth together and i do not hunt him out some day and slay him like a dog he stopped abruptly and gascoigne looking askance at him saw that his eyes were full of tears whereupon he turned his looks away again quickly and fell to shooting pebbles out through the open window with his finger and thumb thou wilt tell no one of these things that i have said said miles after a while not i said gascoigne thinkest thou i could do such a thing nay said miles briefly perhaps this talk more than anything else that had ever passed between them knit the two friends the closer together 
for, as I have said, Miles felt easier now that he had poured out his bitter thoughts and words. And as for Gascoigne, I think that there is nothing so flattering to one's soul as to be made the confidant of a stronger nature. But the old tower served another purpose than that of a spot in which to pass away a few idle hours, or in which to indulge the confidences of friendship, for it was there that Miles gathered a backing of strength for resistance against the tyranny of the bachelors and it is for that more than for any other reason that it has been told how they found the place and of what they did there feeling secure against interruption miles falworth was not of a kind that forgets or neglects a thing upon which the mind has once been set perhaps his chief objective since the talk with sir james following his fight in the dormitory had been successful resistance to the exactions of the head of the body of squires. He was now, more than a month had passed, looked upon by nearly, if not all, of the younger lads as an acknowledged leader in his own class. So one day he broached a matter to Gascoigne that had for some time been digesting in his mind. It was the formation of a secret order— calling themselves the knights of the rose their meeting-place to be the chapel of the brutus tower and their object to be the righting of wrongs as they said miles of arthur his round table did right wrong but prithee what wrongs are there to right in this place quoth gascoigne after listening intently to the plan which miles set forth why first of all this said Miles, clenching his fists, as he had a habit of doing when anything stirred him deeply. That we set those vile bachelors to their right place, and that is that they be no longer our masters, but our fellows. Gascoigne shook his head. He hated clashing and conflict above all things, and was for peace. Why should they thus rush to thrust themselves into trouble? Let matters abide as they were a little longer." surely life was pleasant enough without turning it all topsy-turvy then with a sort of indignation why should miles who had only come among them a month take such service more to heart than they who had endured it for years and finally with the hopefulness of so many of the rest of us he advised miles to let matters alone and they would right themselves in time but Miles' mind was determined. His active spirit could not brook resting passively under a wrong. He would endure no longer, and now or never they must make their stand. But look thee, Miles Fowworth, said Gascoigne, all this is not to be done without in fighting shrewdly. Wilt thou take that fighting upon thine own self? As for me, I tell thee I love it not. Why, I, said Miles, I asked no man to do what I would not do myself. Gascoigne shrugged his shoulders. So be it, said he. And thou hast appetite to run thy head against hard knocks. Do it in mercy's name. I for one will stand thee back while thou art taking thy wraps. There was a spirit of drollery in Gascoigne's speech that rubbed against Miles' earnestness. Out upon it, cried he, his patience giving way. Seest not that I am in serious earnest? Why then dost thou still jest like Mad Noll, my lord's fool? And thou wilt not lend me thine aid in this matter. Say so, and have done with it, and I will bethink me of somewhere else to turn. Then Gascoigne yielded at once, as he always did when his friend lost his temper, and having once assented to it, entered into the scheme heart and soul. Three other lads, one of them that tall thin squire Edmund Wilkes, before spoken of, were sounded upon the subject they also entered into the plan of the secret organization with an enthusiasm which might perhaps not have been quite so glowing had they realized how very soon miles designed embarking upon active practical operations one day miles and gascoigne showed them the strange things that they had discovered in the old tower the inner staircases, the winding passageways, 
the queer niches and cupboard and the black shaft of a well that pierced down into the solid wall and whence perhaps the old castle folk had one time drawn their supply of water in time of siege and with every new wonder of the marvellous place the enthusiasm of the three recruits rose higher and higher they rummaged through the lumber pile in the great circular room as miles and gascoigne had done and at last tired out they ascended to the airy chapel and there sat cooling themselves in the rustling freshness of the breeze that came blowing briskly in through the arched windows it was then and there that the five discussed and finally determined upon the detailed plans of their organization canvassing the names of the squirehood and selecting from it a sufficient number of bold and daring spirits to make up a roll of twenty names in all gascoigne had as i said entered into the matter with spirit and perhaps it was owing more to him than to any other that the project caught its delightful flavor of romance perchance said he as the five lads lay in the rustling stillness through which sounded the monotonous and ceaseless cooing of the pigeons perchance there may be dwarfs and giants and dragons and enchanters and evil knights and what not even nowadays and who knows but that if we knights of the rose held together we may go forth into the world and do battle with them and save beautiful ladies and have tales and jesters written about us as they are written about the seven champions and arthur his round table perhaps miles who lay silently listening to all that was said was the only one who looked upon the scheme at all in the light of real utility but i think that even with him the fun of the matter outweighed the serious part of the business so it was that the sacred order of the twenty knights of the rose came to be initiated they appointed a code of secret passwords and countersigns which were very difficult to remember and which were only used when they might excite the curiosity of the other and uninitiated boys by their mysterious sound they elected miles as their grand high commander and held secret meetings in the ancient tower where many mysteries were soberly enacted of course in a day or two all the body of squires knew nearly everything concerning the knights of the rose and of their secret meetings in the old tower the lucky twenty were the objects of envy of all not so fortunate as to be included in this number and there was a marked air of secrecy about everything they did that appealed to every romantic notion of the youngsters looking on what was the stormy outcome of it all is now presently to be told End of chapter 11。Chapter 12 of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thus it was that Miles, with an eye to open war with the bachelors, gathered a following to his support. It was some little while before matters were brought to a crisis, a week or ten days. Perhaps even Miles had no great desire to hasten matters. He knew that whenever war was declared, he himself would have to bear the brunt of the battle and even the bravest man hesitates before deliberately thrusting himself into a fight one morning miles and gascoigne and wilkes sat under the shade of two trees between which was a board nailed to the trunks making a rude bench always a favorite lounging-place for the lads in idle moments miles was polishing his bassinet with lard and wood ashes rubbing the metal with a piece of leather and wiping it clean with a fustian rag the other two who had just been relieved from household duty lay at length idly looking on just then one of the smaller pages a boy of twelve or thirteen 
by name Robin Ingoldsby, cross the court. He had been crying, his face was red and blubbered, and his body was still shaken with convulsive sniffs. Miles looked up. "'Come hither, Robin,' he called from where he sat. "'What is it to do?' The little fellow came slowly up to where the three rested in the shade. "'May I break beat me with the strap?' said he, rubbing his sleeve across his eyes, and catching his breath at the recollection. "'Beat thee, didst say?' said Miles, drawing his brows together. "'Why did he beat thee?' "'Because,' said Robin, "'I tarried over long in fetching a pot of beer from the buttery for him, and why at?' Then, with a boy's sudden and easy quickness and forgetting past troubles, "'Tell me, Falworth," said he, "'when wilt thou give me that knife thou promised me, the one thou break the blade of yesterday?' "'I know not,' said Miles bluntly, vexed that the boy did not take the disgrace of his beating more to heart. "'Some time soon, mayhap, methinks thou shouldst think more of thy beating than of a broken knife. Now, get thee gone to thy business.' The youngster lingered for a moment or two, watching Miles at his work. "'What is that on the leather scrap, Falworth?' said he curiously. "'Lard and ashes,' said Miles testily. "'Get thee gone, I say, or I will crack thy head for thee.' And he picked up a block of wood with a threatening gesture. The youngster made a hideous grimace, and then scurried away, ducking his head lest, in spite of Miles' well-known good nature, the block should come whizzing after him. "'Hey, that now!' cried Miles, flinging down the block again, and turning to his two friends. "'Beaten with straps because, forsooth, he would not fetch and carry quickly enough to please the haste of these bachelors. Oh, this passes patience, and I for one will bear it no longer!' "'Nay, Miles,' said Gascoigne soothingly, the little imp is as lazy as a dormouse, and as mischievous as a monkey. I'll warrant the hiding was his due, and that more of the like would do him good. Why, how dost thou talk, Francis? said Miles, turning upon him indignantly. Thou knowest that thou likest to see the boy beaten no more than I. Then, after a meditative pause, How many, think ye, we muster of our company of the rose today? Wilkes looked doubtfully at Gascoigne. "'There be only seven of us here now,' said he at last. "'Brinton and Lambourne are away to Robby Castle in Lord George's train, "'and will not be back till Saturday next. "'And what Newton is in the infirmary?' Seventeen beers to now,' said Miles grimly. "'Let us get together this afternoon, such as may, in the Brutus Tower, "'for I, as I did say, will no longer suffer these vile bachelors.' Gascoigne and Wilkes exchanged looks, and then the former blew a long whistle. So that afternoon a gloomy set of young faces were gathered together in the airy, fifteen of the Knights of the Rose, and all knew why they were assembled. The talk which followed was conducted mostly by Miles. He addressed the others with a straightforward vim and earnestness, but the response was only half-hearted and when at last, having heated himself up with his own fire, he sat down, puffing out his red cheeks and glaring round. A space of silence followed. The lads looked doubtfully at one another. Miles felt the chill of their silence strike coldly on his enthusiasm, and it vexed him. "'What wouldst thou do, Falworth?' said one of the knights at last. "'Wouldst thou have us open a quarrel with the bachelors?' "'Nay.' said Miles gruffly. I had thought that ye would all lend me a hand in a pitched battle, but now I see that ye have no stomach for that. Nevertheless, I tell ye plainly, I will not submit longer to the bachelors. So now I will ask ye not to take any venture upon yourselves, but only this, that ye stand by me when I do my fighting, and not let five or seven of them fall upon me at once. There is Walter Blunt. He is powerless strong, said one of the others after a time of silence. Methinks he could conquer any two of us. Nay, said Miles. Ye do fear him too greatly. I tell ye I fear not to stand up to try battle with him, and will do so too, if the need arise. Only say that ye will stand by my back. Marry, said Gascoigne quaintly. And thou wilt dare take the heavy end upon thee? I for one am willing to stand by and see that thou wilt have thy will of fighting. I too will stand thee by, Miles, said Edmund Wilkes. And I? And I, and I, 
said others, chiming in. Those who would still have held back were carried along by the stream, and so it was settled that if the need should arise for Miles to do a bit of fighting, the others should stand by to see that he had fair play. When thinkest thou that thou wilt take thy stand against them, Miles? asked Wilkes. Miles hesitated a moment. Tomorrow, said he grimly. Several of the lads whistled softly. Gascoigne was prepared for an early opening of the war, but perhaps not for such an early opening as this. By a lay, Miles, thou art hungry for brawling, said he. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. After the first excitement of meeting, discussing, and deciding had passed, Miles began to feel the weight of the load he had so boldly taken upon himself. He began to reckon what a serious thing it was for him to stand as a single champion against the tyranny that had grown so strong through years of custom. Had he let himself do so, he might almost have repented, but it was too late now for repentance. He had laid his hand to the plough, and he must drive the furrow. Somehow the news of impending battle had leaked out among the rest of the body of squires, and a buzz of suppressed excitement hummed through the dormitory that evening. The bachelors, to whom, no doubt, vague rumours had been blown, looked lowering and talked together in low voices, standing apart in a group. Some of them made a rather marked show of secreting knives in the straw of their beds, and, no doubt, it had its effect upon more than one young heart that secretly thrilled at the sight of the shining blades. However, all was undisturbed that evening. The lights were put out, and the lads retired with more than usual quietness, only for the murmur of whispering. All night Miles' sleep was more or less disturbed by dreams in which he was now conquering, now being conquered, and before the day had fairly broken he was awake. He lay upon his cot, keying himself up for the encounter which he had set upon himself to face, and it would not be the truth to say that the sight of those knives hidden in the straw the night before had made no impression upon him. By and by he knew the others were beginning to awake, for he heard them softly stirring and as the light grew broad and strong, saw them arise, one by one, and begin dressing in the grey morning. Then he himself arose, and put on his doublet and hose, strapping his belt tightly about his waist. Then he sat down on the side of his cot. Presently that happened for which he was waiting. Two of the younger squires started to bring the bachelor's morning supply of water. As they crossed the room, Miles called to them in a loud voice, a little uneven, perhaps. Stop! We draw no more water for anyone in this house, saving only for ourselves. Set ye down those buckets and go back to your places. The two lads stopped, half turned, and then stood still, holding the three buckets undecidedly. In a moment all was uproar and confusion, for by this time every one of the lads had arisen some sitting on the edge of their beds, some nearly, others quite dressed. A half-dozen of the Knights of the Rose came over to where Miles stood, gathering in a body behind him, and the others followed, one after another. The bachelors were hardly prepared for such prompt and vigorous action. "'What is to do?' cried one of them, who stood near the two lads with the buckets. "'Why fetch ye not the water?' "'Falworth says we shall not fetch it,' answered one of the lads, a boy by the name of Goss. "'What mean ye by that, Falworth?' the young man called to Miles. Miles' heart was beating thickly and heavily within him, but nevertheless he spoke up boldly enough. "'I mean,' said he, 
that henceforth ye shall fetch and carry for yourselves. Looky, Blunt, called the bachelor. Here is Falworth. Says thy squires will fetch no more water for us. The head bachelor had heard all that had passed, and was even then hastily slipping on his doublet and hose. Now then, Falworth, said he at last, striding forward. What is it to do? He will fetch no more water, eh? By your lady, I will know the reason why. He was still advancing towards Miles, with two or three of the older bachelors at his heels, when Gascoigne spoke. Thou hadst best stand back, Blunt, said he. Else thou mayst be hurt. We will not have ye bang Falworth again as ye once did, so stand thou back. Blunt stopped short and looked upon the lads standing behind Miles, some of them with faces a trifle pale, perhaps, but all grim and determined looking enough. Then he turned upon his heel suddenly, and walked back to the far end of the dormitory, where the bachelors were presently clustered together. A few words passed between them, and then the thirteen began at once arming themselves, some with wooden clogs, and some with the knives which they had so openly concealed the night before. At the sign of imminent battle, all those not actively interested scuttled away to right and left, climbing up on the benches and cots, and leaving a free field to the combatants. The next moment would have brought bloodshed. Now Miles, thanks to the training of the Crosbydale Smith, felt tolerably sure that in a wrestling bout he was a match perhaps more than a match for any one of the body of squires, and he had determined, if possible, to bring the battle to a single-handed encounter upon that footing. Accordingly, he suddenly stepped forward before the others. Looky, fellow, he called to Blunt, thou art he who struck whilst I was down some while since. Wilt thou let this quarrel strand between thee and me, and meet me man to man without weapon? See, I throw me down mine own, and will meet thee with bare hands. And as he spoke, he tossed the clog he held in his hand back upon the cot. So be it, said Blunt with great readiness, tossing down a similar weapon which he himself held. Do not go, Miles, cried Gascoigne. He is a villain and a traitor, and would betray thee to thy death. I saw him when he first got from bed hide a knife in his doublet. Thou liest! said Blunt. I swear by my faith, I'd be barehanded as ye see me. Thy friend accuses me, Miles Falworth, because he knoweth thou art afraid of me. There thou liest most vilely, exclaimed Miles. Swear that thou hast no knife, and I will meet thee. Hast thou not heard me say that I have no knife? said Blunt. What more wouldst thou have? Then I will meet thee half way, said Miles. Gascoigne caught him by the sleeve, and would have withheld him, assuring him that he had seen the bachelor conceal a knife. But Miles, hot for the fight, broke away from his friend without listening to him. As the two advanced steadily towards one another, a breathless silence fell upon the dormitory, in sharp contrast to the uproar and confusion that had filled it a moment before. The lads, standing upon some benches, some upon beds, all watched with breathless interest the meeting of the two champions. As they approached one another, they stopped and stood for a moment a little apart, glaring the one upon the other. They seemed ill enough matched. Blunt was fully half a head taller than Miles, and was thick-set and close-knit in young manhood. Nothing but Miles' undaunted pluck could have led him to dare to face an enemy so much older and stouter than himself. The pause was only for a moment. They who looked saw Blunt slide his hand furtively towards his bosom. Miles saw, too, and in the flash of an instant knew what the gesture meant, and sprang upon the other before the hand could grasp what it sought. As he clutched his enemy, he felt what he had in that instant expected to feel the handle of a dagger. The next moment he cried in a loud voice, Oh, thou villain! Help, Gascoigne! He hath a knife under his doublet. 
In answer to his cry for help, Miles' friends started to his aid. But the bachelors shouted, Stand back and let them fight it out alone, else we will knife ye too. And as they spoke, some of them leaped from the benches whereon they stood, drawing their knives and flourishing them. For just a few seconds Miles' friends stood cowed, and in those few seconds the fight came to an end, with a suddenness unexpected to all. A struggle, fierce and silent, followed between the two, Blunt striving to draw his knife, and Miles, with the energy of despair, holding him tightly by the wrist. It was in vain the elder lad writhed and twisted. He was strong enough to overbear Miles, but still was not able to clutch the haft of his knife. "'Thou shalt not draw it,' gasped Miles at last. "'Thou shalt not stab me.' Then again some of his friends started forward to his aid, but they were not needed, for before they came the fight was over. Blunt, finding that he was not able to draw the weapon, suddenly ceased his endeavors, and flung his arms around Miles, trying to bear him down upon the ground, and in that moment his battle was lost. In an instant, so quick, so sudden, so unexpected that no one could see how it happened, his feet were whirled away from under him. He spun with flying arms across Miles' loins, and pitched with a thud upon the stone pavement, where he lay still, motionless, while Miles, his face white with passion and his eyes gleaming, stood glaring around like a young wild boar beset by the dogs. The next moment the silence was broken, and the uproar broke forth with redoubled violence. The bachelors, leaping from the benches, came hurrying forward on one side, and Miles' friends from the other. "'Thou shalt smart for this, Falworth,' said one of the older lads. "'Belike thou hast slain him.' Miles turned upon the speaker like a flash, and with such a passion of fury in his face that the other, a fellow nearly a head taller than he, shrank back, cowed in spite of himself. Then Gascoigne came and laid his hand on his friend's shoulder. "'Who touches me?' cried Miles hoarsely, turning sharply upon him, and then seeing who it was. "'Oh, Francis, they would have killed me.' "'Come away, Miles,' said Gascoigne. Thou knowest not what thou doest, thou art mad. Come away. What if thou hadst killed him? The words called Miles somewhat to himself. I can not, said he, but sullenly and not passionately, and then he suffered Gascoigne and Wilkes to lead him away. Meantime, Blunt's friends had turned him over, and after feeling his temples, his wrist, and his heart, bore him away to a bench at the far end of the room. There they fell to chafing his hands and sprinkling water in his face, a crowd of the others gathering about. Blunt was hidden from miles by those who stood around, and the lad listened to the broken talk that filled the room with its confusion, his anxiety growing keener as he became cooler. But at last, with a heartfelt joy, he gathered from the confused buzz of words that the other lad had opened his eyes, and after a while he saw him sit up, leaning his head upon the shoulder of one of his fellow bachelors, white and faint and sick as death. "'Thank heaven that thou didst not kill him,' said Edmund Wilkes, who had been standing with the crowd looking on at the efforts of Blunt's friends to revive him, and who had now come and sat down upon the bed not far from Miles. Aye, said Miles gruffly. I do thank heaven for that. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. If Miles fancied that one single victory over his enemy would cure the evil against which he fought, he was grievously mistaken. Wrongs are not righted so easily as that. It was only the beginning. 
other and far more bitter battles lay before him ere he could look around him and say i have won the victory for a day for two days the bachelors were demoralized at the fall of their leader and the knights of the rose were proportionately uplifted the day that blunt met his fall the wooden tank in which the water had been poured every morning was found to have been taken away the bachelors made a great show of indignation and inquiry who was it stole their tank if they did but know he should smart for it ho ho roared edmund wilkes so that the whole dormitory heard him smoke ye not their tricks lads see ye not that they have stolen their own water tank so that they might have no need for another to fight over carrying the water the bachelors made an obvious show of not having heard what he said and a general laugh went around no one doubted that wilkes had spoken the truth in his taunt and that the bachelors had indeed stolen their own tank so no more water was ever carried for the head squires but it was plain to see that the war for the upper hand was not yet over even if miles had entertained comforting thoughts to the contrary he was speedily undeceived one morning about a week after the fight as he and gascoigne were crossing the armory court they were hailed by a group of the bachelors standing at the stone steps of the great building hello falworth they cried knowest thou that blunt is nigh well again nay said miles i knew it not but i am right glad to hear it thou wilt sing a different song anon said one of the bachelors i tell thee he is hot against thee and swears when he cometh again he will carve thee smoothly ay marry said another i would not be in thy skin a week hence for a ducat only this morning he told philip mowbray that he would have thy blood for the fall thou gavest him look to thyself falworth he cometh again wednesday or thursday next thou standest in a parlous state miles said gascoigne as they entered the great quadrangle i do indeed fear me that he meaneth to do thee evil i know not said miles boldly but i fear him not nevertheless his heart was heavy with the weight of impending ill one evening the bachelors were more than usually noisy in their end of the dormitory laughing and talking and shouting to one another Halloa, you sirrah falworth called one of them along the length of the room blunt cometh again to-morrow day miles saw gascoigne direct a sharp glance at him but he answered nothing either to his enemy's words or his friend's look as the bachelor had said blunt came the next morning it was just after chapel and the whole body of squires was gathered in the armory waiting for the orders of the day and the calling of the roll of those chosen for household duty miles was sitting on a bench along the wall talking and jesting with some who stood by when of a sudden his heart gave a great leap within him it was walter blunt he came walking in at the door as if nothing had passed and at his unexpected coming the hubbub of talk and laughter was suddenly checked even miles stopped in his speech for a moment and then continued with a beating heart and a carelessness of manner that was altogether assumed in his hand blunt carried the house orders for the day and without seeming to notice miles he opened it and read the list of those called upon for household service miles had risen and was now standing listening with the others when blunt had ended reading the list of names he rolled up the parchment and thrust it into his belt then swinging suddenly on his heel he strode straight up to miles facing him front to front a moment or two of deep silence followed not a sound broke the stillness when blunt spoke every one in the armory heard his words sirrah said he 
Thou didst put foul shame upon me some time sin. Never will I forget or forgive that offence. I will have a reckoning with thee right soon that thou wilt not forget to the last day of thy life. When Miles had seen his enemy turn upon him, he did not know at first what to expect. He would not have been surprised had they come to blows there and then, and he held himself prepared for any event. He faced the other pluckily enough and without flinching, and spoke up boldly in answer. So be it, Walter Blunt. I fear thee not in whatever the way thou mayest encounter me. Dost thou not? said Blunt. By your lady, thou'lt have cause to fear me ere I am through with thee. He smiled a baleful, lingering smile, and then turned slowly and walked away. What thinkest thou, Miles? said Gascoigne, as the two left the armory together. I think not, said Miles gruffly. He will not dare to touch me to harm me. I fear him not. Nevertheless, he did not speak the full feelings of his heart. I know not, Miles, said Gascoigne, shaking his head doubtfully. Walter Blunt is a parlous, evil-minded knave, and methinks will do whatever evil he promiseth. I fear him not, said Miles again, but his heart foreboded trouble. The coming of the head squire made a very great change in the condition of affairs. Even before that coming, the bachelors had somewhat recovered from their demoralization, and now again they began to pluck up their confidence and to order the younger squires and pages upon this personal service or upon that. See ye not, said Miles one day, when the Knights of the Rose were gathered in the Brutus Tower. See ye not that they grow as bad as ever? And we put not a stop to this overmastery now, it will never stop. Best let it be, Miles, said Wilkes. They will kill thee, and thou cease not troubling them. Thou hast spread mischief enow for thyself already. No matter for that, said Miles. It is not to be borne that they order others of us about as they do. I mean to speak to them to-night, and tell them it shall not be. He was as good as his word. That night, as the youngsters were shouting and romping and skylarking, as they always did before turning in, he stood upon his cot and shouted, Silence! List to me a little. And then, in the hush that followed, I want those bachelors to hear this, and that we squires serve them no longer, and that if they would have to some weight upon them, they must get them otherwise than here. There be twenty of us to stand against them, and happily more, and we mean that they shall have service of us no more. Then he jumped down again from his elevated stand, and an uproar of confusion instantly filled the place. What was the effect of his words upon the bachelors he could not see? What was the result he was not slow in discovering? The next day Miles and Gascoigne were throwing their daggers for a wager at a wooden target against the wall, back of the armorer's smithy. Wilkes, Goss, and one or two others of the squires were sitting on a bench looking on, and now and then applauding a more than usually well-aimed cast of the knife. Suddenly that impish little page spoken of before, Robin Inglesby, thrust his shock head around the corner of the smithy and said, "'Ho, Felworth, Blunt is going to serve the out today, and I myself heard him say so.' He says he's going to slit thine ears. And then he was gone as suddenly as he had appeared. Miles darted after him, caught him midway in the quadrangle, and brought him back by the scruff of the neck, squalling and struggling. There, said he, still panting from the chase, and seating the boy by no means gently upon the bench beside Wilkes. Sit thou there, thou imp of evil. Now tell me what thou meanst by the words anon, and thou stop not thine outcry, I will cut thy throat for thee. And he made a ferocious gesture with his dagger. It was by no means easy to worm the story from the mischievous little monkey. He knew Miles too well to be in the least afraid of his threats, but at last, by dint of bribing and coaxing, Miles and his friends managed to get at the facts. 
the youngster had been sent to clean the riding-boots of one of the bachelors instead of which he had lulled idly on a cot in the dormitory until he had at last fallen asleep he had been awakened by the opening of the dormitory door and by the sound of voices among them was that of his taskmaster fearing punishment for his neglected duty he had slipped out of the cot and hidden himself beneath it those who had entered were walter blunt and three of the older bachelors blunt's companions were trying to persuade him against something but without avail it was miles heart thrilled and his blood boiled to lie in wait for him to overpower him by numbers and to mutilate him by slitting his ears a disgraceful punishment administered as a rule only for thieving and poaching he would not dare to do such a thing cried miles with heaving breast and flashing eyes ay but he would said gascoigne his father lord reginald blunt is a great man over nottingham way and my lord would not dare to punish him even for such a matter as that but tell me robin ingoldsby dost thou know aught more of this matter prithee tell me robin where do they propose to lie in wait for falworth in the gateway of the buttery court so as to catch him when he passes by to the armoury answered the boy are they there now said wilkes ay nine of em said robin i heard blunt tell mowbray to go and gather the others he heard thee tell goose falworth that thou wert going thither for thy arbaltus this morn to shoot at the rook's withal that will do robin said miles thou mayest go and therewith the little imp scurried off pulling the lobes of his ears suggestively as he darted around the corner the others looked at one another for a while in silence so comrades said miles at last what shall we do now go and tell sir james said gascoigne promptly nay said miles i take no such coward's part as that i say that and they hunger to fight give them their stomach full the others were very reluctant for such extreme measures but miles as usual carried his way and so a pitched battle was decided upon it was gascoigne who suggested the plan which they afterwards followed then wilkes started away to gather together those of the knights of the rose not upon household duty and miles with the others went to the armor smith to have him make for them a set of knives with which to meet their enemies knives with blades a foot long pointed and double-edged the smith leaning with his hammer upon the anvil listened to them as they described the weapons nay nay master miles said he when miles had ended by telling the use to which he intended putting them thou art going all wrong in this matter with such blades ere this battle is ended some one would be slain and so murder done then the family of him who was killed would haply have ye sighted and mayhap it might e'en come to the hanging for some of they boys had great folkies behind them go ye to tom fletcher master miles and buy of him good yew staves such as one might break a head withal and with them gin ye keep your wits ye may hold your own against knives or short swords i tell thee e'en though my trade be making of blades rather would i ha a good stout cudgel in my hand than the best dagger that ever was forged miles stood thoughtfully for a moment or two then looking up methinks thou speakest truly robin said he and it were ill done to have blood upon our hands End of chapter 14chapter 15 of men of iron by howard pyle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org from the long narrow stone paved armory court and connecting it with the inner buttery court 
ran a narrow arched passageway in which was a picket gate closed at night and locked from within it was in this arched passageway that according to little robert inglesby's report the bachelors were lying in wait for miles gascoigne's plan was that miles should enter the court alone the knights of the rose lying ambushed behind the angle of the armory building until the bachelors should show themselves it was not without trepidation that miles walked alone into the court which happened then to be silent and empty his heart beat more quickly than it was wont and he gripped his cudgel behind his back looking sharply this way and that so as not to be taken unawares by a flank movement of his enemies midway in the court he stopped and hesitated for a moment then he turned as though to enter the armory the next moment he saw the bachelors come pouring out from the archway instantly he turned and rushed back towards where his friends lay hidden shouting to the rescue to the rescue stone him roared blunt the villain escapes he stopped and picked up a cobblestone as he spoke flinging it after his escaping prey it narrowly missed miles head had it struck him there might have been no more of this story to tell to the rescue to the rescue shouted miles friends in answer and the next moment he was surrounded by them then he turned and swinging his cudgel rushed back upon his foes the bachelors stopped short at the unexpected sight of the lads with their cudgels for a moment they rallied and drew their knives then they turned and fled towards their former place of hiding one of them turned for a moment and flung his knife at miles with a deadly aim but miles quick as a cat ducked his body and the weapon flew clattering across the stony court then he who had flung it turned again to fly but in his attempt he had delayed one instant too long miles reached him with a long arm stroke of his cudgel just as he entered the passageway knocking him over like a bottle stunned and senseless the next moment the picket gate was banged in their faces and the bolt shot in the staples and the knights of the rose were left shouting and battering with their cudgels against the palings by this time the uproar of fight had aroused those in the rooms and offices fronting upon the armory court heads were thrust from many of the windows with the eager interest that a fight always evokes beware shouted miles here they come again he bore back towards the entrance of the alleyway as he spoke those behind him scattering to right and left for the bachelors had rallied and were coming again to the attack shouting they were not a moment too soon in this retreat either for the next instant the pickets flew open and a volley of stones flew after the retreating knights of the rose one smote wilkes upon the head knocking him down headlong another struck miles upon his left shoulder benumbing his arm from the finger-tips to the armpit so that he thought at first the limb was broken get ye behind the buttresses shouted those who looked down upon the fight from the windows get ye behind the buttresses and in answer the lads scattering like a newly flushed covey of partridges fled to and crouched in the sheltering angles of masonry to escape from the flying stones and now followed a lull in the battle the bachelors fearing to leave the protection of the arched passageway lest their retreat should be cut off and the knights of the rose not daring to quit the shelter of the buttresses and angles of the wall lest they should be knocked down by the stones the bachelor whom miles had struck down with his cudgel was sitting up rubbing the back of his head and wilkes had gathered his wits enough to crawl to the shelter of the nearest buttress miles peeping around the corner behind which he stood could see that the bachelors were gathered into a little group consulting together suddenly it broke asunder and blunt turned around ho falworth he cried 
Wilt thou hold truce whilst we parley with ye? I answered Miles. Wilt thou give me thine honour that ye will hold your hands from harming us whilst we talk together? Yea, said Miles. I will pledge thee mine honour. I accept thy pledge. See, here we throw aside our stones and lay down our knives. Lay ye by your clubs and meet us in parley at the horse block yonder. So be it, said Miles, and thereupon, standing his cudgel in the angle of the wall, he stepped boldly out into the open courtyard. Those of his party came scatteringly from right and left, gathering about him, and the bachelors advanced in a body, led by the head squire. Now what is it that thou wouldst have, Walter Blunt? said Miles, when both parties had met at the horse block. It is to say this to thee, Miles Falworth, said the other. One time, not long sin, thou didst challenge me to meet thee hand to hand in the dormitory. Then thou didst put a vile affront upon me, for the which I have brought on this battle to-day, for I knew not then what thou wert going to try thy peasant tricks of wrestling and so, without guarding myself, I met thee as thou didst desire. But thou hadst thy knife, and would have stabbed him couldst thou had done so. Said Gascoigne. Thou liest. Said Blunt. I had no knife. And then, without giving time to answer, Thou canst not deny that I met thee then at thy bidding, canst thou, Falworth? Nay. Said Miles. Nor haply canst thou deny it either. And at this covert reminder of his defeat, Miles' followers laughed scoffingly, and Blunt bit his lip. Thou hast said it, said he. Then sin, I met thee at thy bidding, I dare to thee to meet me now at mine, and to fight this battle out between our two selves, with sword and buckler, and bassinet, as gentle should, and not in a wrestling match like two country hodges. Thou art a coward, Caracus, Walter Blunt, burst out Wilkes, who stood by with a swelling lump upon his head, already as big as a walnut. Well, thou knowest that Falworth is no match for thee. At broad sword play, is he not four years younger than thou, and hast thou not three times the practice in arms that he hath had? I say thou art a coward to seek to fight with cutting weapons blunt made no answer to wilkes speech but gazed steadfastly at miles with a scornful smile curling the corners of his lips miles stood looking upon the ground without once lifting his eyes not knowing what to answer for he was well aware that he was no match for blunt with the broadsword thou art afraid to fight me miles falworth said blunt tauntingly and the bachelors gave a jeering laugh in echo then miles looked up and i cannot say that his face was not a trifle whiter than usual nay said he i am not afraid and i will fight thee blunt so be it said blunt then let us go at it straight away in the armoury yonder for they be at dinner in the great hall and just now there be us no one by to stay us. Thou shalt not fight him, Miles, burst out Gascoigne. He will murder thee. Thou shalt not fight him, I say. Miles turned away without answering him. What is to do? called one of those who were still looking out of the windows as the crowd of boys passed beneath. Blunt and Falworth are going to fight it out hand to hand in the armory, answered one of the bachelors looking up. The brawling of the squires was a jest to all the adjoining part of the house, so the heads were withdrawn again, some laughing at the sparring of the cockerels. But it was no jesting matter to poor Miles. End of chapter 15「Chapter 16 of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
I have no intention to describe the fight between Miles Falworth and Walter Blunt. Fisticuffs of nowadays are brutal and debasing enough, but a fight with a sharp-edged broadsword was not only brutal and debasing, but cruel and bloody as well. From the very first of the fight, Miles Falworth was palpably and obviously overmatched. After fifteen minutes had passed, Blunt stood hale and sound as at first. But poor Miles had more than one red stain of warm blood upon doublet and hose, and more than one bandage had been wrapped by Gascoigne and Wilkes about sore wounds. He had received no serious injury as yet, for not only was his body protected by a buckler or a small oblong shield, which he carried upon his left arm, and his head by a bassinet or light helmet of steel, but perhaps after all Blunt was not over-anxious to do him any dangerous harm. Nevertheless, there could be but one opinion as to how the fight tended and Miles' friends were gloomy and downcast, the bachelors proportionately exultant, shouting with laughter and taunting Miles at every unsuccessful stroke. Once, as he drew back panting, leaning upon Gascoigne's shoulder, the faithful friend whispered with trembling lips, "'Oh, dear Miles, carry it no further. Thou hurtest him not, and he will slay thee, ere he have done with thee.' Thereupon Blunt, who caught the drift of the speech, put in a word. "'Thou art sore hurt, Miles Falworth,' said he, "'and I would do thee no grievous harm. Yield thee, and own thyself beaten, and I will forgive thee. Thou hast fought a good fight, and there is no shame in yielding now.' "'Never!' cried Miles hoarsely. "'Never will I yield me. Thou mayst slay me, Walter Blunt, and I reek not if thou dost do so, but never wilt thou conquer me. There was a tone of desperation in his voice that made all look serious. Nay, said Blunt, I will fight thee no more, Miles Falworth. Thou hast had enough. By heavens, cried Miles, grinding his teeth. Thou shalt fight me, thou coward. Thou hast brought this fight upon us, and either thou or I get our quittance here. Let go, Gascoigne he cried, shaking loose his friend's hold. I tell thee, he shall fight me. From that moment, Blunt began to lose his head. No doubt he had not thought of such a serious fight as this when he had given his challenge, and there was a savage bulldog tenacity about Miles that could not but have had a somewhat demoralizing effect upon him. A few blows were given and taken, and then Miles' friends gave a shout. Blunt drew back and placed his hand to his shoulder. When he drew it away again, it was stained with red, and another red stain grew and spread rapidly down the sleeve of his jacket. He stared at his hand for a moment with a half-dazed look, and then glanced quickly to right and left. "'I will fight no more,' said he sullenly. "'Then yield thee!' cried Miles exultantly. The triumphant shouts of the Knights of the Rose stung Blunt like a lash, and the battle began again. Perhaps some of the older lads were of a mind to interfere at this point. Certainly some looked very serious, but before they interposed the fight was ended. Blunt, grinding his teeth, struck one undercut at his opponent the same undercut that miles had that time struck at sir james lee at the knight's bidding when he first practised at the devlin pels miles met the blow as sir james had met the blow that he had given and then struck in return as sir james had struck full and true the bassinet that blunt wore glanced the blow partly but not entirely Miles felt his sword bite through the light steel cap, and Blunt dropped his own blade, clattering upon the floor. It was all over in an instant, but in that instant what he saw was stamped upon Miles' mind with an indelible imprint. He saw the young man stagger backward, he saw the eyes roll upward, 
and a red streak shoot out from under the cap and run down across the cheek. Blunt reeled half around, and then fell prostrate upon his face, and Miles stood staring at him with the delirious turmoil of his battle, dissolving rapidly into a dumb fear at that which he had done. Once again he had won the victory, but what a victory! Is he dead? He whispered to Gascoigne. I know not, said Gascoigne with a very pale face. But come away, Miles. And he led his friend out of the room. Some little while later, one of the bachelors came to the dormitory where Miles, his wounds smarting and aching and throbbing, lay stretched upon his cot, and with a very serious face bade him to go presently to Sir James, who had just come from dinner and was then in his office. By this time Miles knew that he had not slain his enemy, and his heart was light in spite of the coming interview. There was no one in the office but Sir James and himself, and Miles, without concealing anything, told, point by point, the whole trouble. Sir James sat looking steadily at him for a while after he had ended. Never, said he presently, did I know any one of ye squires in all the time that I have been here get himself into so many broils as thou, Miles Falworth? Belike thou sought to take this lad's life. Nay, said Miles earnestly. God forbid. Nevertheless, said Sir James, thou fetched him a main shrewd blow, but it is by good hap and no fault of thine that he will live to do more mischief yet. This is thy second venture at him. The third time, haply, thou wilt end him for good. Then suddenly, assuming his grimmest and sternest manner, Now, sirrah, do I put a stop to this, and no more shall ye fight with edge tools. Get thee to the dormitory, and abide there a full week without coming forth. Michael shall bring thee bread and water twice a day for that time. That is all the food thou shalt have and we will see if that bear will not cool thy hot humours withal. Miles had expected a punishment so much more severe than that, which was thus meted to him, that in the sudden relief he broke into a convulsive laugh, and then, with a hasty sweep, wiped a brimming moisture from his eyes. Sir James looked keenly at him for a moment. Thou art play in your face, said he, Art thou wounded very sorely? Nay, said Miles. It is not much, but I may be sick in my stomach. Ay, ay, said Sir James. I know that feeling well. It is thus that one always feeleth in coming out from a sore battle when one hath suffered wounds and lost blood. And thou wouldst keep thyself hale, Keep thyself from needless fighting. Now go thou to the dormitory, and as I said, come thou not forth again for a week. Stay, Sarah, he added. I will send George Barber to thee to look to thy sores. Green wounds are best drawn and salved ere they grow cold. I wonder what Miles would have thought had he known that so soon as he had left the office, Sir James had gone straight to the Earl, and recounted the whole matter to him with a deal of dry gusto, and that the Earl listened, laughing. Ay, said he, when Sir James had done. The boy hath meddled, sure. Nevertheless, we must transplant this fellow blunt to the office of gentleman-in-waiting. <laughs> He must be old enough now, and Guinea stayeth in his present place. Either he will do the boy a harm, or the boy will do him a harm. So Blunt never came again to trouble the squire's quarters, and thereafter the youngsters rendered no more service to the elders. Miles' first great fight in life was won. End of chapter 16
Chapter Seventeen of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The summer passed away, and the bleak fall came. Miles had long since accepted his position as one set apart from the others of his kind and had resigned himself to the evident fact that he was never to serve in the household in waiting upon the earl i cannot say that it never troubled him but in time there came a compensation of which i shall have presently to speak and then he had so much the more time to himself the other lads were sometimes occupied by their household duties when sports were afoot in which they would have liked to have taken part Miles was always free to enter into any matter of the kind after his daily exercise had been performed at the pels, the butts, or the tilting court. But even though he was never called to do service in my lord's house, he was not long in gaining a sort of second-hand knowledge of all the family. My lady, a thin, sallow, faded dame, not yet past middle age, but looking ten years older, the Lady Anne, the daughter of the house, a tall, thin, dark-eyed, dark-haired, handsome young dame of twenty or twenty-one years of age, hawk-nosed like her father, and silent, proud, and haughty, Miles heard the squire say, Lady Alice, the Earl of Mackworth's niece and ward, a great heiress in her own right, a strikingly pretty black-eyed girl of fourteen or fifteen, these composed the earl's personal family but besides them was lord george beaumont his earl's brother and him miles soon came to know better than any of the chief people of the castle excepting sir james lee for since miles great battle in the armory lord george had taken a laughing sort of liking to the lad encouraging him at times to talk of his adventures and of his hopes and aspirations perhaps the earl's younger brother who was himself somewhat a soldier of fortune having fought in spain france and germany felt a certain kinship in spirit with the adventurous youngster who had his unfriended way to make in the world however that might have been lord george was very kind and friendly to the lad and the willing service that miles rendered him reconciled him not a little to the earl's obvious neglect besides those of the more immediate family of the earl were a number of knights ladies and gentlemen some of them cadets some of them retainers of the house of beaumont for the princely nobles of those days lived in state little less royal than royalty itself most of the knights and gentlemen miles soon came to know by sight meeting them in lord george's apartments in the south wing of the great house and some of them following the lead of lord george singled him out for friendly notice giving him a nod or a word in passing every season has its pleasures for boys and the constant change that they bring is one of the greatest delights of boyhood's days all of us as we grow older have in our memory pictures of bygone times that are somehow more than usually vivid the colours of some not blurring by time as others do one of which in remembering always filled miles heart in after years with an indefinable pleasure was the recollection of standing with others of his fellow squires in the crisp brown autumn grass of the paddock and shooting with the longbow at wild fowl which when the east wind was straining flew low overhead to pitch to the lake in the forbidden precincts of the deer park beyond the brow of the hill more than once a brace or two of these wild fowl shot in their southward flight by the lads and cooked by fat good-natured mother joan graced the rude mess-table of the squires in the long hall and even the toughest and fishiest drake so the fruit of their skill had a savour that somehow or other the daintiest fare lacked in after years 
Then fall passed, and winter came, bleak, cold, and dreary, not winter as we know it nowadays, with warm fires and bright lights to make the long nights sweet and cheerful with comfort, but winter with all its grimness and sternness. In the great, cold, stone-walled castles of those days, the only fire, and almost the only light, were those from the huge blazing logs that roared and crackled in the great open stone fireplace, around which the folks gathered sheltering their faces as best they could from the scorching heat and cloaking their shoulders from the biting cold for at the farther end of the room where giant shadows swayed and bowed and danced huge and black against the high walls the white frost glistened in the moonlight on the stone pavements and the breath went up like smoke in those days were no books to read but at the best only rude stories and jests recited by some strolling mummer or minstrel to the listening circle gathered around the blaze and welcoming the coarse gross jests and coarser grosser songs with roars of boisterous laughter yet bleak and dreary as was the winter in those days and cold and biting as was the frost in the cheerless windy halls and corridors of the castle it was not without its joys to the young lads for then as now boys could find pleasure even in slushy weather when the sodden snow is fit for nothing but to make snowballs of thrice that bitter winter the moat was frozen over and the lads making themselves skates of marrow bones which they bought from the hall cook at a groat a pair went skimming over the smooth surface red-checked and shouting while the crows and the jackdaws looked down at them from the top of the bleak grey walls then at yuletide which was somewhat of a rude semblance to the merry christmas season of our day a great feast was held in the hall and all the castle folk were fed in the presence of the earl and the countess oxen and sheep were roasted whole huge suet puddings made of barley meal sweetened with honey and stuffed with plums were boiled in great cauldrons in the open courtyard whole barrels of ale and malmsey were broached and all the folk gentle and simple were bidden to the feast afterwards the minstrels danced and played a rude play and in the evening a miracle show was performed on a raised platform in the north hall for a week afterwards the castle was fed upon the remains of the good things left from that great feast until every one grew to loathe fine victuals and longed for honest beef and mustard again then at last in that constant change the winter was gone and even the lads who had enjoyed its passing were glad when the winds blew warm once more and the grass showed green in sunny places and the leader of the wild fowl blew his horn as they who in the fall had flown to the south flew arrow-like northward again when the buds swelled and the leaves burst forth once more and crocuses and then daffodils gleamed in the green grass like sparks and flames of gold with the spring came the outdoor sports of the season among others that of ball for boys were boys and played at ball even in those faraway days a game called trap ball even yet in some parts of england it is played just as it was in miles falworth's day and enjoyed just as miles and his friends enjoyed it so now that the sun was warm and the weather pleasant the game of trap ball was in full swing every afternoon the playground being an open space between the wall that surrounded the castle grounds and that of the privy garden the plaisance in which the ladies of the earl's family took the air every day and upon which their apartments opened now one fine breezy afternoon when the lads were shouting and playing at this then their favourite game miles himself was at the trap bare-handed and bare-armed the wind was blowing from behind him and aided perhaps by it 
he had already struck three of four balls nearly the whole length of the court an unusual distance and several of the lads had gone back almost as far as the wall of the privy garden to catch any ball that might chance to fly as far as that then once more miles struck throwing all his strength into the blow the ball shot up into the air and when it fell it was to drop within the privy garden the shouts of the young players were instantly stilled and gascoigne who stood nearest miles thrust his hands into his belt giving a long shrill whistle this time thou hast struck us all out miles said he there be no more play for us until we get another ball the outfielders came slowly trooping in until they had gathered in a little circle around miles i could not help it said miles in answer to their grumbling how knew i the ball would fly so far but if i have lost the ball i can get it again i will climb the wall for it thou shalt do not of the kind miles said gascoigne hastily thou art as mad as a march hare to think of such a venture wouldst get thyself shot with a bolt betwixt the ribs like poor dick and cook of all places about the castle the privy garden was perhaps the most sacred it was a small plot of ground only a few rods long and wide and was kept absolutely private for the use of the countess and her family only a little while before miles had first come to devlin one of the cook's men had been found climbing the wall whereupon the soldier who saw him shot him with his crossbow the poor fellow dropped from the wall into the garden and when they found him he still held a bunch of flowers in his hand which he had perhaps been gathering for his sweetheart had miles seen him carried on a litter to the infirmary as gascoigne and some of the others had done he might have thought twice before venturing to enter the lady's private garden as it was he only shook his stubborn head and said again i will climb the wall for it now at the lower extremity of the court and about twelve or fifteen feet distant from the garden wall there grew a pear tree some of the branches of which overhung into the garden beyond so first making sure that no one was looking that way and bidding the others keep a sharp lookout miles shinned up this tree and choosing one of the thicker limbs climbed out upon it for some little distance then lowering his body he hung at arm's length the branch bending with his weight and slowly let himself down hand under hand until at last he hung directly over the top of the wall and perhaps a foot above it below him he could see the leafy top of an arbor covered with a thick growth of clematis and even as he hung there he noticed the broad smooth walks the grassy terrace in front of the countess's apartments in the distance the quaint flower-beds the yew-trees trimmed into odd shapes and even the deaf old gardener working bare-armed in the sunlight at a flower-bed in the far corner by the tool-house the top of the wall was pointed like a house roof and immediately below him was covered by a thick growth of green moss and it flashed through his mind as he hung there that maybe it would offer a very slippery foothold for one dropping upon the steep slopes of the top but it was too late to draw back now bracing himself for a moment he loosed his hold upon the limb above the branch flew back with a rush and he dropped striving to grasp the sloping angle with his feet instantly the treacherous slippery moss slid away from beneath him he made a vain clutch at the wall his fingers sliding over the cold stones then with a sharp exclamation down he pitched bodily into the garden beneath a thousand thoughts flew through his brain like a cloud of flies and then a leafy greenness seemed to strike up against him a splintering crash sounded in his ears as the lattice top of the arbor broke under him and with one final clutch at the empty air he fell heavily upon the ground beneath he heard a shrill scream that seemed to find an instant echo 
even as he fell he had a vision of faces and bright colours and when he sat up dazed and bewildered he found himself face to face with the lady anne the daughter of the house and her cousin the lady alice who clutching one another tightly stood staring at him with wide scared eyes End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. For a little time there was a pause of deep silence, during which the fluttering leaves came drifting down from the broken arbor above. It was the Lady Anne who first spoke. "'Who art thou, and whence comest thou?' said she tremulously. Then Miles gathered himself up sheepishly. "'My name is Miles Falworth,' said he. "'And I am one of the squires of the body.' "'Oh, ay," said the Lady Alice suddenly. "'Methought I knew thy face. Art thou not the young man that I have seen in Lord George's train?' "'Yes, Lady,' said Miles, wrapping and twining a piece of the broken vine in and out among his fingers. Lord George had often had me of late about his person. And what dost thou do here, sirrah? said Lady Anne angrily. How darest thou come so into our garden? I meant not to come as I did, said Miles clumsily, and with a face hot and red. But I slipped over the top of the wall and fell hastily into the garden. Truly, lady, I meant ye no harm or fright thereby. He looked so drolly abashed as he stood before them, with his clothes torn and soiled from the fall, his face red, and his eyes downcast, all the while industriously twisting the piece of clematis in and around his fingers, that Lady Anne's half-frightened anger could not last. She and her cousin exchanged glances and smiled at one another. But said she at last, trying to draw her pretty brows together into a frown. Tell me, why didst thou seek to climb the wall? I came to seek a ball, said Miles, which I struck hither, from the courtyard beyond. And wouldst thou come into our privy garden for no better reason than to find a ball? said the young lady. Nay, said Miles. It was not so much to find the ball, but in good sooth I did strike it harder than need be. And so, Jim, I lost the ball, and could do no less than come and find it again, else our sport is done for the day. So it was I came hither. The two young ladies had by now recovered from their fright. The Lady Anne slyly nudged her cousin with her elbow, and the younger could not suppress a half-nervous laugh. Miles heard it, and felt his face grow hotter and redder than ever. Nay, said Lady Anne, I do believe, Master Giles. My name beest Miles. Corrected Miles. Very well, then, Master Miles. I say I do believe that thou meanest no harm in coming hither. Nevertheless, it was ill of thee to do so. And my father should find thee here, he would have thee shrewdly punished for such trespassing. Dost thou not know that no one is permitted to enter this place? No, not even my Uncle George. One fellow who came hither to steal apples once had his ears shaven close to his head, and not more than a year ago one of the cook's men who climbed the wall early one morning was shot by the watchman. Aye, said Miles. I knew of him who was shot, and it did go somewhat against my stomach to venture, knowing what had happened to him. Nevertheless, and I get not the ball, how were we to play more today at the trap? Marry, thou art a bold fellow, I do believe me, said the young lady. And sin thou hast come in the face of such peril to get thy ball, thou shalt not go away empty. Whither didst thou strike it? Over yonder by the cherry tree, said Miles, jerking his head in that direction. And may I go get it? I will trouble ye no more. As he spoke, he made a motion to leave them. Stay, said the Lady Anne hastily. Remain where thou art, and thou cross the open, someone may haply see thee from the house, and will give the alarm and thou wilt be lost. I will go get thy ball. And so she left Miles and her cousin, 
crossing the little plots of grass and skirting the rose bushes to the cherry tree when miles found himself alone with lady alice he knew not where to look or what to do but twisted the piece of clematis which he still held in and out more industriously than ever lady alice watched him with dancing eyes for a little while haply thou wilt spoil that poor vine said she by and by breaking the silence and laughing then turning suddenly serious again didst thou hurt thyself by thy fall nay said miles looking up such a fall as that was no great matter many and many a time i have had worse hast thou so said the lady alice thou didst fright me parlously and my cause likewise miles hesitated for a moment and then blurted out thereat i grieve for thee i would not fight for all the world the young lady laughed and blushed all the world is a great matter <laughs> said she yea said he it is a great matter but it is a greater matter to fright thee and so i would not do it for that and more the young lady laughed again but she did not say anything further and a space of silence fell so long that by and by she forced herself to say my cousin findeth not the ball presently nay said miles briefly and then again neither spoke until by and by the lady anne came bringing the ball miles felt a great sense of relief at that coming and yet was somehow sorry then he took the ball and knew enough to bow his acknowledgment in a manner neither ill nor awkward didst thou hurt thyself asked lady anne nay said miles giving himself a shake seest thou not i be whole limb and bone nay i have had shrewdly worse falls than that once i fell out of an oak tree down by the river and upon a root and bethought that i did break a rib or more and then one time when i was a boy in crosby dale that was where i lived before i came hither i did catch me a hold of a blade of the windmill thinking it was moving slowly and that i would have a ride in the air and so was like to have a fall ten thousand times worse than this oh tell us more of that said the lady anne eagerly i did never hear of such an adventure as that come coz and sit down here upon the bench and let us have him tell us of all that happening now the lads upon the other side of the wall had been whistling furtively for some time not knowing whether miles had broken his neck or had come off scot-free from his fall i would like right well to stay with ye said he irresolutely and, and would gladly tell ye that and more and ye would have me do to do so but hear ye not my friends call me from beyond mayhap they think i break my back and i'm calling to see whether i be alive or no and i might whistle them answer and toss me the ball to them all would then be well and they would know that i was not hurt and so haply would go away then answer them said the lady anne and tell us of that thing thou spokest of anon how thou tookest a ride upon the windmill we young ladies do hear little of such matters not being allowed to talk with lads all that we hear of perils are of knights and ladies and jousting and such like it would pleasure us right well to have thee tell of thy adventures so miles tossed back the ball and whistled in answer to his friends then he told the two young ladies not only of his adventure upon the windmill but also of other boyish escapades and told them well with a straightforward smack and vigour for he enjoyed adventure and loved to talk of it in a little while he had regained his ease his shyness and awkwardness left him and nothing remained but the delightful fact that he was really and actually talking to two young ladies and that with just as much ease and infinitely more pleasure than could be had in discourse with his fellow squires but at last it was time for him to go marry said he with a half sigh methinks i did never have so sweet and pleasant a time in all my life before never did i know a real lady to talk with saving only my mother and i do tell ye plain methinks i would rather talk with ye than with any he in christendom saving perhaps only my friend gascoigne i would might come hither again the honest frankness of his speech was irresistible the two girls exchanged glances and then began laughing <laughs> truly 
said Lady Anne, who, as was said before, was some three or four years older than Miles. Thou art a bold lad to ask such a thing. How wouldst thou come hither? Wouldst tumble through our Clematis arbour again, as thou didst this day? Nay, said Miles. I would not do that again, but if you bid me to do so, I will find the means to come hither. Nay, said Lady Anne. I dare not bid thee to do such a foolhardy thing. Nevertheless, if thou hast the courage to come... Yea, said Miles eagerly. I have the courage. Then, if thou hast so, we will be here in the garden on Saturday, next at this hour. I would like right well to hear more of thy adventures. But what didst thou say was thy name? I have forgot it again. It is Miles Falworth. Then we shall eclep thee, Sir Miles, for thou art a soothly errant knight. And stay, every knight must have a lady to serve. How wouldst thou like my cousin Alice here for thy true lady? Aye, said Miles eagerly. I would like it right well. And then he blushed fiery red at his boldness. I want no errant knight to serve me, said the lady Alice, blushing in answer. Thou dost ill-tease me, Cos, and thou art so free in choosing him a lady to serve. Thou mayest choose him thyself for thy pains. Nay, <laughs> said the lady Anne, laughing. I say thou shalt be his true lady, and he shall be thy true knight. Who knows? Perchance he may serve thee in some wondrous adventure, like as Chaucer telleth of. But now, Sir Errant Knight, thou must take thy leave of us, and I must e'en let thee privily out by the post and wicket, and if thou wilt take the risk upon thee and come hither again, prithee be wary in that coming, lest in venturing thou have thine ears clipped in most unknightly fashion. That evening, as he and Gascoigne sat together on a bench under the trees in the great quadrangle, miles told of his adventure of the afternoon and his friend listened with breathless interest but miles cried gascoigne did the lady anne never once seem proud and unkind nay said miles only at first when she chid me for falling through the roof of their arbour and to think francis lady anne herself bade me hold the lady alice as my true lady to serve her in all knightliness then he told his friend that he was going to the privy garden again on the next saturday and that the lady anne had given him permission so to do gascoigne gave a long wondering whistle and then sat quite still staring into the sky by and by he turned to his friend and said i give thee my pledge miles farworth that never in all my life did i hear of any one that had such marvellous strange happenings befall him as thou. Whenever the opportunity occurred for sending a letter to Crosby Halt, Miles wrote one to his mother, and one can guess how they were treasured by the good lady, and read over and over again to the blind old lord as he sat staring into darkness with his sightless eyes about the time of this escapade he wrote a letter telling of those doings wherein after speaking of his misadventure of falling from the wall and of his acquaintance with the young ladies he went on to speak of the matter in which he repeated his visits the letter was worded in the english of that day the quaint and crabbed language in which chaucer wrote Perhaps few boys could read it nowadays, so modernizing it somewhat, it ran thus. And now to let ye wet that thing that followed it happening that made me acquaint with they two young damsels, I take me to the south wall of a garden one day four and twenty great spikes, which Peter Smith did forge for me, and for which I pay him fivepence, and all the money that I ever left in my half year's wage, and what not, where I may get more of these present without him. I do betake me to Sir James, who, as I did tell ye, hath consented to hold these monies the prior Edward gave me till I need them. Now, these same spikes, I say, I take them down behind the corner of the wall, there, drave them between the stones, my very dear comrade and true friend Gascoigne helping me to do so. And so comes Saturday, I climb me over the wall into the roof of the tool-house below, seeking a proper fitting opportunity where I might do so without being in too great jeopardy. Yea, and who should be there but the two young ladies biding my coming, and who, seeing me, made as though they expected me not, 
and gave me greatest rebuke for adventuring so mightily, yet methinks they were right well pleasured that I could so adventure, which indeed I might not otherwise do, seeing as I have told thee that one of them is mine own true lady for to serve him, and that was the only way that I might come to speech with her. Such was Miles' own quaint way of telling how he accomplished his aim of visiting the forbidden garden, and no doubt the smack of adventure and the savour of danger in the undertaking recommended him not a little to the favour of the young ladies. After this first acquaintance, perhaps a month passed, during which Miles had climbed the wall some half a dozen times for the lady anne would not permit of two frequent visits and during which the first acquaintance of the three ripened rapidly to an honest pleasant friendship more than once miles when in lord george's train caught a covert smile or half nod from one or both of the girls not a little delightful in its very secret friendliness End of chapter 18。Chapter 19 of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. As was said, perhaps a month passed. Then Miles' visits came to an abrupt termination, and with it ended, in a certain sense, a chapter of his life. One Saturday afternoon he climbed the garden wall, and skirting behind a long row of rose-bushes that screened him from the countess's terrace, came to a little summer house where the two young ladies had appointed to meet him that day. A pleasant half-hour or so was passed, and then it was time for Miles to go. He lingered for a while before he took his final leave, leaning against the doorpost, and laughingly telling how he and some of his brother's squires had made a figure of straw dressed in men's clothes, and had played a trick with it one night upon a watchman against whom they bore a grudge. The young ladies were listening with laughing faces, when suddenly, as Miles looked, he saw the smile vanish from Lady Alice's eyes, and a wide terror take its place. She gave a half-articulate cry, and rose abruptly from the bench upon which she was sitting. Miles turned sharply, and then his very heart seemed to stand still within him for there standing in the broad sunlight without and glaring in upon the party with baleful eyes was the earl of mackworth himself how long was the breathless silence that followed miles could never tell he knew that the lady anne had also risen and that she and her cousin were standing as still as statues presently the earl pointed to the house with his staff and miles noted stupidly how it trembled in his hand ye wenches said he at last in a hard harsh voice ye wenches what meaneth this would ye deceive me so and hold parlance thus secretly with this fellow i will settle with him anon meantime get ye straight away to the house and to your rooms and there abide until i give ye leave to come forth again go i say father said Lady Anne, in a breathless voice. She was as white as death, and moistened her lips with her tongue before she spoke. Father, thou wilt not do harm to this young man. Spare him, I do beseech thee, for truly it was I who bade him come hither. I know that he would not have come but at our bidding. The Earl stamped his foot upon the gravel. Did ye not hear me? said he, still pointing towards the house with his trembling staff. I bade ye go to your rooms. I will settle with this fellow, I say, as I deem fitting. Father, began Lady Anne again, but the Earl made such a savage gesture that poor Lady Alice uttered a faint shriek, and Lady Anne stopped abruptly, trembling. Then she turned and passed out the farther door of the summer-house, poor little lady alice following holding her tight by the skirts and trembling and shuddering as though with a fit of the ague 
The earl stood looking grimly after them from under his shaggy eyebrows until they passed away behind the yew trees appeared again upon the terrace behind entered the open doors of the women's house and were gone miles heard their footsteps growing fainter and fainter but he never raised his eyes upon the ground at his feet were four pebbles and he noticed how they almost made a square and would do so if he pushed one of them with his toe and then it seemed strange to him that he should think of such a little foolish thing at that dreadful time. He knew that the earl was looking gloomily at him, and that his face must be very pale. Suddenly Lord Mackworth spoke. "'What hast thou to say?' said he harshly. Then Miles raised his eyes, and the earl smiled grimly as he looked his victim over. "'I have naught to say.' said the lad huskily didst thou not hear what my daughter spake but now said the earl she said that thou came not of thy own free will what sayest thou to that sirrah is it true miles hesitated for a moment or two his throat was tight and dry nay said he at last she belieth herself it was i who first came into the garden i fell by chance from the tree yonder i was seeking a ball and then asked those two if i might not come hither again and so have done sev several times in all. But as for her, nay, it was not at her bidding that I came, but through my own asking. The earl gave a little grunt in his throat. <laughs> and how often hast thou been here? said he presently. Miles thought a moment or two. This maketh the seventh time, said he. Another pause of silence followed, and Miles began to pluck up some heart that maybe all would yet be well. The earl's next speech dashed that hope into a thousand fragments. "'Well thou knowest,' said he, "'that it is forbid for any to come here. Well thou knowest that twice have men been punished for this thing that thou hast done, and yet thou camest in spite of all. Now dost thou know what thou wilt suffer?' Miles picked with nervous fingers at a crack in the oaken post against which he leaned. "'Mayhap thou wilt kill me.' said he at last, in a dull, choking voice. Again the earl smiled a grim smile. Nay, said he, I would not slay thee, for thou hast gentle blood. But what sayest thou, should I shear thine ears from thine head, or perchance have thee scourged in the great court? The sting of the words sent the blood flying back to Miles' face again, and he looked quickly up. Nay, said he, with a boldness that surprised himself. Thou shalt do no such unlawly thing upon me as that. I be thy peer, sir, in blood, and though thou mayest kill me, thou hast no right to shame me. Lord Mackworth bowed with a mocking courtesy. Marry, said he, methought it was one of mine own saucy popinjay squires that I caught sneaking here and talking to those two foolish young lasses, and lo, it is a young lord, or mayhap thou art a young prince and commandeth me that I shall not do this, and I shall not do that. I crave your lordship's honourable pardon, if I have said aught that may have galled you. The fear Miles had felt was now beginning to dissolve in rising wrath. Nay, said he stoutly, I be no lord, and I be no prince, but I be as good as thou. For am I not the son of thy one-time very true comrade, and thy kinsman to wit, the Lord Falworth, whom, as thou knowest, is poor and broken? and blind, and helpless, and outlawed, and banned, yet, cried he, grinding his teeth, as the thought of it all rushed in upon him. I would rather be in his place than in yours, for though he be ruined, you. He had just sense enough to stop there. The earl, gripping his staff behind his back, and with his head a little bent, was looking keenly at the lad from under his shaggy grey brows. Well, said he, as Miles stopped. Thou hast gone too far now to draw back. Say thy say to the end. Why wouldst thou rather be in thy father's stead than in mine? Miles did not answer. Thou shalt finish thy speech, or else show thyself a coward. Though thy father is ruined, thou didst say I am... What? Miles keyed himself up to the effort, and then blurted out, Thou art attainted with shame. A long, breathless silence followed. Miles Falworth, 
said the earl at last, and even in the whirling of his wits, Miles wondered that he had the name so pat. Miles Falworth, of all the bold, mad, harebrained fools, thou art the most foolish. How dost thou dare say such words to me? Dost thou not know that thou makest thy coming punishment ten times more bitter by such a speech? Aye, cried Miles desperately. But what else could I do? And I did not say the words thou callest me coward and coward I am not. By our lady, said the earl, I do believe thee. Thou art a bold, impudent varlet as ever lived, to beard me so forsooth. Harkee, thou sayest I think not of mine old comrade. I will show thee that thou dost belie me. I will suffer what thou hast said to me for his sake, and for his sake will forgive thee thy coming hither, which I would not do in another case to any other man. Now get thee gone straightway and come hither no more. Yonder is the postern gate. Mayhap thou knowest the way. But stay, how camest thou hither? Miles told him of the spikes he had driven in the wall, and the earl listened, stroking his beard. When the lad had ended, he fixed a sharp look upon him. But thou drove not those spikes alone, said he. Who helped thee do it? That I may not tell, said Miles firmly. So be it, said the earl. I will not ask thee to tell his name. Now get thee gone, and as for those spikes, thou mayest e'en knock them out of the wall, sin thou drave them in. Play no more pranks, and thou wouldst keep thy skin whole. And now go, I say. Miles needed no further bidding, but turned and left the earl without another word. As he went out the postern gate, he looked over his shoulder and saw the tall figure, in its long fur-trimmed gown, still standing in the middle of the path, looking after him from under the shaggy eyebrows. As he ran across the quadrangle, his heart still fluttering in his breast, he muttered to himself, The old grizzled beard. And had I not faced him a bold front, mayhap he would have put such a shame upon me as he said. I wonder why he stood so staring after me as I left the garden. Then, for the time, the matter slipped from his mind, saving only that part that smacked of adventure. End of chapter 19《Chapter Twenty of Men of Iron》by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. So for a little while, Miles was disposed to congratulate himself upon having come off so well from his adventure with the Earl. But after a day or two had passed, and he had time for second thought, he began to misdoubt whether, after all, he might not have carried it with a better air if he had shown more chivalrous boldness in the presence of his true lady, whether it would not have redounded more to his credit if he had in some way asserted his rights as the young dame's knight-errant and defender, was it not ignominious to resign his rights and privileges so easily and tamely at a signal from the earl for in sooth said he to gascoigne as the two talked the matter over she hath in a certain way accepted me for her knight and yet i stood me there without saying so much as a single word in her behalf nay said gascoigne they would not trouble me on that score. Methinks that thou didst come off wondrous well out of the business. I would not have thought it possible that my lord could have been so patient with thee as he showed himself. Methinks, forsooth, he must hold thee privily in right high esteem. Truly, said Miles, after a little pause of meditative silence. I know not of any esteem, yet I do think he was passing patient with me in this matter. Nevertheless, Francis, that changeth not my stand in the case. Yea, I did shamefully, so uh, to resign my lady without speaking one word, nor will I so resign her even yet. I have bethought me much of this matter of late, Francis, and now I have come to thee to help me from my evil case. I would have thee act in the part of a true friend to me, like that one I would have told thee of in the story of the Emperor Justinian. 
I would have thee, when thou next servest in the house, to so contrive that my Lady Alice shall get a letter, which I shall presently write, and wherein I may set all that is crooked straight again. Heaven forbid, said Gascoigne hastily, that I should be such a fool as to burn my fingers in drawing thy nuts from the fire. Deliver thy letter thyself, good fellow. So spoke Gascoigne, yet after all he ended, as he usually did, by yielding to Miles' superior will and persistence. So the letter was written, and one day the good-natured Gascoigne carried it with him to the house, and the opportunity offering gave it to one of the young ladies attendant upon the countess's family, a lass with whom he had friendly intimacy to be delivered to Lady Alice. But if Miles congratulated himself upon the success of this new adventure, it was not for long. That night, as the crowd of pages and squires were making themselves ready for bed, the call came through the uproar for Miles Falworth! Miles Falworth! Here I be, cried Miles, standing up on his cot. Who calleth me? It was the groom of the earl's bedchamber, and seeing Miles standing thus raised above the others, he came walking down the length of the room towards him, the wanted hubbub gradually silencing as he advanced, and the youngsters turning, staring, and wondering. My lord would speak with thee, Miles Falworth, said the groom when he had come close enough to where Miles stood. Busk thee and make ready. He is at livery even now. The groom's words fell upon Miles like a blow. He stood for a while, staring wide-eyed. My lord, speak with me, sayest thou. He ejaculated at last. Aye, said the other impatiently. Get thee ready quickly. I must return anon. Miles' head was in a whirl as he hastily changed his clothes for a better suit, Gascoigne helping him. What could the earl want with him at this hour? He knew in his heart what it was. The interview could concern nothing but the letter that he had sent to Lady Alice that day. As he followed the groom through the now dark and silent courts, and across the corner of the great quadrangle, and so to the earl's house, he tried to brace his failing courage to meet the coming interview. Nevertheless, his heart beat tumultuously as he followed the other down the long corridor, lit only by a flaring link set in a wrought-iron bracket then his conductor lifted the arras at the door of the bedchamber whence came the murmuring sound of many voices and holding it aside beckoned him to enter and miles passed within at the first he was conscious of nothing but a crowd of people and of the brightness of many lighted candles then he saw that he stood in a great airy room spread with a woven mat of rushes on three sides the walls were hung with tapestry representing hunting and battle scenes at the farther end where the bed stood the stone wall of the fourth side was covered with cloth of blue embroidered with silver goshawks even now, in the ripe springtime of May, the room was still chilly, and a great fire roared and crackled in the huge gaping mouth of the stone fireplace. Not far from the blaze were clustered the greater part of those present, buzzing in talk, now and then swelled by murmuring laughter. Some of those who knew Miles nodded to him, and two or three spoke to him as he stood waiting whilst the groom went forward to speak to the earl though what they said and what he answered miles in his bewilderment and trepidation hardly knew as was said before the livery was the last meal of the day and was taken in bed it was a simple repast a manchette or a small loaf of bread of pure white flour a loaf of household bread sometimes a lump of cheese and either a great flagon of ale or of sweet wine warm and spiced the earl was sitting upright in bed dressed in a furred dressing-gown and propped up by two cylindrical bolsters of crimson satin 
upon the coverlet and spread over his knees was a large wide napkin of linen fringed with silver thread and on it rested a silver tray containing the bread and some cheese two pages and three gentlemen were waiting upon him and mad knoll the jester stood at the head of the bed now and then jingling his bauble and passing some quaint jest upon the chance of making his master smile upon a table near by were some dozen or so waxen tapers struck upon as many spiked candlesticks of silver gilt and illuminating that end of the room with their bright twinkling flames one of the gentlemen was in the act of serving the earl with a goblet of wine poured from a silver ewer by one of the squires as the groom of the chamber came forward and spoke the earl taking the goblet turned his head and as miles looked their eyes met then the earl turned away again and raised the cup to his lips while miles felt his heart beat more rapidly than ever but at last the meal was ended and the earl washed his hands and his mouth and his beard from a silver basin of scented water held by another one of the squires then leaning back against the pillows he beckoned to miles in answer miles walked forward the length of the room conscious that all eyes were fixed upon him the earl said something and those who stood near drew back as he came forward then miles found himself standing beside the bed looking down upon the quilted counterpane feeling that the other was gazing fixedly at him i sent for thee said the earl at last still looking steadily at him because this afternoon came a letter to my hand which thou hadst written to my niece the lady alice i have it here said he thrusting his hand under the bolster and have just now finished reading it then after a moment's pause whilst he opened the parchment and scanned it again i find no matter of harm in it but hereafter write no more such he spoke entirely without anger and miles looked up in wonder here take it said the earl folding the letter and tossing it to miles who instinctively caught it and henceforth trouble thou my niece no more either by letter or any other way i thought haply thou wouldst be at some such saucy trick and i made alice promise to let me know when it happed now i say let this be an end of the matter dost thou not know thou mayst injure her by such witless folly as that of meeting her privily and privily writing to her i meant no harm said miles i believe thee said the earl that will do now thou mayst go miles hesitated what wouldst thou say said lord mackworth only this said miles and i have thy leave so to do that the lady alice hath chosen me to be her knight and so whether i may see her or speak with her or no the laws of chivalry give me who am gentle born the right to serve her as a true knight may as a true fool may said the earl dryly why how now thou art not a knight yet nor anything but a raw lump of a boy what rights do the laws of chivalry give thee sirrah thou art a fool had the earl been ever so angry his words would have been less bitter to miles than his cool unmoved patience it mortified his pride and galled it to the quick i know that thou dost hold me in contempt he mumbled out upon thee said the earl testily thou dost tease me beyond patience i hold thee in contempt forsooth why look thee hadst thou been other than thou art I would have had thee whipped out of my house long since. Thinkest thou I would have borne so patiently with another one of ye squires, had such an one held secret meetings with my daughter and my niece, and tampered, as thou hast done, with my household, sending through one of my people that letter? Go to, thou art a fool, Miles Falworth. Miles stood staring at the earl without making an effort to speak the words that he had heard suddenly flashed as it were a new light into his mind 
In that flash he fully recognized, and for the first time, the strange and wonderful forbearance the great earl had shown to him, a poor, obscure boy. What did it mean? Was Lord Mackworth his secret friend, after all, as Gascoigne had more than once asserted? So Miles stood silent, thinking many things. Meantime the other lay back upon the cylindrical bolsters, looking thoughtfully at him. "'How old art thou?' said he at last. Seventeen last April,' answered Miles. "'Then thou art old enough to have some of the thoughts of a man, and to lay aside those of a boy. Haply thou hast had foolish things in thy head this short time past. It is time that thou put them away.' Hark ye, sirrah, the Lady Alice is a great heiress in her own right, and mates to command the best alliance in England, an earl, a duke. She groweth apace to a woman, and then her kind lieth in courts and great houses. As for thee, thou art but a poor lad, penniless and without friends to aid thee to open advancement. Thy father is attainted, and one whisper of where he lieth hid would bring him hence to the tower and haply to the block. Besides that, he hath an enemy, as Sir James Lee hath already told thee, an enemy perhaps more great and powerful than myself. That enemy watcheth for thy father and for thee. Should thou dare raise thy head or thy fortune ever so little, he would haply crop them both, and that parlously quick. Miles Falworth, how dost thou dare to lift thine eyes to the Lady Alice de Mowbray? Poor Miles stood silent and motionless. Sir, said he at last, in a dry, choking voice, Thou art right, and I have been a fool. Sir, I will never raise mine eyes to look upon the Lady Alice more. I say not that either, boy, said the Earl. But ere thou dost so dare, thou must first place thyself and thy family whence he fell. Till then, as thou art an honest man... Trouble her not. Now get thee gone. As Miles crossed the dark and silent courtyards, and looked up at the clear, still twinkle of the stars, he felt a kind of dull wonder that they, and the night, and the world, should seem so much the same, and he be so different. The first stroke had been given that was to break in pieces his boyhood life. The second was soon to follow. End of chapter 20「There are now and then times in the life of everyone when new and strange things occur with such rapidity that one has hardly time to catch one's breath between the happenings. It is as though the old were crumbling away, breaking in pieces, to give place to the new that is soon to take its place. So it was with Miles Falworth about this time. The very next day after this interview in the bedchamber, word came to him that sir james lee wished to speak with him in the office he found the lean grizzled old knight alone sitting at the heavy oaken table with a tankard of spiced ale at his elbow and a dish of wafers and some fragments of cheese on a pewter platter before him he pointed to his clerk's seat a joint stool somewhat like a camp-chair but made of heavy oaken braces and with a seat of hogskin and bade miles be seated it was the first time that miles had ever heard of such a courtesy being extended to one of the company of squires and much wondering he obeyed the invitation or rather command and took the seat the old knight sat regarding him for a while in silence, his one eye, as bright and as steady as that of a hawk, looking keenly from under the penthouse of its bushy brows, the while he slowly twirled and twisted his bristling, wiry moustaches, as was his wont when in meditation. At last he broke the silence. "'How old art thou?' said he abruptly. "'I be turned seventeen last April.' 
Miles answered, as he had the evening before, to Lord Mackworth. Hm. said Sir James. Thou beest big of bone and frame for thine age. I would that thy heart were more that of a man likewise, and less that of a giddy hair-brained boy, thinking continually of naught but mischief. Again he fell silent, and Miles sat quite still, wondering if it was on account of any special one of his latest escapades that he had been summoned to the office, the breaking of the window in the long hall by the stone he had flung at the rook, or the climbing of the south tower for the jackdaw's nest. "'Thou hast a friend,' said Sir James, suddenly breaking into his speculations, of such a kind that few in this world possess. Almost ever since thou hast been here, he hath been watching over thee. Canst thou guess of whom I speak? Happily it is Lord George Beaumont. He hath always been passing kind. Said Miles. Nay. Said Sir James. It is not of him that I speak, though methinks he liketh thee well enow. Canst thou keep a secret, boy? he asked suddenly. Yea, answered Miles. And wilt thou do so in this case if I tell thee who it is that is thy best friend here? Yea. Then it is, my lord, who is that friend, the earl himself. But see that thou breathe not a word of it. Miles sat staring at the old knight in utter and profound amazement and presently Sir James continued, Yea, almost ever since thou hast come here, my lord hath kept oversight upon all thy doings, upon all thy mad pranks and thy quarrels and thy fights, thy goings out and comings in. What thinkest thou of that, Miles Falwer? Again the old knight stopped and regarded the lad, who sat silent, finding no words to answer. He seemed to find a grim pleasure in the youngster's bewilderment and wonder. Then a sudden thought came to Miles. Sir, said he, did my lord know that I went to the privy garden as I did? Nay, said Sir James. Of that he knew not at first, until thy father bade thy mother write and tell him. My father? ejaculated Miles. Aye, said Sir James twisting his moustaches more vigorously than ever. So soon as thy father heard of that prank, he wrote straightway to my lord that he should put a stop to what might in time have bred mischief. Sir, said Miles in an almost breathless voice, I know not how to believe all these things, or whether I be awake or a-dreaming. Thou oh, beest surely enough awake, answered the old man. But there are other matters yet to be told. My lord thinketh, as others of us do, Lord George and myself, that it is now time for thee to put away thy boyish follies and learn those things appertaining to manhood. Thou hast been here a year now, and hast had freedom to do as thou might list. But boy... And the old warrior spoke seriously, almost solemnly, Upon thee doth rest matters of such great import, that did I tell them to thee, thou couldst not grasp them. My lord deems that thou hast, mayhap, promised beyond the common of men. Nevertheless, it remaineth yet to be seen, and he be right. It is yet to test whether that promise may be fulfilled. Next Monday, I and Sir Everard Willoughby, Take thee in hand to begin training thee in the knowledge and the use of the jousting lance, of arms, and of horsemanship. Thou art to go to Ralph Smith, and have him fit a suit of plain armour to thee, which he hath been charged to make for thee against this time. So get thee gone, think well over all these matters, and prepare thyself by next Monday. But stay, Sarah, he added, as Miles, dazed and bewildered, turned to obey. Breathe to no living soul what I had told thee, 
that my Lord is thy friend, neither speak of anything concerning him. Such is his own heavy command laid upon thee. Then Miles turned again without a word to leave the room, but as he reached the door, Sir James stopped him a second time. Stay, he called. I had nigh missed telling thee somewhat else. My lord hath made thee a present this morning that thou wottest not of. It is. Then he stopped for a few moments, perhaps to enjoy the full flavor of what he had to say. It is a great Flemish horse of true breed and right mettle, a horse such as a knight of the noblest strain might be proud to call his own. Miles Fulworth, thou wert born upon a lucky day. Sir, cried Miles, and then stopped short. Then, sir, he cried again. Didst thou say it, the horse? was to be mine. Aye, it is to be thine. My very own. My very own. How Miles Falworth left that place he never knew. He was like one in some strange, some wonderful dream. He walked upon air, and his heart was so full of joy and wonder and amazement that it thrilled almost to agony. Of course his first thought was of Gascoigne, how he ever found him he never could tell but find him he did come francis he cried i have that to tell thee so marvellous that it had come upon me from paradise it could not be more strange then he dragged him away to their airy it had been many a long day since they had been there and to all his friend's speeches to all his wondering questions he answered never a word until they had climbed the stairs and so come to their old haunt then he spoke sit thee down francis said he till i tell thee that which passeth wonder as gascoigne obeyed he himself stood looking about him this is the last time i shall ever come hither said he and thereupon he poured out his heart to his listening friend in the murmuring solitude of the airy height he did not speak of the earl but of the wonderful new life that had thus suddenly opened before him with its golden future of limitless hopes of dazzling possibilities of heroic ambitions he told everything walking up and down the while for he could not remain quiet his cheeks glowing and his eyes sparkling gascoigne sat quite still staring straight before him he knew that his friend was ruffling eagle pinions for a flight in which he could never hope to follow and somehow his heart ached for he knew that this must be the beginning of the end of the dear delightful friendship of the year past end of chapter twenty one Chapter Twenty Two of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. And so ended Miles Falworth's boyhood. Three years followed, during which he passed through that state which immediately follows boyhood in all men's lives a time when they are neither lads nor grown men but youths passing from the one to the other period through what is often an uncouth and uncomfortable age he had fancied when he talked with gascoigne in the airy that time that he was to become a man all at once he felt just then that he had forever done with boyish things but that is not the way it happens in men's lives changes do not come so suddenly and swiftly as that but by little and little for three or four days maybe he went his new way of life big with the great change that had come upon him and then now in this and now in that he drifted back very much into his old ways of boyish doings as was said one's young days do not end all at once even when they be so suddenly and sharply shaken and miles was not different from others 
he had been stirred to the core by that first wonderful sight of the great and glorious life of manhood opening before him but he had yet many a sport to enjoy many a game to play many a boisterous romp to riot in the dormitory many an expedition to make to copes and spinney and river on days when he was off duty and when permission had been granted nevertheless there was a great and vital change in his life a change which he hardly felt or realized even in resuming his old life there was no longer the same vitality the same zest the same enjoyment in all these things it seemed as though they were no longer a part of himself the savour had gone from them and by and by it was pleasanter to sit looking on at the sports and the games of the younger lads than to take active part in them these three years of his life that had thus passed had been very full full mostly of work grinding and monotonous of training dull dry laborious for sir james lee was a taskmaster as hard as iron and seemingly as cold as a stone for two perhaps for three weeks miles entered into his new exercises with all the enthusiasm that novelty brings but these exercises hardly varied a tittle from day to day and soon became a duty and finally a hard and grinding task he used in the earlier days of his castle life to hate the dull monotony of the tri-weekly hacking at the pels with a heavy broadsword as he hated nothing else but now though he still had that exercise to perform it was almost a relief from the heavy dullness of riding 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 in the tilt-yard with shield and lance couch recover en passant but though he had nowadays but little time for boyish plays and escapades his life was not altogether without relaxation now and then he was permitted to drive in mock battle with other of the younger knights and bachelors in the paddock near the outer walls it was a still more welcome change in the routine of his life when occasionally he would break a light lance in the tilting court with sir everard willoughby lord george perhaps and maybe one or two others of the hall folk looking on then one gilded day when lord dudley was visiting at devlin miles ran a course with a heavier lance in the presence of the earl who came down to the tilt-yard with his guest to see the young novitiate ride against sir everard he did his best and did it well lord dudley praised his poise and carriage and lord george who was present gave him an approving smile and nod but the earl of mackworth only sat stroking his beard impassively as was his custom miles would have given much to know his thoughts in all these years sir james lee almost never gave any expression either of approbation or disapproval excepting when miles exhibited some carelessness or oversight then his words were sharp and harsh enough more than once miles heart failed him and bitter discouragement took possession of him then nothing but his bulldog tenacity and stubbornness brought him out from the despondency of the dark hours sir he burst out one day when his heart was heavy with some failure tell me i beseech thee do i get me any skill at all is it in me ever to make a worthy knight fit to hold lance and sword with other men or am i only soothly a dull heavy block worth naught of any good thou art a fool sirrah answered sir james in his grimmest tones thinkest thou to learn all of knightly prowess in a year and a half wait until thou art ripe and then i will tell thee if thou art fit to couch a lance or ride off a course with a right knight thou art an old bear muttered miles to himself as the old one-eyed knight turned on his heel and strode away beshrew me 
and I show thee not that I am as worthy to couch a lance as thou one of these fine days. However, during the last of the three years, the grinding routine of his training had not been quite so severe as at first. His exercises took him more often out into the fields, and it was during this time of his nightly education that he sometimes rode against some of the castle knights in friendly battle with sword or lance or wooden mace in these encounters he always held his own and held it more than well though in his boyish simplicity he was altogether unconscious of his own skill address and strength perhaps it was his very honest modesty that made him so popular and so heartily liked by all he had by this time risen to the place of head squire or chief bachelor holding the same position that walter blunt had occupied when he himself had first come a raw country boy to devlin the lesser squires and pages fairly worshipped him as a hero albeit imposing upon his good nature all took a pride in his practice in nightly exercises and fabulous tales were current among the young fry concerning his strength and skill yet although miles was now at the head of his class he did not as other chief bachelors had done take a leading position among the squires in the earl's household service Lord Mackworth, for his own good reasons, relegated him to the position of Lord George's especial attendant. Nevertheless, the Earl always distinguished him from the other esquires, giving him a cool nod whenever they met, and Miles, upon his part, now that he had learned better to appreciate how much his lord had done for him, would have shed the last drop of blood in his veins for the head of the house of Beaumont. As for the two young ladies, he often saw them, and sometimes, even in the presence of the Earl, exchanged a few words with them, and Lord Mackworth neither forbade it nor seemed to notice it. Towards the Lady Anne he felt a steady, friendly regard of a lad for a girl older than himself. Towards the Lady Alice, now budding into ripe young womanhood, there lay deep in his heart the resolve to be some day her true knight in earnest as he had been her knight in pretense in that time of boyhood when he had so perilously climbed into the privy garden in body and form he was now a man and in thought and heart was quickly ripening to manhood for as was said before men matured quickly in those days he was a right comely youth, for the promise of his boyish body had been fulfilled in a tall, powerful, well-knit frame. His face was still round and boyish, but on cheek and chin and lip was the curl of adolescent beard, soft, yellow, and silky. His eyes were as blue as steel, and quick and sharp in glance as those of a hawk and as he walked his arms swung from his broad square shoulders and his body swayed with pent-up strength ready for action at any moment if little lady alice hearing much talk of his doings and of his promise in these latter times thought of him now and then it is a matter not altogether to be wondered at such were the changes that three years had wrought and from now the story of his manhood really begins. Perhaps in all the history of Devlin Castle, even at this, the high tide of pride and greatness of the House of Beaumont, the most notable time was in the early autumn of the year 1411, when for five days King Henry the Fourth was entertained by the Earl of Mackworth, the king was at that time making a progress through certain of the midland counties and with him travelled the comte de vermois the count was the secret emissary of the dauphin's faction in france at that time in the very bitterest intensity of the struggle with the duke of burgundy and had come to england seeking aid for his master in his quarrel 
It was not the first time that royalty had visited Devlin. Once, in Earl Robert's day, King Edward II had spent a week at the castle during the period of the Scottish Wars, but at that time it was little else than a military post, and was used by the king as such. Now the Beaumonts were in the very flower of their prosperity, and preparations were made for the coming visit of royalty, upon a scale of such magnificence and splendor as Earl Robert, or perhaps even King Edward himself, had never dreamed. For weeks the whole castle had been alive with folk hurrying hither and thither, and with the daily and almost hourly coming of pack-horses, laden with bales and boxes from London. From morning to night one heard the ceaseless chip-chipping of the mason's hammers, and saw carriers of stones and mortar ascending and descending the ladders of the scaffolding that covered the face of the great north hall within that part of the building was alive with the scraping of the carpenter's saws the clattering of lumber and the rapping and banging of hammers the north hall had been assigned as the lodging-place for the king and his court and sir george's hall as the older building adjoining it was called had been set apart as the lodging of the comte de vermois and the knights and gentlemen attendant upon him the great north hall had been very much altered and changed for the accommodation of the king and his people a beautiful gallery of carved woodwork had been built within and across the south end of the room for the use of the ladies who were to look down upon the ceremonies below two additional windows had been cut through the wall and glazed and passageways had been opened connecting with the royal apartments beyond in the bedchamber a bed of carved wood and silver had been built into the wall and had been draped with hangings of pale blue and silver and a magnificent screen of wrought iron and carved wood had been erected around the couch rich and beautiful tapestries brought from italy and flanders were hung upon the walls cushions of velvets and silks stuffed with down covered benches and chairs the floor of the hall was spread with mats of rushes stained in various colors woven into curious patterns and in the smaller rooms precious carpets of arras were laid on the cold stones all of the cadets of the house had been assembled all of the gentlemen in waiting retainers and clients the castle seemed full to overflowing. Even the dormitory of the squires was used as a lodging-place for many of the lesser gentry. So at last, in the midst of all this bustle of preparation, came the day of days when the king was to arrive. The day before a courier had come, bringing the news that he was lodging at Donister Abbey overnight, and would make progress the next day to Devlin. That morning, as Miles was marshalling the pages and squires, and, with the list of names in his hand, was striving to evolve some order out of the confusion, assigning the various individuals their special duties, these to attend in the household, those to ride in the escort, one of the gentlemen of Lord George's household came with an order for him to come immediately to the young nobleman's apartments. Miles hastily turned over his duties to Gascoigne and Wilkes, and then hurried after the messenger. He found Lord George in the antechamber, three gentlemen squires arming him in a magnificent suit of ribbed Milan. He greeted Miles with a nod and a smile as the lad entered. Sirrah, said he, I have had a talk with Mackworth this morn concerning thee, and have a mind to do thee an honour in my poor way. How wouldst thou like to ride to-day as my special squire of escort? Miles flushed to the roots of his hair. Oh, sir! He cried eagerly. And I be not too ungainly for thy purpose? No honour in all the world could be such joy to me as that. Lord George laughed. 
<laughs> a little matter pleases thee hugely. But as to being ungainly, whoso saith that of thee belieth thee, Miles. Thou art not ungainly, sirrah. But that is not to the point. I have chosen thee for my equerry to-day, so make thou haste and don thine armour, and then come hither again, and Hollingwood will fit thee with a wreathed bassinet I have within, and a jupon embroidered with my arms and colours. When Miles had made his bow and left his patron, he flew across the quadrangle, and burst into the armoury upon Gascoigne, whom he found still lingering there, chatting with one or two of the older bachelors. "'What thinkest thou, Francis?' he cried, wild with excitement. "'An honour hath been done me this day I could never have hoped to enjoy. Out of all this household, Lord George hath chose me his equerry for the day to ride to meet the king.' Come, hasten to help me arm. Art thou not glad of this thing for my sake, Francis? Ay, glad am I indeed, cried Gascoigne, that generous friend. Rather almost would I have this before thee than myself. And indeed he was hardly less jubilant than Miles over the honour. Five minutes later he was busy arming him in the little room at the end of the dormitory, which had been lately set apart for the use of the head bachelor and to think he said looking up as he kneeled strapping the thigh plates to his friend's legs that he should have chosen thee before all others of the fine knights and lords and gentlemen of quality that are here yes said miles it passeth wonder i know not why he should so single me out for such an honour it is strangely marvellous nay said gascoigne there is no marvel in it, and I know right well why he chooseth thee. It is because he sees, as we all see, that thou art the stoutest and the best skilled in arms, and most easy of carriage of any man in all this place. Miles laughed. And thou make sport of me, he said. I'll wrap thy head with this dagger hilt. Thou art a silly fellow, Francis, to talk so. But tell me, hast thou heard who rides with my lord? Yea, I heard Wilkes say anon that it was Sir James Lee. I am right glad of that said miles for then he will show me what to do and how to bear myself it frights me to think what would hap should i make some mistake in my awkwardness methinks lord george would never have me with him more should i do amiss this day never fear said gascoigne thou wilt not do amiss and now at last the earl lord george and all their escort were ready then the orders were given to horse the bugle sounded and away they all rode with clashing of iron hoofs and ringing and jingling of armour, out into the dewy freshness of the early morning, the slant yellow sun of autumn blazing and flaming upon polished helmets and shields, and twinkling like sparks of fire upon spear points. Miles' heart thrilled within him for pure joy, and he swelled out his sturdy young breast with great draughts of the sweet fresh air that came singing across the sunny hilltops. Sir James Lee, who acted as the Earl's equerry for the day, rode at a little distance, and there was an almost pathetic contrast between the grim, steadfast impassiveness of the tough old warrior and Miles' passionate exuberance of youth. At the head of the party rode the Earl and his brother side by side, each clad cap a pie in a suit of Milan armour, the cuirass of each covered with a velvet jupon embroidered in silver with the arms and quarterings of the Beaumonts. The earl wore around his neck an S.S. collar with a jewelled St. George hanging from it, and upon his head a visored bassinet, ornamented with a wreath covered with black and yellow velvet and glistening with jewels. Lord George, as was said before, was clad in a beautiful suit of ribbed Milan armour. It was rimmed with a thin thread of gold, and, like his brother, he wore a bassinet wreathed with black and yellow velvet. Behind the two brothers and their equerries rode the rest in their proper order, knights, gentlemen, esquires, men-at-arms, to the number perhaps of two hundred and fifty spears and lances aslant, and banners, permons, and pencils of black and yellow, fluttering in the warm September air. 
From the castle to the town they rode, and then across the bridge, and thence clattering up through the stony streets, where the folk looked down upon them from the windows above, or crowded the fronts of the shops of the tradesmen. Lusty cheers were shouted for the earl, but the great lord rode staring ever straight before him, as unmoved as a stone. Then out of the town they clattered, and away in a sweeping cloud of dust across the countryside. It was not until they had reached the windy top of Willoughby Croft, ten miles away, that they met the king and his company. As the two parties approached to within forty or fifty yards of one another, they stopped. As they came to a halt, Miles observed that a gentleman dressed in a plain blue-gray riding habit— and sitting upon a beautiful white gelding, stood a little in advance of the rest of the party, and he knew that that must be the king. Then Sir James nodded to Miles, and, leaping from his horse, flung the reins to one of the attendants. Miles did the like, and then, still following Sir James' lead, as he served Lord Mackworth, went forward and held Lord George's stirrup while he dismounted. The two noblemen quickly removed each his bassinet, and Miles, holding the bridle rein of Lord George's horse with his left hand, took the helmet in his right, resting it upon his hip. Then the two brothers walked forward bareheaded, the earl a little in advance. Reaching the king, he stopped and then bent his knee, stiffly in the armored plates, until it touched the ground. Thereupon the king reached him his hand, and he, rising again, took it, and set it to his lips. Then Lord George, advancing, kneeled as his brother had kneeled, and to him also the king gave his hand. Miles could hear nothing, but he could see that a few words of greeting passed between the three, and then the king, turning, beckoned to a knight who stood just behind him and a little in advance of the others of the troop. In answer, the knight rode forward. The king spoke a few words of introduction, and the stranger, ceremoniously drawing off his right gauntlet, clasped the hand, first of the earl, and then of Lord George. Miles knew that he must be the great Comte de Vermois, of whom he had heard so much of late. A few moments of conversation followed, and then the king bowed slightly. The French nobleman instantly reined back his horse. An order was given, and then the whole company moved forward, the two brothers walking upon either side of the king, the earl lightly touching the bridle rein with his bare hand. Whilst all this was passing, the earl of Mackworth's company had been drawn up in a double line along the roadside leaving the way open to the other party as the king reached the head of the troop another halt followed while he spoke a few courteous words of greeting to some of the lesser nobles attendant upon the earl whom he knew in that little time he was within a few paces of miles who stood motionless as a statue holding the bassinet and the bridle rein of lord george's horse what Miles saw was a plain, rather stout man, with a face fat, smooth, and waxy, with pale blue eyes and baggy in the lids, clean-shaven except for a moustache and tuft covering lips and chin. Somehow he felt a deep disappointment. He had expected to see something lion-like, something regal, and after all the great King Henry was commonplace, fat, unwholesome looking. It came to him with a sort of a shock that, after all, a king was in no wise different from other men. Meanwhile the earl and his brother replaced their bassinets, and presently the whole party moved forward upon the way to Mackworth. End of chapter 22《Chapter 23 of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
that same afternoon the squire's quarters were thrown into such a ferment of excitement as had perhaps never before stirred them about one o'clock in the afternoon the earl himself and lord george came walking slowly across the armory court wrapped in deep conversation and entered sir james lee's office all the usual hubbub of noise that surrounded the neighbourhood of the dormitory and the armory was stilled at their coming and when the two noblemen had entered sir james's office the lads and young men gathered in knots discussing with an almost awesome interest what that visit might portend after some time sir james lee came to the door at the head of the long flight of stone steps and whistling beckoned one of the smaller pages to him he gave a short order that sent the little fellow flying on some mission in the course of a few minutes he returned hurrying across the stony court with miles falworth who presently entered sir james's office it was then and at this sight that the intense half-suppressed excitement reached its height of fever heat what did it all mean the air was filled with a thousand vague wild rumours but the very wildest surmises fell short of the real truth perhaps smiles was somewhat pale when he entered the office certainly his nerves were in a tremor for his heart told him that something very portentous was about to befall him the earl sat at the table and in the seat that sir james lee usually occupied lord george half sat half leaned in the window-place sir james stood with his back to the empty fireplace and his hands clasped behind him all three were very serious "'Give thee good den, Miles Falworth," said the Earl, as Miles bowed first to him and then to the others. "'And I would have thee prepare thyself for a great happening.' Then, continuing directly to the point, "'Thou knowest, Sirrah, why we have been training thee so closely these three years gone. It is that thou shouldst be able to hold thine own in the world. Nay, not only hold thine own, but to show thyself to be a knight of prowess, shouldst it come to a battle between thee and thy father's enemy. For there lieth no halfway place for thee, and thou must either be great, or else nothing. Well, sir, the time hath now come for thee to show thy mettle. I would rather have chosen that thou hadst laboured a twelve-month longer. But now, as I said, hath come a chance to prove thyself that may never come again. Sir James tells me that thou art passably ripe in skill. Thou must now show whether that be so or no. Hast thou ever heard of the Sieur de la Montaigne? Yea, my lord, I have heard of him often, answered Miles. It was he who won the prize at the great tourney at Rochelle last year. I see that thou hast his fame pat to thy tongue's end, said the earl. He is the chevalier of whom I speak and he is reckoned the best knight of Dauphine. That one of which thou spokest was the third great tourney in which he was adjudged a victor. I am glad that thou holdest his prowess highly. Knowest thou that he is in the train of the Comte de Vermois? Nay, said Miles, flushing. I did hear news he was in England, but knew not that he was in this place. Yea, said Lord Mackworth. He is here. He paused for a moment, then said suddenly, Tell me, Miles Falworth, and thou wert a knight and of rank fit to run a joust with the Sieur de la Montaigne? Wouldst thou dare encounter him in the lists? The Earl's question fell upon Miles so suddenly and unexpectedly that for a moment or so he stood staring at the speaker with mouth agape. Meanwhile the earl sat looking calmly back at him, slowly stroking his beard the while. It was Sir James Lee's voice that broke the silence. "'How hard does thy lord speak?' said he harshly. "'Hast thou no tongue to answer, sirrah?' "'Be silent, Lee,' said Lord Mackworth quietly. "'Let the lad have time to think before he speaketh.' 
The sound of the words aroused Miles. He advanced to the table and rested his hand upon it. "'My lord, my lord,' said he, "'I know not what to say. I, I am amazed and afeared.' "'How? How?' cried Sir James Lee harshly. "'Afeared, seest thou? And thou art afeared, thou knave. Thou needest never look upon my face or speak to me more. I have done with thee forever, and thou art afeared even were the champion of Sir Alessander. Peace, peace, Lee, said the earl, holding up his hand. Thou art too hasty. The lad shall have his will in this matter, and thou and no one shall constrain him. Methinks also thou dost not understand him. Speak from thy heart, Miles. Why art thou afraid? Because, said Miles, I am so young, sir. I am but a raw boy. How should I dare be so hardy as to venture to set lance against such a one as the Sieur de la Montagne? What would I be but a laughing-stock for all the world who would see me so foolish as to venture me against one of such prowess and skill? Nay, Miles, said Lord George, thou thinkest not well enough of thine own skill and prowess. Thinkest thou we would undertake to set thee against him? and we did not think that thou couldst hold thine own fairly well. Hold mine own? cried Miles, turning to Lord George. Sir, thou dost not mean, thou canst not mean, that I may hope or dream to hold mine own against the Sieur de Montagny? Aye, said Lord George. That was what I did mean. Come, Miles, said the Earl. Now tell me, wilt thou fight the Sieur de la Montagne? Yea said Miles, drawing himself to his full height and throwing out his chest, Yea! and his cheeks and forehead flushed red. And thou bid me to do so, I will fight him. There spake my brave lad, cried Lord George heartily. I give thee joy, Miles, said the Earl, reaching him his hand, which Miles took and kissed. And I give thee double joy. I have talked with the king concerning thee this morning, and he hath consented to knight thee, yea, to knight thee with all honours of the bath, provided thou wilt match thee against the Sieur de la Montaigne for the honour of England and Mackworth. Just now the king lieth asleep for a little while after his dinner. Have thyself in readiness when he cometh forth, and I will have thee presented. Then the earl turned to Sir James Lee, and questioned him as to how the bachelors were fitted with clothes. Miles listened, only half hearing the words through the tumbling of his thoughts. He had dreamed in his daydreams that some time he might be knighted, but that time always seemed very, very distant. To be knighted now, in his boyhood, by the king, with the honours of the bath, and under the patronage of the Earl of Mackworth, to joust, to actually joust with the Sir de la Montaigne, one of the most famous chevaliers of France. No wonder he only half heard the words, half heard the earl's questions concerning his clothes and the discussion which followed, half heard Lord George volunteer to array him in fitting garments from his own wardrobe. Thou mayest go now, said the earl, at last turning to him. But be thou at George's apartments by two of the clock to be dressed fittingly for the occasion. Then Miles went out, stupefied, dazed, bewildered. He looked around, but he did not see Gascoigne. He said not a word to any of the others in answer to the eager questions poured upon him by his fellow squires, but walked straight away. He hardly knew where he went, but by and by he found himself in a grassy angle below the end of the south stable a spot overlooking the outer wall and the river beyond. He looked around, no one was near, and he flung himself at length, burying his face in his arms. How long he lay there he did not know, but suddenly someone touched him upon the shoulder, and he sprang up quickly. It was Gascoigne. "'What is to do, Miles?' said his friend anxiously. 
What is all this talk I hear concerning thee up yonder at the armory? Oh, Francis! cried Miles with a husky, choking voice. I am to be knighted by the king, by the king himself, and I, I am to fight the steward de la Montagne. He reached out his hand, and Gascoigne took it. They stood for a while quite silent, and when at last the stillness was broken, it was Gascoigne who spoke in a choking voice. Thou art going to be great, Miles, said he. I always knew that it must be so with thee, and now the time hath come. Yea, thou wilt be great and live at court amongst noble folk, and kings haply. Presently thou wilt not be with me any more, and wilt forget me by and by. Nay, Francis, never will I forget thee, answered Miles, pressing his friend's hand. I will always love thee better than any one in the world, saving only my father and my mother. Gascoigne shook his head and looked away, swallowing at the dry lump in his throat. Suddenly he turned to Miles. Wilt thou grant me a boon? Yea, answered Miles. What is it? That thou wilt choose me for thy squire. Nay, said Miles. How canst thou think to serve me as a squire? Thou wilt be a knight thyself some day, Francis. Why dost thou wish now to be my squire? Because, said Gascoigne with a short laugh, I would rather be in thy company as a squire than in mine own as a knight, even if I might be banned. Miles flung his arm around his friend's neck and kissed him upon the cheek. Thou shalt have thy will, said he. But whether knight or squire, thou art ever mine own true friend. Then they went slowly back together, hand in hand, to the castle world again. At two o'clock Miles went to Lord George's apartments, and there his friend and patron dressed him out in a costume better fitted for the ceremony of presentation, a fur-trimmed jacket of green brocaded velvet, embroidered with golden thread, a black velvet hood cap rolled like a turban and with a jewel in the front a pair of crimson hose, and a pair of black velvet shoes, trimmed and stitched with gold thread. Miles had never worn such splendid clothes in his life before, and he could not but feel that they became him well. Sir, said he, as he looked down at himself, surely it is not lawful for me to wear such clothes as these. In those days there was a law known as a sumptuary law, which regulated by statute the clothes that each class of people were privileged to wear. It was, as Miles said, against the law for him to wear such garments as those in which he was clad, either velvet, crimson stuff, fur or silver, or gold embroidery. Nevertheless, such a solemn ceremony as presentation to the king excused the temporary overstepping of the law, and so Lord George told him. As he laid his hand upon the lad's shoulder and held him off at arm's length, he added, And I pledge thee my word, Miles, that thou art as lusty and handsome a lad as ever mine eyes beheld. Thou art very kind to me, sir, said Miles in answer. Lord George laughed, and then, giving him a shake, let go his shoulder. It was about three o'clock, when little Edmond de Montfort, Lord Mackworth's favourite page, came with word that the king was then walking in the Earl's plaisance. Come, Miles, said Lord George, and then Miles arose from the seat where he had been sitting, his heart palpitating and throbbing tumultuously. At the wicket gate of the plaisance, two gentlemen at arms stood guard in half armor. They saluted Lord George and permitted him to pass with his protege. As he laid his hand upon the latch of the wicket, he paused for a moment and turned. Miles, said he in a low voice, thou art a thoughtful and cautious lad. For thy father's sake, be thoughtful and cautious now. 
do not speak his name or betray that thou art his son. Then he opened the wicked gate and entered. Any lad of Miles' age, even one far more used to the world than he, would perhaps have felt all the oppression that he experienced under the weight of such a presentation. He hardly knew what he was doing, as Lord George led him to where the king stood, a little apart from the attendants, with the earl and the Comte de Vermois. Even in his confusion he knew enough to kneel, and somehow his honest, modest diffidence became the young fellow very well. He was not awkward, for one so healthful in mind and body as he could not bear himself very ill, and he felt the assurance that in Lord George he had a kind friend at his side, and one well used to court ceremonies to lend him countenance. Then there is something always pleasing in frank, modest manliness, such as was stamped on Miles' handsome, sturdy face. No doubt the king's heart warmed towards the fledging warrior, kneeling in the pathway before him. He smiled very kindly as he gave the lad his hand to kiss, and that ceremony done, held fast to the hard brown sinewy fist of the young man, with his soft white hand and raised him to his feet. "'By the mass,' said he, looking Miles over with smiling eyes, "'thou art a right champion in good sooth. Such as thou art haply was Sir Galahad when he came to Arthur's court. And, so they tell me, thou hast stomach to brook the Sire de la Montaigne.' that tough old boar of Dauphiné. Hast thou in good sooth the courage to face him? Knowest thou what a great thing it is that thou hast set upon thyself to do battle, even in sport, with him? Yea, your majesty, answered Miles. Well, I wot it is a task happy beyond me, but gladly would I take upon me even a great adventure, and one more dangerous to do your majesty's pleasure. The king looked pleased. Now that was right well said, young man, and I like it better that it came from such young and honest lips. Dost thou speak French? Yea, your majesty, answered Miles. In some small measure do I so. I am glad of that, said the king. For so I may make thee acquainted with the Sieur de la Montaigne. He turned as he ended speaking, and beckoned to a heavy, thick-set, black-browed chevalier, who stood with the other gentlemen attendants at a little distance. He came instantly forward in answer to the summons, and the king introduced the two to one another. As each took the other formally by the hand, he measured his opponent hastily, body and limb, and perhaps each thought that he had never seen a stronger, stouter, better-knit man than the one upon whom he looked. But nevertheless the contrast betwixt the two was very great. Miles, young, boyish, fresh-faced, the other bronzed, weather-beaten, and seamed with a great white scar that ran across his forehead and cheek. The one a novice, the other a warrior, seasoned in two score battles. A few polite phrases passed between the two, the king listening, smiling, but with an absent and faraway look gradually stealing upon his face. As they ended speaking, a little pause of silence followed and then the king suddenly aroused himself. So, said he, I am glad that ye two are acquainted, and now we will leave our youthful champion in thy charge, Beaumont, and in thine, Monsieur, as well, and so soon as the proper ceremonies are ended, we will dub him knights with our own hands. And now, Mackworth, and thou, my lord Count, let us walk a little. 
i have bethought me further concerning these threescore extra men for dauphine then miles withdrew under the charge of lord george and the sieur de la montagne and while the king and the two nobles walked slowly up and down the gravel path between the tall rose bushes miles stood talking with the gentlemen attendants finding himself with a certain triumphant exultation the peer of any and the hero of the hour that night was the last that miles and gascoigne spent lodging in the dormitory in their squirehood service the next day they were assigned apartments in lord george's part of the house and thither they transported themselves and their belongings amid the awestruck wonder and admiration of their fellow squires End of chapter twenty three Chapter twenty four of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Miles Falworth's day, one of the greatest ceremonies of courtly life was that of the bestowal of knighthood by the king with the honors of the bath. By far the greater number of knights were at that time created by other knights, or by nobles, or by officers of the crown. To be knighted by the king in person distinguished the recipient for life. It was this signal honour that the earl, for his own purposes, wished Miles to enjoy, and for this end he had laid not a few plans. The accolade was the term used for the creation of a knight upon the field of battle. It was a reward of valor or of meritorious service, and was generally bestowed in a more or less off-hand way. But the ceremony of the bath was an occasion of the greatest courtly moment, and it was thus that Miles Falworth was to be knighted in addition to the honor of a royal belting. A quaint old book treating of knighthood and chivalry gives a full and detailed account of all the circumstances of the ceremony of a creation of a knight of the bath. It tells us that the candidate was first placed under the care of two squires of honor, grave and well seen in courtship and nurture, and also in feats of chivalry which same were likewise to be governors in all things relating to the coming honours. First of all, the barber shaved him, and cut his hair in a certain peculiar fashion, ordained for the occasion, the squires of honour supervising the operation. This being concluded, the candidate was solemnly conducted to the chamber where the bath of tepid water was prepared, hung within and without with linen, and likewise covered with rich cloths and embroidered linen. While in the bath, two ancient, grave, and reverend knights attended the bachelor, giving him meet instructions in the order and feats of chivalry. The candidate was then examined as to his knowledge and acquirements, and then, all questions being answered, to the satisfaction of his examiners, the elder of the two dipped a handful of water out from the bath and poured it upon his head, at the same time signing his left shoulder with the sign of the cross. As soon as this ceremony was concluded, the two squires of honor helped their charge from the bath and conducted him to a plain bed without hangings, where they let him rest until his body was warm and dry. Then they clad him in a white linen shirt, and over it a plain robe of russet, girdled about the loins with a rope, and having a hood like unto a hermit. As soon as the candidate had arisen, the two ancient knights returned, and all being in readiness, he was escorted to the chapel, the two walking, one upon either side of him, his squires of honour marching before and the whole party preceded by sundry minstrels making a loud noise of music. 
when they came to the chapel the two knights who escorted him took leave of the candidate each saluting him with a kiss upon the cheek no one remained with him but his squires of honour the priest and the chandler in the meantime the novitiate's armour sword lance and helmet had been laid in readiness before the altar these he watched and guarded while the others slept keeping vigil until sunrise during which time he shall says the ancient authority pass the night in orisons prayers and meditation at daylight he confessed to the priest heard matins and communicated in mass and then presented a lighted candle at the altar with a piece of money stuck in it as close to the flame as could be done the candle being offered to the honour of god and the money to the honour of that person who was to make him a knight so concluded the sacred ceremony which being ended his squires conducted the candidate to his chamber and there made him comfortable and left him to repose for a while before the second and final part of the ordinance such is a shortened account of the preparatory stages of the ceremonies through which miles falworth passed matters had come upon him so suddenly one after the other and had come with such bewildering rapidity that all that week was to him like some strange wonderful mysterious vision he went through it all like one in a dream lord george beaumont was one of his squires of honour the other by way of a fitting compliment to the courage of the chivalrous land was the sieur de la montagne his opponent soon to be they were well versed in everything relating to nightcraft and miles followed all their directions with passive obedience then sir james lee and the comte de vermois administered the ceremony of the bath the old knight examining him in the laws of chivalry it occurs perhaps once or twice in one's lifetime that one passes through great happenings sometimes of joy sometimes of dreadful bitterness in just such a day's state as miles passed through this it is only afterwards that all comes back to one so sharply and keenly that the heart thrills almost in agony in living it over again but perhaps of all the memory of that time when it afterwards came back piece by piece none was so clear to miles back turned vision as the long night spent in the chapel watching his armour thinking such wonderful thoughts and dreaming such wonderful wide-eyed dreams at such times miles saw again the dark mystery of the castle chapel he saw again the half-moon gleaming white and silvery through the tall narrow window and throwing a broad form of still whiteness across stone floor empty seats and still motionless figures of stone effigies at such times he stood again in front of the twinkling tapers that lit the altar where his armour lay piled in a heap heard again the deep breathing of his companions of the watch sleeping in some empty stall wrapped each in his cloak and saw the old chandler bestir himself and rise and come forward to snuff the candles at such times he saw again the day growing clearer and clearer through the tall glazed windows saw it change to a rosy pink and then to a broad ruddy glow that threw a halo of light around father thomas's bald head bowed in sleep and lit up the banners and trophies hanging motionless against the stony face of the west wall heard again the stirring of life without and the sound of his companions arousing themselves saw them come forward and heard them wish him joy that his long watch was ended it was nearly noon when miles was awakened from a fitful sleep by gascoigne bringing in his dinner but as might be supposed he had but little hunger and ate sparingly he had hardly ended his frugal meal before his two squires of honour came in followed by a servant carrying the garments for the coming ceremony 
he saluted them gravely and then arising washed his face and hands in a basin which gascoigne held then kneeled in prayer the others standing silent at a little distance as he arose lord george came forward the king and the company come presently to the great hall miles it is needful for thee to make all the haste that thou art able said he perhaps never had devlin castle seen a more brilliant and goodly company gathered in the great hall than that which came to witness king henry create miles falworth a knight bachelor at the upper end of the hall was a raised dais upon which stood a throne covered with crimson satin and embroidered with lions and flower de luce it was the king's seat he and his personal attendants had not yet come but the rest of the company were gathered the day being warm and sultry the balcony was all a flutter with the feather fans of the ladies of the family and their attendants who from this high place looked down upon the hall below up the centre of the hall was laid a carpet of arras and the passage was protected by wooden railings upon the one side were tiers of seats for the castle gentlefolk and the guests upon the other stood the burghers from the town clad in sober dun and russet and yeomanry in green and brown the whole of the great vaulted hall was full of the dull hum of many people waiting and a ceaseless restlessness stirred the crowded throng but at last a whisper went around that the king was coming a momentary hush fell and through it was heard the noisy clatter of horses feet coming nearer and nearer and then stopping before the door the sudden blare of trumpets broke through the hush another pause and then in through the great doorway of the hall came the royal procession first of all marched in the order of their rank and to the number of a score or more certain gentlemen esquires and knights chosen mostly from the king's attendants behind these came two pursuivant at arms in tabards and following them a party of a dozen more banneret and barons behind these again a little space intervening came two heralds also in tabards a group of the greater nobles attendant upon the king following in the order of their rank next came the king-at-arms and at a little distance and walking with sober slowness the king himself with the earl and the count directly attendant upon him the one marching upon the right hand and the other upon the left a breathless silence filled the whole space as the royal procession advanced slowly up the hall through the stillness could be heard the muffled sound of the footsteps on the carpet the dry rustling of silk and satin garments and the clear clink and jingle of chains and jewelled ornaments but not the sound of a single voice after the moment or two of bustle and confusion of the king taking his place had passed another little space of expectant silence fell at last there suddenly came the noise of acclamation of those who stood without the door cheering and the clapping of hands sounds heralding the immediate advent of miles and his attendants the next moment the little party entered the hall first of all gascoigne bearing a mild sword in both hands the hilt resting against his breast the point elevated at an angle of forty-five degrees it was sheathed in a crimson scabbard and the belt of spanish leather studded with silver bosses was wound crosswise around it from the hilt of the sword dangled the gilt spurs of his coming knighthood at a little distance behind his squire followed miles the centre of all observation he was clad in a novitiate dress arranged under lord george's personal supervision it had been made somewhat differently from the fashion usual at such times and was intended to indicate in a manner the candidate's extreme youthfulness and virginity in arms the outer garment was a tabard robe of white wool embroidered at the hem with fine lines of silver 
and gathered loosely at the waist with a belt of lavender leather stitched with thread of silver beneath he was clad in armour a present from the earl new and polished till it shone with dazzling brightness the breastplate covered with a jupon of white satin embroidered with silver behind miles and upon either hand came his squires of honour sponsors and friends a little company of some half-dozen in all as they advanced slowly up the great dim high vaulted room the whole multitude broke forth into a humming buzz of applause then a sudden clapping of hands began near the doorway ran down through the length of the room and was taken up by all with noisy clatter saw i never youth so comely sure he looketh as sir galahad looked when he came first to king arthur's court whispered one of the lady anne's attendant gentlewomen miles knew that he was very pale he felt rather than saw the restless crowd of faces upon either side for his eyes were fixed directly before him upon the dais whereon sat the king with the earl of mackworth standing at his right hand the comte de vermois upon the left and the others ranged around and behind the throne it was with the same tense feeling of dreamy unreality that miles walked slowly up the length of the hall measuring his steps by those of gascoigne suddenly he felt lord george beaumont touch him lightly upon the arm and almost instinctively he stopped short he was standing just before the covered steps of the throne he saw gascoigne mount to the third step stop short kneel and offer the sword and the spurs he carried to the king who took the weapon and laid it across his knees then the squire bowed low and walking backward withdrew to one side leaving miles standing alone facing the throne the king unlocked the spur chains from the sword hilt and then holding the gilt spurs in his hand for a moment he looked miles straight in the eyes and smiled then he turned and gave one of the spurs to the earl of mackworth the earl took it with a low bow turned and came slowly down the steps to where miles stood kneeling upon one knee and placing miles foot upon the other lord mackworth set the spur in its place and latched the chain over the instep he drew the sign of the cross upon miles bended knee set the foot back upon the ground rose with slow dignity and bowing to the king drew a little to one side as soon as the earl had fulfilled his office the king gave the second spur to the comte de vermois who set it to miles other foot with the same ceremony that the earl had observed withdrawing as he had done to one side an instant pause of motionless silence followed and then the king slowly arose and began deliberately to unwind the belt from around the scabbard of the sword he held as soon as he stood the earl and the count advanced and taking miles by either hand led him forward and up the steps of the dais to the platform above as they drew a little to one side the king stooped and buckled the sword belt around miles waist then rising again lifted his hand and struck him upon the shoulder crying in a loud voice be thou a good knight instantly a loud sound of applause and the clapping of hands filled the whole hall in the midst of which the king laid both hands upon miles shoulders and kissed him upon the right cheek so the ceremony ended miles was no longer miles falworth but sir miles falworth knight by order of the bath and by grace of the king end of chapter twenty four Chapter Twenty Five of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
it was the custom to conclude the ceremonies of the bestowal of knighthood by a grand feast given in honour of the newly created knight but in miles instance the feast was dispensed with the earl of mackworth had planned that miles might be created a knight of the bath with all possible pomp and ceremony that his personality might be most favourably impressed upon the king that he might be so honourably knighted as to make him the peer of any who wore spurs in all england and finally that he might celebrate his new honours by jousting with some knight of high fame and approved valour all these desiderata chance had fulfilled in the visit of the king to devlin as the earl had said to miles he would rather have waited a little while longer until the lad was riper in years and experience but the opportunity was not to be lost young as he was miles must take his chances against the years and grim experience of the sir de la montaigne but it was also a part of the earl's purpose that the king and miles should not be brought too intimately together just at that time though every particular of circumstance should be fulfilled in the ceremony it would have been ruination to the earl's plans to have the knowledge come prematurely to the king that miles was the son of the attainted lord falworth the earl knew that miles was a shrewd cool-headed lad but the king had already hinted that the name was familiar to his ears and a single hasty answer or unguarded speech upon the young knight's part might awaken him to a full knowledge such a mishap was of all things to be avoided just then for thanks to the machinations of that enemy of his father of whom miles had heard so much and was soon to hear more the king had always retained and still held a bitter and rancorous enmity against the unfortunate nobleman it was no very difficult matter for the earl to divert the king's attention from the matter of the feast his majesty was very intent just then upon supplying a quota of troops to the dauphin and the chief object of his visit to devlin was to open negotiations with the earl looking to that end he was interested much interested in miles and in the coming jousting in which the young warrior was to prove himself but he was interested in it by way of a relaxation from the other and more engrossing matter so though he made some passing and half preoccupied inquiry about the feast he was easily satisfied with the earl's reasons for not holding it which were that he had arranged a consultation for that morning in regard to the troops for the dauphin to which meeting he had summoned a number of his own more important dependent nobles that the king himself needed repose and the hour or so of rest that his barber surgeon had ordered him to take after his midday meal that father thomas had laid upon miles a petty penance that for the first three days of his knighthood he should eat his meals without meat and in his own apartment and various other reasons equally good and sufficient so the king was satisfied and the feast was dispensed with the next morning had been set for the jousting and all that day the workmen were busy erecting the lists in the great quadrangle upon which as was said before looked the main buildings of the castle the windows of miles apartment opened directly upon the bustling scene the carpenters hammering and sawing the upholsterers snipping cutting and tacking miles and gascoigne stood gazing out from the open casement with their arms lying across one another's shoulders in the old boyhood fashion and miles felt his heart shrink with a sudden tight pang as the realization came sharply and vividly upon him that all these preparations were being made for him and that the next day he should with almost the certainty of death meet either glory or failure 
under the eyes not only of all the greater and lesser castle folk, but of the king himself, and noble strangers critically used to deeds of chivalry and prowess. Perhaps he had never fully realized the magnitude of the reality before. In that tight pang at his heart he drew a deep breath, almost a sigh. Gascoigne turned his head abruptly and looked at his friend, but he did not ask the cause of the sigh. No doubt the same thoughts that were in Miles' mind were in his also. It was towards the latter part of the afternoon that a message came from the Earl, bidding Miles attend him in his private closet. After Miles had bowed and kissed his lordship's hand, the Earl motioned him to take a seat, telling him that he had some final words to say that might occupy a considerable time. He talked to the young man for about half an hour in his quiet, measured voice, only now and then showing a little agitation by rising and walking up and down the room for a turn or two. Very many things were disclosed in that talk that had caused Miles long hours of brooding thought, for the Earl spoke freely and without concealment to him concerning his father and the fortunes of the house of Felworth. Miles had surmised many things, but it was not until then that he knew for a certainty who was his father's malignant and powerful enemy, that it was the great Earl of Alban, the rival and bitter enemy of the Earl of Mackworth. It was not until then that he knew that the present Earl of Alban was the Lord Brookhurst, who had killed Sir John Dale in the anteroom at Falworth Castle that morning so long ago in his early childhood. It was not until then that he knew all the circumstances of his father's blindness, that he had been overthrown in the melee at the great tournament at York, and that that same Lord Brookhurst had ridden his iron-shod war-horse twice over his enemy's prostrate body, before his squire could draw him from the press, and had then and there given him the wound from which he afterwards went blind. The earl swore to Miles that Lord Brookhurst had done what he did willfully, and had afterwards boasted of it. Then, with some hesitation, he told Miles the reason of Lord Brookhurst's enmity, and that it had arisen on account of Lady Falworth whom he had one time sought in marriage, and that he had sworn vengeance against the man who had won her. Piece by piece the Earl of Mackworth recounted every circumstance and detail of the revenge that the blind man's enemy had afterwards wreaked upon him. He told Miles how, when his father was attainted of high treason, and his estates forfeited to the crown, the king had granted the barony of Easterbridge to the then newly created Earl of Alban, in spite of all the efforts of Lord Falworth's friends to the contrary, that when he himself had come out from an audience with the king, with others of his father's friends, the Earl of Alban had boasted in the anteroom in a loud voice, evidently intended for them all to hear, that now that he had Falworth's fat lands, he would never rest till he had hunted the blind man out from his hiding and brought his head to the block. Ever since then, said the Earl of Mackworth, he hath been striving by every means to discover thy father's place of concealment. Some time haply he may find it. And then... Miles had felt for a long time that he was being moulded and shaped and that the Earl of Mackworth's was the hand that was making him what he was growing to be. But he had never realized how great were the things expected of him, should he pass the first great test, and show himself what his friends hoped to see him. Now he knew that all were looking upon him to act some time as his father's champion, and when that time should come— to challenge the Earl of Alban to the ordeal of single combat, to purge his father's name of treason, to restore him to his rank, 
and to set the house of Falworth where it stood, before misfortune fell upon it. But it was not alone concerning his and his father's affairs that the Earl of Mackworth talked to Miles. He told him that the Earl of Alban was the Earl of Mackworth's enemy also, that in his younger days he had helped Lord Falworth, who was his kinsman, to win his wife, and that then Lord Brookhurst had sworn to compass his ruin, as he had sworn to compass the ruin of his friend. He told Miles how, now that Lord Brookhurst was grown to be Earl of Alban, and great and powerful, he was for ever plotting against him, and showed Miles how, if Lord Falworth were discovered and arrested for treason, he also would be likely to suffer for aiding and abetting him. Then it dawned upon Miles that the Earl looked to him to champion the house of Beaumont, as well as that of Falworth. Mayhap, said the Earl, thou didst think that it was all for the pleasant sport of the matter that I have taken upon me this toil and endeavor to have thee knighted with honor, that thou mightst fight the Dauphiny knight. Nay, nay, Miles Falworth, I have not labored so hard for such a small matter as that. I have had the king, unknown to himself, so knight thee that thou mayst be the peer of Albin himself, and now I would have thee to hold thine own with the Sieur de la Montaigne, to try whether thou beatst Albin's match, and to prove thyself worthy of the honor of thy knighthood. I am sorry, nevertheless, he added, after a moment's pause, that this could not have been put off for a while longer, for my plans for bringing thee to battle with that vile Albin are not yet ripe, but such a chance of the king coming hither haps not often. And then I am glad of this much, that a good occasion offers to get thee presently away from England. I would have thee out of the king's sight so soon as may be after this jousting. He taketh a liking to thee, and I fear me lest he should inquire more nearly concerning thee, and so all be discovered and spoiled. My brother George goeth upon the first of next month of France to take service with the Dauphine, having under his command a company of ten score men, knights and archers, Thou shalt go with him, and there stay till I send for thee to return. With this, the protracted interview concluded, the earl charging Miles to say nothing further about the French expedition for the present, even to his friend, for it was as yet a matter of secrecy, known only to the king and a few nobles closely concerned in the venture. Then Miles arose to take his leave, he asked and obtained permission for Gascoigne to accompany him to France. Then he paused for a moment or two, for it was strongly upon him to speak of a matter that had been lying in his mind all day, a matter that he had dreamed of much with open eyes during the long vigil of the night before. The Earl looked up inquiringly. Sir, said he, Miles heart was beating quickly within him at the thought of his own boldness, and as he spoke his cheeks burned like fire. Haply thou hast forgot it, but I have not. Nevertheless, a long time since, when I spoke of serving the, the Lady Alice as her true knight, thou didst wisely laugh at my words, and bade me wait, first till I had earned my spurs. But now, sir, I have gotten my spurs, and, and do now crave thy gracious leave, that I may serve that lady as her true knight, said he, mustering his courage at last. What is it thou wouldst ask? A space of dead silence fell, in which Miles' heart beat tumultuously within him. I know not what thou meanest. How wouldst thou serve her? What wouldst thou have? said the earl at last, in a somewhat constrained voice. I would only have a little matter just now, answered Miles. I would but crave of her a favour to her to wear in the morrow's battle, so that she may know that I hold her for my own true lady, and that I may have the courage to fight more boldly, having that favour to defend. The Earl sat looking at him for a while in brooding silence, stroking his beard the while. Suddenly his brow cleared. So be it, said he. I grant thee my leave to ask the Lady Alice for a favour. And if she is pleased to give it to thee, 
I shall not say thee nay. But I set this upon thee as a provision, that thou shalt not see her without the lady and be present. Thus it was, as I remember, thou saw her first, and with it thou must now be satisfied. Go thou to the long gallery, and thither they will come anon, if naught hinder them. Miles waited in the long gallery perhaps some fifteen or twenty minutes. No one was there but himself. It was a part of the castle connecting the earl's and the countess's apartments, and was used but little. During that time he stood looking absently out of the open casement into the stony courtyard beyond, trying to put into words that which he had to say wondering with anxiety how soon the young ladies would come wondering whether they would come at all at last the door at the farther end of the gallery opened and turning sharply at the sound he saw the two young ladies enter lady alice leaning upon lady anne's arm it was the first time that he had seen them since the ceremony of the morning and as he advanced to meet them the lady anne came frankly forward and gave him her hand which miles raised to his lips i give thee joy of thy knighthood sir miles said she and do believe in good sooth that if any one deserveth such an honour thou art he at first little lady alice hung back behind her cousin saying nothing until the lady anne turning suddenly said Come, cuz, hast thou naught to say to our new-made knight? Canst thou not also wish him joy of his knighthood? Lady Alice hesitated a minute, then gave Miles a timid hand, which he, with a strange mixture of joy and confusion, took as timidly as it was offered. He raised the hand and set it lightly and for an instant to his lips, as he had done with the Lady Anne's hand, but with very different emotions. "'I give you joy of your knighthood, sir,' said Lady Alice, in a voice so low that Miles could hardly hear it. Both flushed red, and as he raised his head again, Miles saw that the Lady Anne had withdrawn to one side. Then he knew that it was to give him the opportunity to proffer his request. A little space of silence followed the while he strove to key his courage to the saying of that which lay at his mind lady said he at last and then again lady i have a favour to ask thee what is it thou wouldst have sir miles she murmured in reply lady said he ever since i first saw thee i had thought that if i might choose of all the world thou only wouldst i choose for for my true lady to serve as her bright knight should here he stopped frightened at his own boldness lady alice stood quite still with her face turned away thou thou art not angered at what i say he said she shook her head i have longed and longed for the time said he to ask a boon of thee and now hath that time come lady to-morrow i go to meet a right good knight and one skilled in arms and in jousting as thou would dost know. Yea, he is famous in arms, and I be nobody. Nevertheless, I fight for the honour of England and Mackworth, and, and for thy sake. I, thou art not angered at what I say. Again the Lady Alice shook her head. I would that thou, I would that thou would give me some favour for to wear, thy veil or thy necklace. He waited anxiously for a little while, but Lady Alice did not answer immediately. "'I fear me,' said Miles presently, "'that I have in sooth offended thee in asking this thing. I know that it is a parlous bold matter for one so raw in chivalry and in courtliness as am I, and one so poor in rank, to ask thee for thy favour. And I had often offended. I prithee thee that it be as though I had not asked it.' Perhaps it was the young man's timidity that brought a sudden courage to Lady Alice. Perhaps it was the graciousness of her gentle breeding that urged her to relieve Miles' somewhat awkward humility. Perhaps it was something more than either that lent her bravery to speak, even knowing that the Lady Anne heard all. She turned quickly to him. "'Nay, Sir Miles,' she said, "'I am foolish.' 
and do wrong thee by my foolishness and silence, for truly I am proud to have thee wear my favour. She unclasped as she spoke the thin gold chain from about her neck. I give thee this chain, said she, and it will bring me joy to have it honoured by thy true knightliness, and giving it, I do wish thee all success. Then she bowed her head, and turning, left him holding the necklace in his hand. Her cousin left the window to meet her, bowing her head with a smile to Miles, as she took her cousin's arm again, and led her away. He stood looking after them as they left the room, and when they were gone he raised the necklace to his lips, with a heart beating tumultuously, with a triumphant joy it had never felt before. End of chapter 25
Chapter Twenty Six of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. And now at last had come the day of days for Miles Falworth, the day when he was to put to the test all that he had acquired in the three years of his training the day that was to disclose what promise of future greatness there was in his strong young body. And it was a noble day, one of those of late September, when the air seems sweeter and fresher than at other times, the sun bright and as yellow as gold, the wind lusty and strong, before which the great white clouds go sailing majestically across the bright blueness of the sky above while their dusky shadows skim across the brown face of the rusty earth beneath as was said before the lists had been set up in the great quadrangle of the castle than which level and smooth as a floor no more fitting place could be chosen the course was of the usual size sixty paces long and separated along its whole length by a barrier about five feet high Upon the west side of the course, and about twenty paces distant from it, a scaffolding had been built, facing towards the east, so as to avoid the glare of the afternoon sun. In the centre was a raised dais, hung round with cloth of blue, embroidered with lions rampant. Upon the dais stood a cushioned throne for the king, and upon the steps below, ranged in the order of their dignity, were seats for the earl, his guests, the family, the ladies, knights, and gentlemen of the castle. In front the scaffolding was covered with the gayest tapestries and brightest colored hangings that the castle could afford, and above party-colored pennants and streamers, surmounted by the royal ensign of England, waved and fluttered in the brisk wind. At either end of the list stood the pavilions of the knights. That of Miles was at the southern extremity, and was hung, by the earl's desire, with cloth of the Beaumont colors, black and yellow, while a wooden shield bearing three goshawks spread, the crest of the house was nailed to the roof, and a long streamer of black and yellow trailed out in the wind from the staff above. Miles, partly armed, stood at the doorway of the pavilion, watching the folk gathering at the scaffolding. The ladies of the house were already seated, and the ushers were bustling hither and thither, assigning the others their places. A considerable crowd of common folk and burghers from the town had already gathered at the barriers opposite, and as he looked at the restless and growing multitude, he felt his heart beat quickly and his flesh grow cold with a nervous trepidation, just such as the lad of to-day feels when he sees the auditorium filling with friends and strangers who are to listen by and by to the reading of his prize poem suddenly there came a loud blast of trumpets a great gate at the farther extremity of the lists was thrown open and the king appeared riding upon a white horse preceded by the king-at-arms and the heralds attended by the earl and the comte de vermois and followed by a crowd of attendants just then Gascoigne, who with Wilkes was busied lacing some of the armor plates with new thongs, called Miles, and he turned and entered the pavilion. As the two squires were adjusting these last pieces, strapping them in place and tying the thongs, Lord George and Sir James Lee entered the pavilion. Lord George took the young man by the hand, and, with a pleasant smile, wished him success in the coming encounter. Sir James seemed anxious and disturbed. He said nothing, and after Gascoigne had placed the open bassinet that supports the tilting helm in its place, he came forward and examined the armor piece by piece, carefully and critically, testing the various straps and leather points and thongs to make sure of their strength sir 
said Gascoigne, who stood by, watching him anxiously. I do trust that I have done all meetly and well. I see nothing amiss, sirrah, said the old knight, half grudgingly. So far as I may know, he is ready to mount. Just then a messenger entered, saying that the king was seated, and Lord George bade Miles make haste to meet the challenger. Francis, said Miles. Prithee, give me my pouch yonder. Gascoigne handed him the velvet bag, and he opened it, and took out the necklace that the Lady Alice had given him the day before. Tie this around my arm, said he. He looked down, keeping his eyes studiously fixed on Gascoigne's fingers, as they twined the thin golden chain around the iron plates of his right arm, knowing that Lord George's eyes were upon him, and blushing fiery red at the knowledge. Sir James was at that moment examining the great tilting helm, and Lord George watched him, smiling amusedly. "'And hast thou then already chosen thee a lady?' he said presently. "'Ay, my lord,' answered Miles simply. "'Mary, I trust we be so honoured that she is one of our castle folk?' said the earl's brother. For a moment Miles did not reply. Then he looked up. "'My lord,' said he, "'the favour was given to me by the Lady Alice.' Lord George looked grave for the moment. Then he laughed. "'Mary, thou art a bold archer to shoot for such high game.' Miles did not answer, and at that moment two grooms led his horse up to the door of the pavilion. Gascoigne and Wilkes helped him to his saddle, and then Gascoigne holding his horse by the bridle rein. He rode slowly across the lists to the little open space in front of the scaffolding and the king's seat, just as the Sir de la Montagne approached from the opposite direction. As soon as the two knights champion had reached each his appointed station in front of the scaffolding, the marshal bade the speaker read the challenge, which, unrolling the parchment, he began to do, in a loud, clear voice, so that all might hear. It was a quaint document, wrapped up in the tangled heraldic verbiage of the time. The pith of the matter was that the Sir Brian Philip Francis de la Montaigne proclaimed before all men the greater chivalry and skill at arms of the Knights of France and of Dauphiny and likewise the greater fairness of the ladies of France and Dauphiny, and would there defend those sayings with his body without fear or attaint as to the truth of the same. As soon as the speaker had ended, the marshal bade him call the defendant of the other side. Then Miles spoke his part, with a voice trembling somewhat with the excitement of the moment, but loudly and clearly enough, I, Miles Edward Falworth, knight so created by the hand and by the grace of his majesty King Henry the Fourth of England, to take upon me the gauge of this battle, and will depend with my body the chivalry of the knights of England, and the fairness of the ladies thereof. Then, after the speaker ended his proclamation, and had retired to his place, the ceremony of claiming and redeeming the helmet to which all young knights were subjected upon first entering the lists was performed one of the heralds cried in a loud voice i giles hamilton hail to the most noble clear new king of arms do claim the helm of sir miles edward falworth by this reason that he hath never yet entered joust nor tourney to which Miles answered, I do acknowledge the right of that claim, and herewith proffer thee in ransom for the same this purse of one hundred marks in gold. As he spoke, Gascoigne stepped forward and delivered the purse with the money to the herald. It was a more than usually considerable ransom, and had been made up by the Earl and Lord George that morning. Right nobly hast thou redeemed thy helm said the herald and hereafter be thou free to enter any jousting whatsoever and in whatever place 
So, all being ended, both knights bowed to the king, and then, escorted each by his squire, returned to his pavilion, saluted by the spectators with a loud clapping of hands. Sir James Lee met Miles in front of his tent. Coming up to the side of the horse, the old man laid his hand upon the saddle, looking up into the young man's face. "'Thou wilt not fail me in this venture, and bring shame upon me,' said he. "'Nay, my dear master,' said Miles. "'I will do my best.' "'I doubt it not,' said the old man. "'And I believe me, thou wilt come off right well. "'From what he did say this morning, "'methinks the Sieur de la Mortaine "'meaneth only to break three lances with thee, "'and will content himself therewith without seeking to unhorse thee. Nevertheless, be thou bold and watchful, and if thou find that he endeavour to cast thee, do thy best to unhorse him. Remember also those things which I have told thee ten thousand times before. Hold thy toes well down, and grip the stirrup hard, more especially at the moment of meeting, bend thy body forward, and keep thine elbow close to thy side. Bear thy lance point one foot above thine adversary's helm until within two lengths of meeting, and strike thou in the very middle of his shield. So, Miles, thou mayest hold thine own, and come off with glory. As he ended speaking, he drew back, and Gascoigne, mounting upon a stool, covered his friend's head and bassinet with the great jousting helm, making fast the leathern points that held it to the iron collar. As he was tying the last thong, a messenger came from the herald, saying that the challenger was ready, and then Miles knew the time had come and reaching down and giving sir james a grip of the hand he drew on his gauntlet took the jousting lance that wilkes handed him and turned his horse's head towards his end of the lists end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of men of iron by howard pyle this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. As Miles took his place at the south end of the lists, he found the Sir de la Montaigne already at his station. Through the peephole in the face of the huge helmet, a transverse slit, known as the ocularium, he could see like a strange narrow picture, the farther end of the lists, the spectators upon either side, moving and shifting with ceaseless restlessness, and in the centre of all, his opponent, sitting with spear-point directed upward, erect, motionless as a statue of iron, the sunlight gleaming and flashing upon his polished plates of steel, and the trappings of his horse swaying and fluttering in the rushing of the fresh breeze. Upon that motionless figure his sight gradually centred with every faculty of mind and soul. He knew the next moment the signal would be given that was to bring him either glory or shame from that iron statue. He ground his teeth together with stern resolve to do his best in the coming encounter, and murmured a brief prayer in the hollow darkness of his huge helm then with a shake he settled himself more firmly in his saddle slowly raised his spear point until the shaft reached the exact angle and there suffered it to rest motionless there was a moment of dead tense breathless pause then he rather felt than saw the marshal raise his baton he gathered himself together, and the next moment a bugle sounded loud and clear. 
in one blinding rush he drove his spurs into the sides of his horse and in instant answer felt the noble steed spring forward with a bound through all the clashing of his armour reverberating in the hollow depths of his helmet he saw the mail-clad figure from the other end of the lists rushing towards him looming larger and larger as they came together he gripped his saddle with his knees clutched the stirrup with the soles of his feet and bent his body still more forward in the instant of meeting with almost the blindness of instinct he dropped the point of his spear against the single red flower de luce in the middle of the oncoming shield there was a thunderous crash that seemed to rack every joint he heard the crackle of splintered wood he felt the momentary trembling recoil of the horse beneath him and in the next instant had passed by as he checked the onward rush of his horse at the far end of the course he heard faintly in the dim hollow recess of the helm the loud shout and the clapping of hands of those who looked on and found himself gripping with nervous intensity the butt of a broken spear his mouth clammy with excitement and his heart thumping in his throat then he realized that he had met his opponent and had borne the meeting well as he turned his horse's head towards his own end of the lists he saw the other trotting slowly back towards his station also holding a broken spear shaft in his hand as he passed the iron figure a voice issued from the helmet well done sir miles nobly done and his heart bounded in answer to the words of praise when he had reached his own end of the lists he flung away his broken spear and gascoigne came forward with another oh miles he said with sob in his voice it was nobly done never did i see a better ridden course in all my life i did not believe that thou couldst do half so well oh miles prithee knock him out of his saddle and thou lovest me miles in his high-keyed nervousness could not forbear a short hysterical laugh at his friend's warmth of enthusiasm he took the fresh lance in his hand and then seeing that his opponent was walking his horse slowly up and down at the end of the lists did the same during the little time of rest before the next encounter when in answer to the command of the marshal he took his place a second time he found himself calmer and more collected than before but every faculty no less intensely fixed than it had been at first once more the marshal raised his baton once more the horn sounded and once more the two rushed together with the same thunderous crash the same splinter of broken spears the same momentary trembling recoil of the horse and the same onward rush past one another once more the spectators applauded and shouted as the two knights turned their horses and rode back towards their station this time as they met midway the sieur de la montagne reined in his horse sir miles said his muffled voice i swear to thee by my faith i had not thought to meet in thee such an opponent as thou dost prove thyself to be i had thought to find in thee a raw boy but find instead a, a paladin now, hitherto i had given thee grace as i would give grace to any mere lad and thought of nothing but to give thee opportunity to break thy lance now i shall do my endeavour to unhorse thee as i would an acknowledged peer in arms nevertheless on account of thy youth i give thee this warning so that thou mayest hold thyself in readiness i give thee gramercy for thy courtesy my lord answered miles speaking in french and pardon me if i seem forward in so saying but were i in thy place my lord i would change me yon breastpiece and overgirth of my saddle they are sprung in the stitches nay <laughs> said the sieur de la montagne laughing oh breastpiece and overgirth have carried me through more tilts than one 
and shall through this. And now give me a blow so true as to burst breastpiece and overgirth, I will own myself fairly conquered by thee. So saying, he saluted Miles with the butt of the spear he still held, and passed by to his end of the lists. Miles, with Gascoigne running beside him, rode across to his pavilion, and called to Edmund Wilkes to bring him a cup of spiced wine. After Gascoigne had taken off his helmet, and as he sat wiping the perspiration from his face, Sir James came up and took him by the hand, "'My dear boy,' said he, gripping the hand he held, "'never could I hope to be so overjoyed in mine old age as I am this day. Thou dost bring honour to me, for I tell thee truly thou dost ride like a knight seasoned in twenty tyrannies.' "'It doth give me tenfold courage to hear thee say so, dear master,' answered Miles. "'And truly,' I shall need all my courage this bout, for the Sieur de la Montagne telleth me that he will ride to unhorse me this time. Did he indeed so say? said Sir James. Then belike he meaneth to strike at thy helm. Thy best chance is to strike also at his. Doth thy hand tremble? answered Miles. Not now. Then keep thy head cool and thine eye true. Set thy trust in God, and haply thou wilt come out of this boat honourably, in spite of the rawness of thy youth. Just then Edmund Wilkes presented the cup of wine to Miles, who drank it off at a draught, and thereupon Gascoigne replaced the helm and tied the thongs. The charge that Sir James Lee had given to Miles to strike at his adversary's helm was a piece of advice he probably would not have given to so young a knight, excepting as a last resort. A blow perfectly delivered upon the helm was of all others the most difficult for the recipient to recover from, but then a blow upon the helm was not one time in fifty perfectly given. The huge cylindrical tilting helm was so constructed in front as to slope at an angle in all directions to one point. That point was the centre of a cross formed by two iron bands welded to the steel face plates of the helm where it was weakened by the opening slit of the ocularium or peephole. In the very centre of this cross was a little flattened surface where the bands were riveted together, and it was upon that minute point that the blow must be given to be perfect, and that stroke Miles determined to attempt. As he took his station, Edmund Wilkes came running across from the pavilion with a lance that Sir James had chosen and Miles, returning the one that Gascoigne had just given him, took it in his hand. It was of seasoned oak, somewhat thicker than the other, a tough weapon, not easily to be broken, even in such an encounter as he was like to have. He balanced the weapon, and found that it fitted perfectly to his grasp. As he raised the point to rest, his opponent took his station, at the farther extremity of the lists, and again there was a little space of breathless pause. Miles was surprised at his own coolness. Every nervous tremor was gone. Before, he had been conscious of the critical multitude looking down upon him. Now it was a conflict of man to man, and such a conflict had no terrors for his young heart of iron. The spectators had somehow come to the knowledge that this was to be a more serious encounter than the two which had preceded it, and a breathless silence fell for the moment or two that the knights stood in place. Once more he breathed a short prayer. Holy Mary, guard me! Then again for the third time the marshal raised his baton, and the horn sounded and for the third time Miles drove his spurs into his horse's flanks. Again he saw the iron figure of his opponent rushing nearer, nearer, nearer. 
he centred with a straining intensity every faculty of soul mind and body upon one point the cross of the ocularium the mark he was to strike he braced himself for the tremendous shock which he knew must meet him and then in a flash dropped lance point straight and true the next instant there was a deafening stunning crash a crash like the stroke of a thunderbolt there was a dazzling blaze of blinding light and a myriad sparks danced and flickered and sparkled before his eyes he felt his horse stagger under him with the recoil and hardly knowing what he did he drove his spurs deep into its sides with a shout at the same moment there resounded in his ears a crashing rattle and clatter he knew not of what and then as his horse recovered and sprang forward and as the stunning bewilderment passed he found that his helmet had been struck off he heard a great shout arise from all and thought with a sickening bitter disappointment that it was because he had lost at the farther end of the course he turned his horse and then his heart gave a leap and a bound as though it would burst the blood leaped to his cheeks tingling and his bosom thrilled with an almost agonizing pang of triumph of wonder of amazement there in a tangle of his horse's harness and of embroidered trappings the sieur de la montaigne lay stretched upon the ground with his saddle near by and his riderless horse was trotting aimlessly about at the farther end of the lists miles saw the two squires of the fallen knight run across to where their master lay he saw the ladies waving their kerchiefs and veils and the castle people swinging their hats and shouting in an ecstasy of delight then he rode slowly back to where the squires were now aiding the fallen knight to arise the senior squire drew his dagger cut the leather points and drew off the helm disclosing the knight's face a face white as death and convulsed with rage mortification and bitter humiliation oh, i was not rightly unhorsed <laughs> he cried hoarsely and with vivid lips to the marshal and his attendants who had ridden up i unhelmed him fairly enough but my overgirth and, and breast strap burst and my saddle slipped i was not unhorsed i i say and i lay claim that i unhelmed him sir said the marshal calmly and speaking in french surely thou knowest that the loss of helmet does not decide an encounter i need not remind thee my lord that it was so awarded by john of gaunt duke of lancaster when in the jousting match between reynard de roy and john de holland the sieur renan left every point of his helm loosened so that the helm was beaten off at each stroke if he then was justified in doing so of his own choice and wilfully suffering to be unhelmed how then can this knight be accused of evil who suffered it by chance nevertheless said the sieur de la montaigne in the same hoarse breathless voice i do affirm and will make my affirmation good with my body that i fell only by the breaking of my girth who says otherwise lies it is the truth he speaketh said miles I myself saw the stitches were some little what burst, and warned him thereof before we ran this course. Sir, said the marshal to the Sir de la Montaigne, how can you now complain of that thing which your own enemy advised you of, and warned you against? Was it not right knightly for him so to do? The Sir de la Montaigne stood quite still for a little while, leaning on the shoulder of his chief squire, looking moodily upon the ground then without making answer he turned and walked slowly away to his pavilion still leaning on his squire's shoulder whilst the other attendant followed behind bearing his shield and helmet 
Gascoigne had picked up Miles' fallen helmet as the Sir de la Montaigne moved away, and Lord George and Sir James Lee came walking across the lists to where Miles still sat. Then, the one taking his horse by the bridle rein, and the other walking beside the saddle, they led him before the raised dais where the king sat. Even the Comte de Vermois, mortified and amazed as he must have been at the overthrow of his best knight, joined in the praise and congratulation that poured upon the young conqueror. Miles, his heart swelling with a passion of triumphant delight, looked up and met the gaze of Lady Alice fixed intently upon him. A red spot of excitement still burned in either cheek, and it flamed to a rosier red as he bowed his head to her before turning away. Gascoigne had just removed Miles' breastplate and gorget when Sir James Lee burst into the pavilion. All his grim coldness was gone, and he flung his arms around the young man's neck, hugging him heartily and kissing him upon either cheek. Ere he let him go, my own dear boy, he said, holding him off at arm's length and winking his one keen eye rapidly, as though to wink away a dampness of which he was ashamed. My own dear boy, I do tell thee truly this is as sweet to me as though thou wert mine own son, sweeter to me than when I first broke mine own lance in triumph and felt myself to be a right knight. Sir, answered Miles, what thou sayest doth rejoice my very heart. Nevertheless, it is but just to say that both his breastpiece and overgirth were burst in the stitches before his ran his course, for so I saw with mine own eyes. Burst in the stitches, snorted Sir James. Thinkest thou he did not know in what condition was his horse's gearing? I tell thee, he went down because thou didst strike fair and true, and he did not so strike thee. Had he been Guy of Warwick, he had gone down all the same under such a stroke and in such case. End of chapter 27《Chapter 28 of Men of Iron》by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It was not until more than three weeks after the King had left Devlin Castle that Lord George and his company of knights and archers were ready for the expedition to France. Two weeks of that time Miles spent at Crosby Dale with his father and mother. It was the first time that he had seen them since, four years ago, he had quitted the low, narrow, white-walled farmhouse for the castle of the great Earl of Mackworth. He had never appreciated before how low and narrow and poor the farmhouse was. Now, with his eyes trained to the bigness of Devlin Castle, he looked around him with wonder and pity at his father's humble surroundings he realized as he never else could have realized how great was the fallen fortune that had cast the house of falworth down from its rightful station to such a level as that upon which it now rested and at the same time that he thus recognized how poor was their lot how dependent upon the charity of others he also recognized how generous was the friendship of prior edward who perilled his own safety so greatly in affording the family of the attainted lord an asylum in its bitter hour of need and peril miles paid many visits to the gentle old priest during those two weeks visit and had many long and serious talks with him one warm bright afternoon, as he and the old man walked together in the priory garden, after a game or two of draughts, the young knight talked more freely and openly of his plans, his hopes, his ambitions, than perhaps he had ever done. 
he told the old man all that the earl had disclosed to him concerning the fallen fortunes of his father's house and of how all who knew those circumstances looked to him to set the family in its old place once more prior edward added many things to those which miles already knew things of which the earl either did not know or did not choose to speak he told the young man among other matters the reason of the bitter and lasting enmity that the king felt for the blind nobleman that lord falworth had been one of king richard's counsel in times past that it was not a little owing to him that king henry when earl of derby had been banished from england and that though he was then living in the retirement of private life he bitterly and steadfastly opposed king richard's abdication he told miles that at the time when sir john dale found shelter at falworth castle vengeance was ready to fall upon his father at any moment and it needed only such a pretext as that of sheltering so prominent a conspirator as sir john to complete his ruin miles as he listened intently could not but confess in his own mind that the king had many rational perhaps just grounds for grievance against such an ardent opponent as the blind lord had shown himself to be but sir said he after a little space of silence when prior edward had ended to hold enmity and to be treason are very different matters happily my father was bolingbroke's enemy but sure thou dost not believe he is justly and rightfully tainted with treason nay answered the priest how canst thou ask me such a thing did i believe thy father a traitor thinkest thou i would thus tell his son thereof nay miles i do know thy father well and have known him for many years and this of him that few men are so honourable in heart and soul as he but i have told thee all these things to show that the king is not without some reason to be thy father's unfriend neither haply is the earl of alban without cause of enmity against him so thou upon thy part shouldest not feel bitter rancour against the king for what hath happened to thy house nor even against william brookhurst i mean the earl of alban for i tell thee the worst of our enemies and the worst of men believe themselves always to have right and justice upon their side even when they most wish evil to others so spoke the gentle old priest who looked from his peaceful haven with dreamy eyes upon the sweat and tussle of the world's battle had he instead been in the thick of the fight it might have been harder for him to believe that his enemies ever had right upon their side but tell me this dost thou then think that i do evil in seeking to do battle of life or death with this wicked earl of alban who hath so ruined my father in body and fortune said miles presently nay i say not that thou doest evil war and bloodshed seem hard and cruel matters to me but god hath given that they be in the world and may he forbid that such a poor worm as i should say that they be all wrong and evil me seems even an evil thing is sometimes passing good when rightfully used said prior edward thoughtfully miles did not fully understand what the old man meant but this much he gathered that his spiritual father did not think ill of his fighting the earl of alban for his temporal father's sake so miles went to france in lord george's company a soldier of fortune as his captain was he was there for only six months 
but those six months wrought a great change in his life in the fierce factional battles that raged around the walls of Paris, in the evil life which he saw at the Burgundian court, in Paris itself after the truce, a court brilliant and wicked, witty and cruel. The wonderful liquor of youth had evaporated rapidly, and his character had crystallized as rapidly into the hardness of manhood. The warfare, the blood, the evil pleasures which he had seen had been a fiery crucible test to his soul and i love my hero that he should have come forth from it so well he was no longer the innocent sir galahad who had walked in pure white up the long hall to be knighted by the king but his soul was of that grim sterling rugged sort that looked out calmly from his grey eyes upon the wickedness and debauchery around him, and loved it not. Then one day a courier came, bringing a packet. It was a letter from the Earl, bidding Miles return straightway to England, and to Mackworth House upon the Strand, nigh to London without delay, and Miles knew that his time had come. It was a bright day in April when he and Gascoigne rode clattering out through Temple Bar, leaving behind them quaint old London town, its blank stone wall, its crooked dirty streets, its high gabled wooden houses, over which rose the sharp spire of St. Paul's, towering high into the golden air. Before them stretched the straight broad highway of the Strand, on one side the great houses and palaces of princely priests and powerful nobles, on the other the Covent Garden, or the Convent Garden, as it was then called, and the rolling country, where great stone windmills swung their slow-moving arms in the damp, soft April breeze, and away in the distance the Scottish Palace, the White Hall, and Westminster. It was the first time that Miles had seen famous London town. In that dim and distant time of his boyhood, six months before, he would have been wild with delight and enthusiasm. Now he jogged along with Gascoigne, gazing about him with calm interest at open shops and booths and tall gabled houses, at the busy throng of merchants and craftsmen, jostling and elbowing one another, at townsfolk, men and dames, picking their way along the muddy kennel of a sidewalk. He had seen so much of the world that he had lost somewhat of interest in new things, so he did not care to tarry, but rode, with a mind heavy with graver matters, through the streets and out through the temple bar, direct for Mackworth House, near the Savoy Palace. It was with a great deal of interest that Miles and his patron regarded one another when they met for the first time after that half-year, which the young soldier had spent in France. To Miles it seemed somehow very strange that his lordship's familiar face and figure should look so exactly the same. To Lord Mackworth, perhaps, it seemed even more strange that six short months should have wrought so great a change in the young man. The rugged exposure in camp and field during the hard winter that had passed had roughened the smooth bloom of his boyish complexion and bronzed his fair skin almost as much as a midsummer sun could have done. His beard and moustache had grown again, now heavier and more mannish from having been shaved, and the white seam of a scar over the right temple gave, if not a stern, at least a determined look to the strong, square-jawed young face. So the two stood for a while regarding one another. Miles was the first to break the silence. My lord, said he, thou didst send for me to come back to England. Behold, here I am. When didst thou land, Sir Miles? said the Earl. I and my squire landed at Dover upon Tuesday last, answered the young man. 
the Earl of Mackworth stroked his beard softly. "'Thou art marvellous changed,' said he. "'I would not have thought it possible.' Miles smiled, somewhat grimly. "'I have seen such things, my lord, in France and in Paris,' said he quietly. "'As mayhap may make a lad a man before his time.' "'From which I gather,' said the Earl, "'that many adventures have befallen thee. "'Methought thou wouldst find troublesome times in the Dauphine's camp, "'else I would not have sent thee to France.' "'A little space of silence followed, "'during which the Earl sat musingly, "'half absently regarding the tall, erect, powerful young figure "'standing before him, "'awaiting his pleasure in motionless, patient, "'almost dogged silence.' The strong, sinewy hands were clasped and rested upon the long, heavy sword, around the scabbard of which the belt was loosely wrapped, and the plates of mail caught and reflected in flashing, broken pieces the bright sunlight from the window behind. "'Sir Miles,' said the Earl, suddenly, breaking the silence at last, Dost thou know why I sent for thee hither? Aye, said Miles calmly. How can I else? Thou wouldst not have called me from Paris, but for one thing. Methinks thou hast sent for me to fight the Earl of Alban, and lo, I am here. Thou speakest very boldly, said the Earl. I do hope that thy deeds be as bold as thy words. That said Miles. Thou must ask other men. He thinks no one may justly call me coward. By my troth, said the Earl, smiling. Looking upon thee, limbs and girth, bone and sinew, I would not like to be the he that would dare accuse thee of such a thing. As for thy surmise, I may tell thee plain that thou art right, and that it was to fight the Earl of Alban that I sent for thee hither. The time is now nearly ripe, and I will straightway send for thy father to come to London. Meantime, it would not be safe either for thee or me to keep thee in my service. I have spoken to his highness, the Prince of Wales, who, with other of the princes, is upon our side in this quarrel. He has promised to take thee into his service until the fitting time comes to bring thee and thine enemy together, and tomorrow I shall take thee to Scotland Yard, where his highness is now lodging." As the Earl ended his speech, Miles bowed, but did not speak. The Earl waited for a little while, as though to give him the opportunity to answer. "'Well, sirrah,' said he at last, with a shade of impatience, "'hast thou naught to say? Meseems thou takest all this with marvellous coolness.' "'Have I then my lord's permission to speak my mind?' "'Aye.' said the earl. Say thy say. Sir, said Miles, I have thought and pondered this matter much while abroad, and would now ask thee a plain question, in all honest, and I have thy leave. The earl nodded his head. Sir, am I not right in believing that thou hast certain weighty purposes and aims of thine own to gain, and I win this battle against the Earl of Alban. Has my brother George been telling thee aught to such a purpose? Said the Earl, after a moment or two of silence. Miles did not answer. No matter, added Lord Mackworth. I will not ask thee who told thee such a thing. As for thy question, well, since thou ask it frankly, I will be frank with thee. Yea, I have certain ends to gain in having the Earl of Alban overthrown. Miles bowed. Sir, said he, Haply thine ends are as much beyond aught that I can comprehend as though I were a little child. Only this I know, that they must be very great. Thou knowest well in that in any case I would fight me in this battle for my father's sake and for the honour of my house. Nevertheless, in return for all that it will so greatly advantage thee, will thou not grant me a boon in return, should I overcome mine enemy? What is thy boon, Sir Miles? 
that thou wilt grant me thy favour to seek the Lady Alice de Mowbray for my wife. The Earl of Mackworth started up from his seat. Sir Miles Falworth! He began violently, and then stopped short, drawing his bushy eyebrows together into a frown stern, if not sinister. Miles withstood his look calmly and impassively, and presently the earl turned on his heel and strode to the open window. A long time passed in silence while he stood there, gazing out of the window into the garden beyond, with his back to the young man. Suddenly he swung around again. "'Sir Miles,' said he, "'the family of Falworth is as good as any in Derbyshire.' Just now it is poor and fallen in a state, but if it is again placed in credit and honor, thou, who art the son of the house, shalt have thy suit weighed with as much respect and consideration as though thou wert my peer in all things. Such is my answer. Art thou satisfied? I could ask no more. Answered Miles. End of chapter 28Chapter 29 of Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That night, Miles lodged at Mackworth House. The next morning, as soon as he had broken his fast, which he did in the privacy of his own apartments, the earl bade him and gascoigne to make ready for the barge which was then waiting at the river stairs to take them to scotland yard the earl himself accompanied them and as the heavy snub-nosed boat rowed by the six oarsmen in mackworth livery slid slowly and heavily up against the stream the earl, leaning back in his cushioned seat, pointed out the various inns of the great priests or nobles, palatial town residences standing mostly a little distance back from the water, behind terraced high-walled gardens and lawns. Yon was the Bishop of Exeter's Close, Yon was the Bishop of Bath's, that was York House, and that Chester Inn so passing by gardens and lawns and palaces, they came at last to Scotland Yard stairs, a broad flight of marble steps that led upward to a stone platform above, upon which opened the gateway of the garden beyond. The Scotland Yard of Miles Falworth's day was one of the more pretentious and commodious of the palaces of the Strand, it took its name from having been from ancient times the london inn which the tributary kings of scotland occupied when on their periodical visits of homage to england now during this time of scotland's independence the prince of wales had taken up his lodging in the old palace and made it noisy with the mad boisterous mirth of his court as the watermen drew the barge close to the landing-place of the stairs, the earl stepped ashore, and followed by Miles and Gascoigne, ascended to the broad gateway of the river wall of the garden. Three men-at-arms, who lounged upon a bench under the shade of the little pent roof of a guard-house beside the wall, arose and saluted as the well-known figure of the earl mounted the steps. The earl nodded a cool answer, and, passing unchallenged through the gate, led the way up a pleached walk, beyond which, as Miles could see, there stretched a little grassy lawn and a stone-paved terrace. As the earl and the two young men approached the end of the walk, they were met by the sound of voices and laughter, the clinking of glasses and the rattle of dishes turning a corner they came suddenly upon a party of young gentlemen who sat at a late breakfast under the shade of a wide-spreading lime-tree they had evidently just left the tilt-yard for two of the guests sturdy thick-set young knights yet wore a part of their tilting armour behind the merry scene stood the grey hoary old palace 
a steep flight of stone steps, and a long open stone-arched gallery, which evidently led to the kitchen beyond, for along it hurried serving-men, running up and down the tall flight of steps, and bearing trays and dishes and cups and flagons. It was a merry sight and a pleasant one. The day was warm and balmy, and the yellow sunlight fell in waving uncertain patches of light, dappling the tablecloth and twinkling and sparkling upon the dishes, cups, and flagons. At the head of the table sat a young man some three or four years older than Miles, dressed in a full suit of rich blue brocaded velvet, embroidered with gold thread and trimmed with black fur. His face, which was turned towards them as they mounted from the lawn to the little stone-flagged terrace, was frank and open, the cheeks smooth and fair, the eyes dark and blue. He was tall and rather slight, and wore his thick yellow hair hanging to his shoulders, where it was cut square across, after the manner of the times. Miles did not need to be told that it was the Prince of Wales. "'Ho, Gaffer Fox!' he cried, as soon as he caught sight of the Earl of Mackworth. "'What wind blows thee hither among us wild mallard drakes? I warrant it is not for love of us, but only to fill thine own larder, after the manner of Sir Fox among the drakes. Whom hast thou with thee? Some gosling thou art about to pluck?' A sudden hush fell upon the company, and all faces were turned towards the visitors. The earl bowed with a soft smile. "'Your Highness,' said he, smoothly, "'is pleased to be pleasant, sir. I bring you the young knight of whom I spoke to you some time since, Sir Miles Falworth. You may be pleased to bring to mind that you so condescended as to promise to take him into your train, until the fitting time arrived for that certain matter of which we spoke.' "'Sir Miles,' said the Prince of Wales, with a frank, pleasant smile, I have heard great reports of thy skill and prowess in France, both from Mackworth and from others. It will pleasure me greatly to have thee in my household, more especially, he added, as it will get thee, callow as thou art, out of Lord Fox's clutches. Our faction cannot do without the Earl of Mackworth's cunning wits, Sir Miles. Nevertheless, I would not like to put all my fate and fortune into his hands without bond. I hope that thou dost not rest thy fortunes entirely upon his aid and countenance. All who were present felt the discomfort of the prince's speech. It was evident that one of his mad, wild humours was upon him. In another case, the hare-brained young courtiers around might have taken their cue from him but the Earl of Mackworth was no subject for their jibes and witticisms. A constrained silence fell, in which the Earl alone maintained a perfect ease of manner. Miles bowed to hide his own embarrassment. "'Your Highness,' said he evasively, "'I rest my fortune first of all upon God, his strength and justice.' "'Thou wilt find safer dependence there than upon the Lord of Mackworth,' said the Prince dryly. But come, he added, with a sudden change of voice and manner, these be jests that border too closely upon bitter earnest for a merry breakfast. It is ill to idle with edged tools. Will thou not stay and break thy fast with us, my lord? Pardon me, your highness, said the earl, bowing and smiling the same smooth smile his lips had worn from the first, such a smile as Miles had never thought to have seen upon his haughty face. I crave your good leave to decline. I must return home presently, for even now, happily, your uncle, his grace of Winchester, is awaiting my coming upon the business you wot of. Happily, your highness will find more joyance in a lusty young knight like Sir Miles than in an old fox like myself. So I leave him with you in your good care. Such was Miles' introduction to the wild young madcap Prince of Wales, afterwards the famous henry v the conqueror of france for a month or more thereafter he was a member of the princely household and after a little while a trusted and honoured member 
Perhaps it was the calm, sturdy strength, the courage of the young knight, that first appealed to the prince's royal heart. Perhaps afterwards it was the more sterling qualities that underlaid that courage that drew him to the young man. Certain it was that in two weeks Miles was the acknowledged favorite. He made no protestation of virtue. He always accompanied the prince in those madcap ventures to London, where he beheld all manner of wild revelry. He never held himself aloof from his gay comrades, but he looked upon all their mad sports with the same calm gaze that had carried him without taint through the courts of Burgundy and the Dauphin. The gay, roistering young lords and gentlemen dubbed him St. Miles, and jested with him about haircloth, shirts, and flagellations. But witticism and jest alike failed to move Miles' patient virtue. He went his own gait in the habits of his life, and in so going knew as little as the others of the mad court that the prince's growing liking for him was, perhaps more than all else, on account of that very temperance. Then, by and by, the prince began to confide in him, as he did in none of the others. There was no great love betwixt the king and his son, it has happened very often that the kings of England have felt bitter jealousy towards the heirs apparent, as they have grown in power. And such was the case with the great King Henry the Fourth. The prince often spoke to Miles of the clashing and jarring between himself and his father, and the thought began to come to Miles' mind by degrees that maybe the king's jealousy accounted not a little for the prince's reckless intemperance. Once, for instance, as the prince leaned upon his shoulder waiting, whilst the attendants made ready the barge that was to carry them down the river to the city, he said abruptly, Miles, what thinkest thou of us all? Doth not thy honesty hold us in contempt? Nay, Highness, said Miles. How could I hold contempt? Mary, said the prince. I myself hold contempt, and am not as honest a man as thou. But pray thee, have patience with me, Miles. Some day, perhaps, I too will live a clean life. Now, and I live seriously, the king will be more jealous of me than ever, and that is not a little. Maybe I live thus so that he may not know what I really am, in soothly earnest. The prince also often talked to Miles concerning his own affairs, of the battle he was to fight for his father's honour, of how the Earl of Mackworth had plotted and planned to bring him face to face with the Earl of Alban. He spoke to Miles more than once of the many great changes of state and party that hung upon the downfall of the enemy of the house of Falworth, and showed him how no hand but his own could strike that enemy down. If he fell, it must be through the son of Falworth. Sometimes it seemed to Miles as though he and his blind father were the centre of a great web of plot and intrigue stretching far and wide, that included not only the greatest houses of England, but royalty and the political balance of the country as well, and even before the greatness of it all he did not flinch. Then at last came the beginning of the time for action. It was in the early part of May, and Miles had been a member of the prince's household for a little over a month. One morning he was ordered to attend the prince in his privy cabinet, and, obeying the summons, he found the prince, his younger brother, the Duke of Bedford, and his uncle, the Bishop of Winchester, seated at a table, where they had just been refreshing themselves with a flagon of wine and a plate of wafers. "'My poor Miles,' said the prince, smiling, as the young knight bowed to the three, and then stood erect as though on duty. "'It shames my heart, brother, and thou, uncle, it shames my heart to be one privy to the thing which we are set upon to do. Here be we, the greatest lords of England, making a cat's paw of this lad, for he is only yet a boy, and of his blind father, 
for to achieve our ends against Alban's faction. It seemeth not over honourable to my mind. Pardon me, your highness, said Miles, blushing to the roots of his hair. But, and I may be so bold as to speak, I reek nothing of what your aims may be. I only look to restore my father's honour and the honour of our house. Truly, said the prince, smiling, that is the only matter that maketh me willing to lay my hands to this business. Dost thou know why I have sent for thee? It is because this day thou must challenge the Duke of Alban before the king. The Earl of Mackworth has laid all his plans, and the time is now ripe. Knowest that thy father is at Mackworth House? Nay, said Miles. I knew it not. He hath been there for nearly two days, said the prince. Just now the Earl hath sent for us to come first to Mackworth House, then to go to the palace, for he hath gained audience with the king, and hath so arranged it that the Earl of Alban is to be there as well. We all go straightway, so get thyself ready as soon as may be. Perhaps Miles' heart began beating more quickly within him at the nearness of that great happening, which he had looked forward to for so long. If it did, he made no sign of his emotion, but only asked, How must I clothe myself, your highness? Wear thy light armor, said the prince, but no helmet, a juppin bearing the arms and colors that the earl gave thee when thou wert knighted and carry thy right-hand gauntlet under thy belt for thy challenge. Now make haste, for time passes. End of chapter 29